Раз, раз, да? Отлично. So let's continue our conference. So there is a, the next section will be on the quantum wells and quantum dots. I am Dmitry Yakoli from Yoff Institute and Technical University of Dortmund. And on this section, there will be one invited talk and three original talks. And this is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Silov for the first invited talk on magnetic moments and zero dimensional systems, quantum dots and discrete dopants. Thank you very much. Uh, we just find out that there is a little bit of issue with my talk. I will introduce it in the, in the first slide, so of my authors, and the upper row here refers to the work which has been done on the quantum dots, which I'll report today, and obviously our chairman now is the co-author of my talk. It was not meant to be like that, so I begged him to stay here, and he agreed. But uh, more importantly, so are the work which is uh, strain-induced change in the magnetic moments has been done uh, with col in collaboration with two German institutes and uh, the single dot, uh, single impurity work has been performed in a strong collaboration with Yoff Institute, uh, Institute of Agarov in Moldova and the Nottingham Group of Brian Gallagher. 
So just before I come to the, the, the magnetic moments, I want to flash this simple slide. So how the, so the, the, the interaction of magnetic moment in, as such with, with, uh, with an external magnetic field is trivial, uh, apart from the fact that in, 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 in general way, so it is parameterized by introduction of some G factor. And in solid state, it happens to be not just a scalar, but a tensor. And that will play a significant role uh, in my talk because I will be speaking about tensor in a sense of anisotropy of the G factor in different directions as applied to the geometry of nanostructure. So uh, why it is important? Uh, because that basically means that the precession vector omega large here on that slide is never the same in the general, in the nanostructure, as the external magnetic field. And it also supplies some additional handle to, 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 to manipulate the, the, the spin in, 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 in nanostructures. And namely, for instance, I can tune one of the components of the G tensor by external magnetic field, oh, sorry, electric field. And if essentially, it will change the tilt angle between spin and the magnetic field as such. Now back to the classics, or the magnetic moment in general is a composition of two entities. One is just the magnetic moment due to spin, so the intrinsic moment, moment plus the orbital part. Now when it comes to the atomic physics, things are very simple, so the spin part is just Bohr magneton and nothing else, and orbital part is nothing else but the azimuthal number, right? So this is very much pretty fixed entities. Should I switch to some nanostructure, which is represented here by a cluster of these bluish dots, things are very different. So when it comes to the intrinsic magnetic moment, it's almost the same as for an electron in an atom. It's not exactly the same, but it's roughly one half. Things are different for the orbital moment because it can span all the range starting from the bulk value and ending up at zero when the nanostructure confines the carrier such that it does not remember anything about the translation symmetry in a crystal, right? And the typical example here would be, because I will be talking about intermarcinite quantum dots, so the typical example would be the intermarcinite bulk value. The magnetic moment is more than eight Bohr magnetons. So this is the orbital part at play. Now what I will introduce now is the idea that all this tensor stuff or anisotropy can be easily understood in terms of introducing the spin correlated current loops which span the whole entire uh, surroundings of the nanostructures. And in that sense, Excuse me. The, 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 the spin moment density, which corresponds to, 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 to the magnetic contribution, can quite straightforwardly calculate it once we know the wave function, say, in the ground state of that nanostructure, right? So now the symmetry of that entity is pretty much fixed to the S-type symmetry as for the ground state in ele for electrons, so this is the, 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 the major contribution for the envelopes. And what it leads to is a very simple distribution of the spin momentum for the nanostructure. It basically mimics the charge distribution. There is no big difference between charge distribution and the spin itself, right? So it picks up for the S state at the center of the nanostructure and falls down exponentially to the edges. Now, the orbital moment density essentially, again, so once you know the, the, the wave function, you calculate the probability flux of that, and you end up with that as a leading contribution. So the important piece here is that matrix element, which is basically momentum matrix element, and it's non-zero only for the bands with different parity. And this is big difference between these two, these two expressions. So because that one, leads now to the distribution 
which provides an absolute zero at the center of the nanostructure. I would pick up somewhere midway between the center and the boundary of the nanostructure itself. Now, having said that, it is, of course, important to, 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 to realize that all these things have been calculated here, well, 100 meters from here, 150 meters from here, at the Yoff Institute by Professor Rivchenko, who is in audience, and his student, Andrei Kiselov. I think it was 1991, first paper, 1992, excuse me. And uh, essentially, so the, the, the answer to that, uh, which was made about, which was done about 25 years ago, is that the orbital moment density can be calculated as a modified rod formula. So it's almost like in bulk. But there is a different way to modify, uh, to calculate that, and that basically leads to more rapid quenching of the orbital moment in the in case of the nanosearchers. So what I'm saying now, it is the same calculation, so it's an intuitive point of view of experimentator how to understand what is happening in the nanosearchers. Now, let's see how does this simple current loop theory holds for the quantum dots. So this is the case where we switched from uh, a very well-established system Indomarcinite, Gedomarcinite quantum dots. Excuse me, how are we doing on time? Okay. <laughs> uh, so we went for the, for the different system, and that system was the disk of the quantum dots. Uh, that means that the, 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 the barrier was changed to the helium phosphide. What we have now is perfect disks. And uh, that can be seen in the cross-sectional STM. Every peak in the luminescence is due to a single change in the monolayer height. And that allows you to do the experiments in Faraday and void geometry on a single dot. And what you end up is basically the Zeeman splitting magnetic field. And that allows you to have a direct handle to, 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 to the, to the uh, G factor itself. Now, this is experimental data, uh, one direction, which is due to the in-plane magnetic field, shows quite high value of the momentum, which is quenched at some energy, whereas for the direction perpendicular to that, we have a very much reduced orbital moment. And if you follow the argument of the current loops, so it just changes in the surface area, and to some extent in the current which circles that area, which brings the huge anisotropy in that system. Now, uh, we calculate it in the KP approximations, or this is eight bit calculations, and it perfectly makes sense. But now we should just analyze the old shape anisotropy simply by tracing the current which circles in entire, entire, entire surface of the nanostructure. Now, I want to touch now on the experiment which was done in collaboration with our colleagues in Dortmund. And this is the same quantum dots, but very different settings. So this is now a pump probe on ensemble. We are probing here 10 to the five, 10 to the six quantum dots, the same dots at a particular energy. What we are analyzing is just, of course, the Larmor frequency here. And if you have a vector magnet, so you can follow the, the, the frequency and obtain the dependence of the g-factor for different components. So this is experimental trace of that. And what is more important, look at that. So the, the, the open circles here, uh, symbols here, are just the single dot experiment. So what projected on that is the ensemble of 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 dots in one go. And the shaded area basically covers all the scatters in the single dot experiment. And that is basically the dephasing time we are plotting here, which is due scatter in the G factor per individual dots. They are disks, but not that perfect disks. So every disk a little bit different, and that introduces the dephasing time in the ensemble itself. 
Now, this is just a reminder. I want just to touch on a different way to change the aspect ratio on the dot and basically put them on membrane of piezo element and such introduce the additional compression in the plane by actual strain and essentially change the, the, the height of the dot. And that leads to, 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 to uh, a change in the emission energy, but of course it also means that we have a significant change in G factor. And again, that picture can be reproduced very easily by argument of the current loops. Now, I will switch now to something which I never talked about before, and this is holes. So what I told you before was electrons in the conduction band, but now I'm switching to some different stuff, and this is holes. Holes are very sensitive to minute changes in the confinement, and especially in the strain. So this is now a strain-free system, a manganese doped narrow quantum wells, and as you see, this is the same sample, but the spectra are taken at different positions. And what we have is typical mesoscopical behavior. So the line spans more than 50 millivolt volt for the spectra. And what is more important, when we put it in magnetic field, so we know what the normal impurity would do, non-magnetic, the magnetic behaves very, uh, very, very differently due to the exchange interaction between hole bound to manganese. And what it leads to, for normal non-magnetic impurity, we will have the sigma minus as predominant transition, whereas the uh, manganese in the bulk will produce a different sigma plus polarization in the same direction of magnetic field. However, the sigma plus would be the upper component of that doublet. So when you put it in the quantum well, something wonderful happens. It is sigma plus, it is undoubtedly the exchange polarization which holds the, 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 the entire magnetic moment in that system. However, look at the sequence. The sequence is different from the bulk. So it's now inverted in the confined system. And that inversion is simply due to the fact that we have uh, a G factor of the hole now confined into the quantum well. And that quantum well changes the magnetic moment of that hole in, this, in the such a way that it is now oppositely oriented to what it is in the bulk. So the average value is minus, uh, sorry, it's plus one in bulk, sorry, but what we have in our system, something ranging from minus one and a half to minus half. So I just said that. I just, uh, to, 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 to finish, I will just uh, introduce a very different system. And this is non-magnetic hole but with a very strong exchange interaction. This is a single exciton localized on the neutral acceptor. So basically it has two holes, an electron, and all components or two holes interact by exchange with the electron. And between the holes you have a very strong interaction. So what it leads to is that the whole complex now provides a very, very rich multiplet of the quantum of the of the of the lines and that follows from simple fact that exchange interaction in that system already will split the system from the ground state of g2 or g0 into the multiplet of the line and the quantum confinement will produce the final splitting if you introduce also the whole which will recombine with electrons, say, at the quantum confined level, you will end up with a very rich level, but I will ask you to see that work to follow. So we don't understand here entity of the behavior of the spin moments in the confined regime of the exchange interacting holes, but that's what we are working now on. Uh, I will end with that slide, but I will ask you if anybody can follow that language on the board. No. You? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this is for the first time <laughs> that there is no Dutch speaking person in the audience, <laughs> at least. <laughs> so basically what I was talking about, it is uh, work due to Paul Ehrenfest, who was quite a frequent visitor in the Polytechnical Institute and Joff Institute. And already in 1925, so this is prior to the Schrodinger equation. So he, he, he mentioned that the, at least the, the diamagnetic uh, 
susceptibility of uh, bismuth can be explained by spilke related currents. With that, I conclude and thank you for your attention. Thank you. So we have plenty of time for questions. You said it was 20 minutes. Hmm? Is my computer on? Oh. You signaled me 20 minutes, that's why I'm speaking up. No, no, it was 20 minutes. <laughs> Maybe in English. Because you now have to say, translate your Dutch. Yes, I will, I will, I will, I will come back to, I'm sorry, there was a misunderstanding, sir. A chairman signaled me that I have 20 minutes. I understood I spent 20 minutes. <laughs> My excuses for that. So I will come back to, to, To the one, to the one, to the one slide which I, which I, which I, uh, which I missed uh, during, uh, I skipped it. Sorry. So the the uh, the thing is that, so I'm coming back now to 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 part, which represents changing of the aspect ratio of the quantum dot in situ. So by applying an external stress, right? So this is quite well established uh, technology now. So you have a membrane of the quantum dots transferred to the top of the piezo element, right? And essentially, so what it provides you with uh, elastic deformation, in plane deformation, and you can follow, uh, if you are lucky with your sample, you can follow that line, changing its energy, so for instance, for exciton or bioexciton, by about 20 microelectron volts. And essentially, you can change even the character of the exciton in the quantum dot. And because of that, so in one regime, you will end up with a very strong contribution through the conduction band to the magnetic moment or from the valence band. So what I'm plotting here now is basically a case when most of the change is produced by the valence band contribution. So I'm Plotting now the G factor, which is essentially changing by about 5% uh, in total. But if you look at the composition, or if you calculate the change of composition, so it's only 1% due to the conduction band. So the rest comes from the valence band. And now we found out that there is a very different very different system, uh, which provides you with the same flexibility to change the aspect ratio. So here I'm basically demonstrating that in the best structure, you might app now with about 100 MeV of the external stress. And that basically amounts to the maximum you can apply to combat the quantum confinement in the most mismatched system, indium arsenide, genome arsenide. So now our work is now to place that structure on the MEMS, so the two silicon bridges, and to stretch it in one direction. And this is what we, we, we are planning to do in the very near future. And now I conclude my talk. <laughs> Thank you Thank for you. your attention. So second fall for questions. I would like to ask you uh, on, uh, yes, I'm here. <laughs> uh, on the uh, manganese, uh, the change of the manganese uh, G factor, when you put it in the, in the quantum well, uh, depending on the site in the, in the interface and then move. Yeah. I understand. And the quantum dot also. Yes, I understand. So are the, 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 the essentially, so what you see on this slide, uh, a displacement in, in the position. So to begin with, it is strain-free system. That's why we went for this quantum dots, natural quantum dots, doped with manganese. Yeah? And now the, the change what you see here from basically one and a half electron volts down to 1.48 is entirely due to different positioning in the growth direction. Yes, but because I'm asking about the G factor. Yes, yes, but that is connected. 
So the confinement, the, the stronger the confinement for the hole here, the more negative we are. So the G factor is basically, so the minus, the minus one half of the G factor is for those impurities which are pushed to the center of the quantum dot. Those which are pushed to the interface has a less pronounced change, but they're still negative. So we never have seen in that sample any lines which are differently polarized. So they are exchanged polarized, but the sequence in the doublet is opposite to that in the bulk. Is this for the quantum dot? For the electron, it's entirely the same. Uh, for the quantum dot and the dots, so it is more complicated. Dots, are, so the, the, the dots, which I was discussing, are not strain free. And the, I would say that, so the, the, the valence band is extremely sensitive to a very minute changes in the strain environment. And the tendency is there, we cannot explain it so cleanly as in manganese case. Other questions? Maybe f for your point on, on the application of the strain directions. You say that in the experiment you show it was along the growth direction, yes? Uh, the, the strain there, by the, by piezo, by the piezo. By actual strain is in plane. So, but due to parcel resource, so it also changes the height. So mm -hmm. we, we, we compressively strain in the biaxial plane direction, mm -hmm. and that makes the, the, the dot higher when we apply ah, it. I see. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I see no further questions. Let's thank speaker. And we turn to the next talk. It would be done by Dr. Amin Tahira from the Wigner localization and whispering gallery modes of electrons in quantum dots. Good, good, good morning. Um, so I uh, wish to thank the organizers to give me opportunity to talk about m uh, our results. Is another one? Okay. And then, uh, so I wish to, in my first phrase, to mention our m Mr. Chairman, who made in the morning the talk about the small quantum dots, which uh, works in. Um, uh, in, in large quantum con confinement. I, I will talk uh, about the dots, uh, is really la is really large quantum dots which work uh, in the weak confinement re uh, regime. And I will talk about few, few electrons co co quantum dots. And uh, in, in, in this case, the um, Coulombic, if you have a weak localization, the Coulombic interaction is uh, larger than the, uh, than the kinetic energy, and, we, and, and here the occurs a regional localization effect. It is known for a few de de decades of this, this, this effect, and there are uh, a lot of the theoretical works to calculate the distribution of electrons. I, I showed it here, the energy structure, but n uh, not much known uh, about the um, experimental uh, uh, results. It's only a few of them, and actually the all, all systems that we have so far, work box in, in, in very small localization uh, uh, regime. So uh, our quantum dots will move, move, move it a little further. And um, another a new aspect of this weak localization regime that in this case, in there are possibly exist a, a whispery gallery modes, and I will talk about two. So the work was done, mo most experiments were done in the University of Notre Dame. However, few, few experiments, were, experiments were done in the European Institute. Uh, the growth was done of quantum dots in the Physical Technical Institute. Um, a, a theoretical support was, was done in, in Grenoble in France. So the outline of, of my talk is here. So the introduction, then, then I will de 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 describe the structural and optical properties of these quantum dots. 
we big localization in, in them. Then I, I will discuss the technique of probing charge di density di di distribution using near field optical microscopy and, uh, and possible observation of this perimeter gallery mode uh, effect. Most of the results are were recently pu published in these papers. So this is the uh, next slide. I, I will talk about the disparate gas remote. They are well known and what they would introduce um, what described for, for, for sound waves and in, in, in the uh, for, for, for the yes, yes, but in the gallery uh, under the doom of, of St. Peter's Cathedral in, in London. And uh, to, to nowadays, the, the, the most, uh, um, the most uh, application for the electromagnetic waves, and uh, for example, uh, micro disc cavities, uh, you, you use the nanophotonic, but, but recently there was a paper where we, the people do. Uh, uh, a mechanical dispersing um, for, for, for neutrons uh, and two resonators were made for electrons. And what one is very small resonator, like 50 nanometers, and, and, and the other is like 100 nanometers. But talking about the, the resonators, we, we need to keep in mind that there are can exist other modes like fab repair modes and, and confined modes, which confined uh, at the center of, of the um, c cavity. And, and for, 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 for electrons, this is atomic-like mode. So I just uh, sh show that the, these modes are well doc documented in, in, in for, for the electromagnetic phase for photons. So this uh, whispering gallery modes, the confined mo modes here, they localized at the center. They were known, for example, the fibers more, this mode propagate in fibers, and, and they are actually the, the lazy mode of micropost resonators with, with reflectance, and the, they also this a fabric pyromos, and here I show some of our results, which we are observed with this in micro disk with quantum dots for gallium arsenide disk. Now I will discuss, describe the, the results for electron resonators. There are two, 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 only two, two realizations. First is um, conducting molecular nanoring. So the, 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 this is the, the molecule. There are 12 molecules form a ring. And, uh, the, in this work, they are doing mm, scanning tunneling spectroscopy, so they change, they, they get it, ch change the, uh, the, uh, the concentration, and build this peak, which they uh, assign to, to, to the viscular gallery modes. Another example is the graphene nanodisc, so the, the way you, you use a flat STMT chip, it, it induces the re radial Peng junction, which forms this re 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 resonator, and this is experimental. They, they, they show the speaks of, again, due to whispers of gallery modes, uh, but there are, could be a few questions. First of all, if, if this is true, we whisper in gallery modes or just a confined mode on the rings, and in this case, uh, the question arises where is the atomic like modes, which were no known in the, in the other, in the non fabricated quantum dots. So, and uh, and the question arises if this uh, whispering gallery mode can exist in this case. And uh, for, for this, those, uh, they were never observed, probably because there is a, a have soft wall pa pa potential. But, but in, in self organized quantum dots, in principle, the, this uh, mode can be observed. So, I will start the describing the, uh, our C system. So, this is self organized indium phosphide gallium indium phosphide quantum dots. And uh, this is the this is the structural uh, characteristic. So they have a size from 80 to 200 nan 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 nanometers. They dot the electrons. There are two heights of, of, of the dots, and this is the emission spectra uh, uh, ensemble emission spectra. We can see that uh, the the using so-called polarization degree measurements of luminescence that they adopt with the electrons, the electrons. This is a, a single dot. I, I will discuss it later. This is particular have, a, have seven electrons and the splitting 1.6 MeV. Uh, so we, we try to understand what uh, exciting transition here. This is the result of calculations. So in effective mass mean field theory with anisotropic elastic model. Here is a uh, a, a conduction band, uh, this is a valence band, so a, a slice. So we, we did the calculation for, for different dot, dot mm, radius and, and, and heads. In particular, you can see that this is the actually a hard wall potential. The, uh, the band gap, uh, the band of sets are like ha, 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 half a MeV. This is for uh, potential for light hole. For, for different holes, so this is a potential uh, 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 along the dot. Uh, 
uh, this is uh, in, 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 the, in, in the lateral do, do direction you can see here that the dots uh, the heavy uh, the heavy coals localized at the bottom there is a, a small pocket for uh, at the edge of the dot it, it can be seen here but if you include uh, a coloring interaction you, you, you can see that this is actually a type of one tra transition and, and here we can calculate the transition rate you, you can see that for uh, for flat and uh, enlarged dot, dot is really t t t type one. Here we calculate the splitting. You can see that the splitting is uh, from one to few MeV, which is uh, what we built in experiment. And here, the calculation for for Wigner localization effect. First, first we calculate the uh, 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 splitting of different sh shells for for six and, and nine uh, electrons, and we versus the Wigner this radius, and, and this is um, uh, just a uh, a parameter which um, average distance between electron and the dot uh, divided by Bohr uh, radius. And this is our, our burst splitting is, is here. So we can see that, that the size of the dot we, we get like 150 nanometers. Uh, uh, then the configuration direction calculation shows there is six signatures of, of Wigner localization. This is done for seven and nine electrons. And, and, uh, and then we do a calculation in, vi in which we account the actual uh, f size of and, for and shape of the dot. You can see that in this case, the uh, localization is increased. And, uh, and, 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 and here, the, the, the we, we did a calculation for the set of parameters for, for electrons from two to, to nine electrons. And we changed the, the confinement from 1.5 to nine MeV. And, we, and, and you can see here the, uh, the, the charge distribution you can see that uh, two electrons, for example, for, for two electron dots are clearly seen here. So well, starting for, from this confinement, the wing localization uh, effects are seen clearly. And what is, um, uh, you, you can see, which, which is obvious, but that the, the, the size of charge distribution increases when you increase the number of, uh, of electrons, and then increase also uh, reverse propor proportionally to the confinement energy. So. Uh, and uh, and uh, our idea was to, to, to measure the size of charge ch ch distribution and to measure the, the, the splitting. And, and, and in this case, it must be determined by the number of, of, left, of electrons. And if it's uh, it so, and we did it using a field optical scanning microscopy. And we uh, assuming that the charge density distribution is equal to the size of and some image and it, it can be so because we have a central hole and we can expect that ma maximum intensity of, 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 of photoluminescence will be as the maximum of electron density. Now I turn to our, our, our experiment. So this is used near field optical scan microscopy at low temperature, this is excitation uh, energy, this is a pumping power. We use the collection and, and, and excitation uh, te technique. So we uh, shine uh, a laser through the fiber and collect uh, the, the signal from, from the fiber too. This is our, our aperture. So this is uh, how it looks like at, uh, at a mi microscopic point of view. You can see that the aperture size is, is, is nearly the same as the size of the dot. It's an important question how we can estimate the near field image size. So we do a simple di di geometrical estimation. So if you have a uh, emission intensity of the dot is uniform in lateral direction and the deepest uh, collection is uniform. Then we can estimate the, 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 the size of, of, of the emission area pretty precisely. If, if you do this uh, above the far function, uh, then we can estimate this is it on the level of 90%. And, and in all our images, we, we did uh, this estimation of the imaging size. Here I, I show some of our experimental setup. This is experimental setup in Notre Dame University. And this is our new setup which we built in the Yoffa Institute in, in laboratory of, of Yuri Kostraev. And now we are starting to doing such kind of experiments here. And this, now the, the, the results. First of all, I did, did, did discuss a single dot spectra. So we, start, we, we measured by this technique nearly 30 different quantum dots. So they have a different size, a different electron population. I have selected one to which we, we can uh, assign some electron population. The, the first dot, dot uh, is this one, and, and actually uh, this is expressed in, in the Stokes energy. So and the Stokes energy, the zero is uh, the ground state transition S peak. So you can see here that, that in for this dot we have only only single peak, but, but if you increase the power, uh, we can observe uh, 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 excited state and, and high power, we can observe 
up to five states. And uh, for, for this quantum dot, we can say that it can, it, it, it can have from zero to two electrons. And, and be because you, you can see that the, for, for us, this is quantum confinement in, in, in pretty, it is pretty large. And in this case, and trine and electron are, are, are stable, and the, but, but, but this can be easily done if you, if, you, if you measure a shift in magnetic field, this experimental experiments are in progress. And, and for, for the shift, we can easily see who, who, what kind of, of exciton is this. And, and here is two, 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 uh, two other dots, uh, which we assign to a single electron do dose. And you can see, if you go to uh, strong confinement to, to, to large confinement, you see here is a, a very small confinement energy. This, this that observes some of the stock st uh, structure. And, and this can, can be understood as it's the trend of decomposition. So in excited states, trying to two electrons uh, going apart to form a Wigner molecule in, in excited state. And then you can easily, go after, after recombination, uh, one electron became sh shifted. So we can easily cal calculate the, the distribution of all this uh, intensity of different transition. And we can estimate the, um, the distance between two quantum dots, and you can see here that, that what, what is a little bit strange is that um, for the smaller confinement, we have a, a smaller uh, bond length of the dot, which is quite unexpected and can indicate its signature on, on, on whispering gallery mode. Here I show uh, two electron co co quantum dot, and uh, this is the spectrum. We, we start seeing some um, uh, anti stock peaks, and we can see odd um, harmonics of this, and, and, and we analyze its electron rules, and, and this is what we ex expected for two, two electron co quantum dot. Here is a three electron quantum dot. Uh, this is, a, again, we see only one anti stock and few stocks line, and, and we establish it for, from near field e images in which we see a, a three peaks. And, and, and the last case I show how much it goes on is the, the, the dot which have additional anti stock component. It's approximately, we can assign seven uh, um, uh, mm, electrons. You can see that if you have a larger confinement, we have a broad lines. We decrease confinement, we, we start to see uh, much sharper lines. And, uh, and, and if you have a very small confinement, every large, uh, every line are split. It. So now I come to our preliminary uh, result of, on imaging. And you can see here the, the different quantum dots with different shells. So, um, and, and this is the, the images which we got for, for, for these dots. And this is the quantum confinement energies. You can see that for, for this dot, we, which, dot which have pretty, pretty large confinement energy, we have a, a, a small images like 70 or 60 nanometers. If you have a, a smaller con confinement, the, the, the size is, is, is a few times larger, which, which is expected. But, but this dot, dot, dot will look very, very an anomalous. So it has a pretty large confinement, but the size of, of this image is, is pretty large. And, and, and this, uh, the rest I did discuss later. So this is a f final experimental uh, result. So I just enlarge uh, all, all the images uh, and compare them with, with the charge density distribution. So this is a normal dot, which you can see that the near field image, size of near field image equal to the size of charge density distribution. And here is the three anomal do do dots. This is a one electron dot. You, you can see that the, 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 the image size ne nearly three times larger, and, and it actually it is coincides with the estimation of, of um, molecular bo bo bond length, d d d which we did for, for, for from the single dose spectra. Here, we, we, we can recognize here three maxima in which we can uh, conclude that it's three electron dot, but if you look at charge d d distribution, should then uh, we, we see that the, the, the real, uh, it is smaller to calculate it. So, uh, there are two possibilities which we can consider. For probably you can have a whispering gallery modes like uh, we have M3, or there is, can be a pa pairing of, of electrons. And, and, uh, and here the, the, the same situation. So it, 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 this can be indication of whispering gallery modes. And the last slide, uh, some estimation of, of energies and so on. So the, this is the calculation of ground state energy of four for six electron versus dot, 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 diameter. Uh, and uh, this is the calculation of, of, of the energy uh, of, of, um, uh, of electrons versus the probable wavelength using the, this simple for, for formula. And you, you can see that the, the energy of, of, of ground energy of electrons and wavelengths of these electrons 
are much uh, smaller the, the, uh, the, than the, the, the diameter. So here, the, the, this particular remote can exist. And, and, and then we estimate the, the energies of this particular remote using simple uh, resonant condition. So the, 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 this is this lines. And we can see that, that uh, the, uh, this with remote can exist in, in, in this quantum dot, and, and, and the, there is some re resonance d d diameters in which uh, with Pellinger remote can be in resonance with this ground state. So, and probably this can give uh, uh, an explanation, some sort of explanation of the, that we observe so, so, uh, this anomalous do uh, dot. And here I just for, um, for, for the dot having diameter 150 nan nanometers plus the distribution of, of ground state for Vigdon molecules and, and for, for, for this particular remote. So we can see that they can, if they, if they agree, they can inter interact with it somehow and give a, a, some exotic uh, electron distribution in quantum dots. So this is my last slide and this is my conclusions. So we used near field optical scanning microscopy to study effect of localization of, of quantum dots. Passive gallium and passive quantum dots, and we got some si si signatures that we 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 spell gallium most can can exist in the, for this dot. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Please questions. Can you measure why this technique also spin dependent things so or spin polarizations? Uh, I don't know. In, in principle, yes, but we did not do, do, do this. In principle, yes, that's it. So one should put polarizers on the top uh, of the we, 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 did, uh, we did the polarization, uh, uh, polarized measurement um, for this quantum dot, in, but, but fibers, they d distorted a little bit the, uh, the polarization, but I, I, there is a technique of compensation of this. So I do not see other questions. Thank okay. you for presentation. Next talk will be presented by Dr. Zinoviev on the strain effects in photoluminescence from the groups of laterally ordered silicon germanium quantum dots. <coughs> the present uh, work uh, is devoted to <coughs> uh, uh, the study of strain effect <coughs> on uh, photoluminescent property uh, of the laterally ordered uh, silicon germanium quantum dots. Uh, uh, this work, uh, um, uh, the result of this work uh, uh, obtained it in collaboration with uh, a Scientific Practical Material Research Center of the National Academy of Science of Belarus. Uh, uh, in, in currently in, in the world, uh, there is considerable interest uh, in creating uh, uh, light emitted device based on silicon technology. Uh, the main reason is uh, the integration with uh, light emitted uh, with uh, silicon chips. Uh, silicon is indirect band material and this leads to a very low radiative recombination probability. Uh, one of the ways to solve this problem uh, uh, is the use uh, quantum confinement effect in quantum dot structures. In this case, the relaxation of momentum conservation rules uh, lead to uh, uh, increase uh, probability of uh, di uh, direct optical transition for uh, charge carriers uh, uh, strongly, str strongly localized in quantum dots. Uh, uh, the most promising uh, system for realization of this uh, idea 
uh, is the silicon germanium heterox structure with germanium uh, dots. Uh, here, uh, uh, holes are localized in, uh, in germanium uh, and uh, silicon localized uh, mm, uh, in silicon uh, vicinity uh, germanium quantum dots uh, in uh, strain induced uh, uh, potential However, uh, uh, for this system, uh, we have some problem. One problem uh, is that uh, 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 electrons is, uh, are weakly bounded and it's prevent uh, 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 photoluminescence at the room temperature. But uh, 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 it, it, was, uh, it, it was shown by theoretical and experimental works uh, th that uh, binding energy uh, in this system can be increased considerably uh, up to uh, 100 milli electron volts. Uh, in our work we uh, demonstrated that uh, 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 confinement uh, potential for uh, carriers of both for holes and electrons can be uh, enhanced uh, by using special type of structure uh, uh, which is represented by combination of large, large uh, disk-like quantum dots uh, and uh, uh, laterally ordered quantum dots uh, grown over uh, disk-like quantum dots. In this system, large quantum uh, dots uh, provide significant deformation, silicon and, uh, 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 and eff effectively lowering contact conduction bond uh, in vicinity uh, quant big quant uh, large quantum dots and but uh, small quantum dots which have higher germanium content uh, uh, produce peak deformation uh, and uh, forming very narrow and deep potential well for electron in silicon and for holes in germanium. Uh, uh, the details of formation combined structure uh, already reported uh, on this conference so I describe it shortly. Uh, the combined structure uh, uh, with different lay, uh, quantum dots lay uh, uh, was grown by uh, using uh, molecular beam epitaxy method. Uh, uh, firstly, uh, th three, three, th three layered uh, quantum, vertically stacked quantum dots uh, were grown, uh, uh, and, uh, were grown at the substrate temperature uh, uh, 700 degree uh, with spacer between layers 20 nanometers. Uh, each quantum uh, dot layer formed by deposition seven monolayer of germanium. A top quantum dot layer uh, uh, capped by uh, thin silicon layer, five nanometer silicon layer. Uh, deposition uh, silicon uh, modify, strongly modifies uh, morphology of quantum dots, lead to disk-like uh, shaped uh, 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 quantum dots. Uh, we use multi-layer growth to improve uh, uh, size ordering and to obtain uh, ordering in uh, growth plane in, in growth direction. Uh, such ordered structure used as template for nucleation and growth fortress-like uh, uh, fortress-like lateral ordered quantum dots group. Uh, according to our study, 
uh, specific uh, configuration uh, uh, quantum dots inside group uh, is mainly controlled by uh, surface energy strain uh, distribution above uh, silicon germanium quantum dots. Uh, the structures with uh, we, uh, our structure with com with uh, laterally ordered quantum dots uh, is uh, capped uh, by 40 nanometer silicon layer and studied by uh, photoluminescent method. Uh, uh, high ordering uh, of quantum dots in our structure allow to distinguish uh, 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 photoluminescent peak uh, for different type of quantum dots. Uh, uh, here present photoluminescent uh, spectra uh, for uh, combined structure uh, with one layer uh, laterally ordered quantum dot groups. Uh, the low em energy emission peak at 0.81 electron volt corresponding non for non uh, recombination carriers uh, in laterally ordered quantum dot group. Uh, other peak uh, at 0.91 electron volt uh, can be associated with uh, uh, non for non recombination uh, carriers in uh, three layers of vertically stacked template quantum dots uh, and uh, peak, peak at the 0.86 electron volt. Uh, uh, this is a phonon replica for, uh, for the peak which is associated with uh, template quantum dots. Other high energy peak can be associated with weighting layer and uh, with uh, uh, silicon substrate. Uh, it should be noted that uh, uh, for peak uh, which corresponded to uh, laterally ordered groups uh, of small quantum dots, we uh, don't observe, uh, uh, don't observe uh, uh, photon replica. Uh, I think that uh, this uh, direct uh, demonstration uh, uh, quantum confinement effect uh, due to uncertainty of momentum uh, in small sized quantum dots uh, uh, we, uh, we have inhibition selection rules and uh, uh, optical uh, transition in, in uh, quantum, small quantum dot uh, became quasi direct. Mm. In the next slide, uh, we show power dependence peak position. Uh, interesting that uh, with increasing power, all, all peaks shift in higher energy range. It's typical behavior for uh, two type uh, uh, band alignment uh, system. Uh, interesting uh, that we, uh, uh, blue shift is uh, higher for lateral order quantum dot than for uh, uh, template quantum dots. It, and it can be explained by um, more large, uh, large uh, size dispersion of, of these quantum dots inside group due to low uh, temperature of their form formation as compared to template quantum dots. Uh, in the next slide, we show temperature dependence uh, uh, obtained for our structure. Uh, uh, it uh, clear visible uh, is a complex evolution peak with uh, increasing temperature. We found that uh, 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 peak associated with uh, template quantum dots disappear at uh, uh, 150 Kelvin, but uh, 
peak corresponded to la lateral ordered quantum dots is, uh, is uh, survived up to 270 Kelvin. Uh, uh, the uh, thermal quenching of uh, integrated intensity for different peak allow extract uh, activation energy. This activation energy can be associated with uh, depth of uh, confinement potential. We obtain that for um, mm, template cutes, uh, activation energy is about 149 milli electron volt. Uh, for laterally ordering group of quantum dots, uh, this energy is high. Uh, uh, activation energy is 211 milli electron volt and it can be associated uh, with uh, uh, escaping hole from uh, quantum dots, uh, small quantum dots in, in the group in uh, valence band state in the waiting layer. Uh, because uh, this uh, activation energy uh, almost the same as difference between uh, peak position for waiting layer and uh, for uh, uh, emission peak for uh, group of lateral ordering quantum dots. Uh, to enhance uh, intensity at the, uh, at the room temperature, we increase, uh, we increase uh, power excitation one order magnitude. Uh, this, present, th this presented uh, uh, photolimpicent spectra uh, at the room temperature for uh, one layer uh, silicon germanium flutter order quantum group system and this for double layer silicon germanium uh, quantum dot gr groups system. Uh, uh, it clear visible two peak, uh, first one corresponded uh, quantum quantum dot groups, second corresponded uh, uh, interbandary combination in silicon. Uh, the, the effect increasing intensi intensity uh, from quantum dots with increasing number of uh, quantum dot play is clear seen. So we propose special type of germanium silicon quantum dot uh, structures with special configuration quantum dots allowing to increase electron confinement potential. This structure allow us to obtain uh, photoluminescent uh, for small quantum dots at the room temperature. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Please, questions? Maybe I can start. So you studied type two quantum dots. And my question is whether you have analyzed the linear polarization degree of the photoluminescence. Because in this case, when one, your emission goes across the interface mm -hmm. and you have also tilted, uh, the role of one of the interface can be stronger than the role of another interface. So you can expect linear anisotropy in this case. We don't make this measurement, but I think so it's uh, very interesting. It, it should be done. <laughs> Maybe I can advise because we play also the type two quantum wells in the wide band gap semiconductance and there was very strong linear polarization degree and one can have an access to the interface properties through, through that. I think so. If I get rid right of your picture, uh, it's temperature dependent. So you're also literally order quantum dots there not quite stable this temperature. So <coughs> this, this, this will disappear faster than for just regular quantum dots. Is that right? That slide number 10 or so, uh, this temperature dependence. You mean uh, uh, we use, uh, just a moment. Uh, we use uh, high temperature. Yes, in here, yeah. You see uh, at the left, yeah, that, that's this quantum dots you just propose and they disappear with high temperature, yeah? In, co in contrast to this standard, uh, this, is, uh, this is large quantum dots produced um, at higher temperature 
And uh, I think so. Uh, for this type of quantum dots, uh, con uh, the confinement uh, potential is uh, lower, and, ac and activation energy lower, and, and this peak completely disappear uh, at, uh, before room temperature. We only we have only we s only s uh, one peak survive from from quantum dot. This is peak f uh, for small lateral order at quantum dots. E this is situation possible only in our system because without uh, additional strain, uh, activation energy for small dot will be uh, smaller. Okay. Don't see further questions. Thank you very much. Concluding talk of the section will be done by Dr. Polshakov on absorption suppression in indium gallium nitride, gallium nitride resonant break structures. Thank you, but uh, I'm not a doctor, I'm a PhD student. Um, and uh, um, I work at the uh, Yorkshire Institute um, and I w uh, want to talk about uh, resonant break structure um, with indium gallium nitrate quantum wells uh, in gallium nitrate mat matrix and some interesting effects uh, um, which are observed in it, uh, uh, particularly uh, the resonant suppression of, of absorption. Uh, I should start uh, from motivation of the work. Uh, passive, break uh, passive break structures um, are simply periodic la layered uh, dielectric structures. And um, they are well known uh, since 19th century. Uh, and uh, they are widely used. Um, they have um, reflection, uh, reflection uh, bands in uh, their frequency dom domain uh, when the frequency of uh, light satisfy, uh, satisfies uh, the break condition. But uh, uh, more interesting uh, are resonant break structures. Uh, when uh, dielectric function of one of the constituent material uh, has a pole at uh, the break frequency. Uh, because ma uh, material resonances uh, are um, sensitive to external impact, uh, such a structure may, may be um, an, an effective optical modulator. Uh, one kind of uh, such structures are uh, periodic uh, heterostructures with quantum wells. When um, period, uh, then the break frequency of uh, the structure uh, is tuned to uh, the quantum well exciton frequency. Uh, such structures were um, proposed by Ivchenko and co-workers. Uh, reflecti reflectivity from uh, one quantum well is usually small uh, because uh, due to small uh, is usually small due to small radiative and uh, large non-radiative exciton decay. But uh, when uh, quantum wells are arranged in a, a periodic sequence, um, effective radiative broadening occurs to be uh, multi multiplied by the number of the quantum wells, provided uh, the break condition is satisfied. Uh, uh, this uh, could be explained as uh, constructive interference of light waves reflected from each quantum well. In fact, uh, the formed normal electromagnetic mode um, is a standing wave, 
with nodes with uh, with with nodes at uh, the centers of the quantum wells. Moreover, uh, this mode uh, is uh, odd uh, with respect to the center of the quantum well centers. Uh, meanwhile, uh, exciton envelope function evaluated at zero electron hole separation is even. Uh, hence, um, the interaction between electromagnetic field and excitons uh, vanishes. And we should observe a drop in uh, exciton uh, luminescence and absorption. Uh, such, such structures were investigated early, earlier, uh, mainly on gallium arsenide systems. Um, we see here um, uh, exciton and uh, break uh, reflection uh, features, uh, which uh, enlarge uh, each other uh, when uh, they coincide to each other. Uh, and uh, here we see also um, a reflection uh, from uh, resonant break structure. Uh, uh, from resonant break structures with a different number of the quantum wells. Uh, we, we see what that uh, we sh with, with increasing of number of the quantum wells, uh, resonant peak increases uh, and, uh, um, and its uh, width uh, uh, increases linearly from the number of the quantum wells. And uh, absorption drop uh, was also observed in uh, that structures. But it should be noted uh, that uh, these results uh, uh, had been obtained uh, at uh, very low temperatures uh, because uh, exciton in gallium arsenide um, has uh, very low binding energy. On the opposite, uh, uh, binding energy of gallium nitrate excitons is comparable with uh, room temperature oscillation energy, even in the bulk form. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, why we have chosen a gallium nitrate based uh, structure as, as the object of our study. Uh, the samples uh, have been grown grown by metal organic vapor phase uh, deposition. Um, quantum indium gallium nitrate quantum well uh, thickness was about exciton bore radius in gallium nitrate. Uh, actually, uh, there w uh, has been grown uh, structures uh, with a different number of the quantum wells and, uh, qu and X-ray uh, diffraction curves uh, uh, show good quality uh, of the structures and reproducibility of the growth process. Uh, we will concern uh, the structure with fixed quantum wells. This is uh, photoluminescence spectrum of our structure. We suggest uh, that line width of exciton line in uh, that uh, spectrum uh, is uh, mainly inhomogeneous. Uh, uh, despite uh, big progress uh, achieved in gallium nitrate technology during uh, uh, the recent years, Indium gallium nitrate quantum wells are subst substantially inhomogeneous in uh, thickness and composition. Uh, we have heard uh, about it on Tuesday. Uh, so it is a uh, big technology, technological challenge to grow uh, uh, the structure of uh, uh, required, requ required quality. Uh, it is uh, um, reflect reflectivity spectra of our structure um, obtained at uh, different angles of the light incidence. Uh, this is photoluminescence spectra again. Uh, uh, 
uh, there is a distinct break, break uh, peak uh, which uh, shifts towards uh, shorter wavelength uh, uh, with increasing angle of the light incidence. There isn't any dis distinguishable uh, exciton peak, but we see uh, when that uh, when break peak uh, travels uh, through some of the wavelength, uh, particularly uh, through wavelengths of uh, photoluminescence spectrum maximum. Uh, the break peak magnitude increases. We have plotted for clearness uh, and the difference between break peak magnitude and uh, corresponding Fresnel level. This is uh, red squares. Uh, corresponding XX coordinate is uh, the wavelength of the break peak. Uh, photoluminescence spectra is showed um, again uh, and uh, the correlation is obvious. We suggest that uh, this is manifestation of the forming superradiant mode. This is uh, transmission spectra of our sample uh, taken at different angles of the light incidence. Uh, this slope uh, corresponds to excitonic absorption. And uh, the break feature is also seen. Uh, in order to understand optical properties of our structure deeper and to uh, get some parameters, uh, we uh, have performed uh, some numerical simulations. Uh, despite the fact that exciton, uh, 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 that uh, excitonic uh, respo optical response is uh, non-local, uh, we can uh, replace it by the local contribution to dielectric function, provided uh, this condition is satisfied. Uh, we have also uh, taken into account uh, uh, optical transitions uh, between uh, quantum well, uh, wellens and conduction subbands uh, between uh, the states of uh, the continuous spectra of the quantum well. Uh, the calculations uh, have been performed uh, by uh, the tra transfers, uh, transfer matrix method. Uh, the results are shown here along this with experiment experimental spectra uh, for uh, two different angles of the light incidence. Uh, this is a reflection and uh, transmission spectra. Uh, red line is, exper is experiment. So a black line is uh, calcu uh, calculation and uh, blue line is also calculation but without taking into consideration quantum well continuous uh, transitions. Um, that is uh, only excellent contribution uh, was, uh, has been taken into con uh, consideration. We see that uh, uh, the last uh, spectra uh, fit experimental spectra worse. Moreover, uh, neglecting uh, quantum well continuous transitions uh, leads to underestimation of the resonant break uh, peak near the double uh, break exit and resonance condition. So uh, we think that is important to include these uh, transitions into consideration. Uh, uh, the calculations have been made uh, at uh, the single set of parameters uh, which is listed here. And uh, uh, quantum well exit on radiative broadening uh, uh, appears to be 0.2 milli electron, milli electron volts. 
uh, in order to investigate optical absorption of our sample, we should note that um, uh, the total optical losses uh, compri comprise both uh, uh, true absorption and uh, some scattering of light by impurities. Uh, so plotted here, uh, the upper curves are not absorption but optical extinction. Uh, again, red line is uh, ex experiment and uh, black line is calculation. Uh, in order to obtain uh, true absorption, we should neglect in the calculation uh, all, other, all other optical losses and, uh, um, and uh, the results are presented here, blue, line, blue lines. Uh, this absorption uh, is uh, due to exciton absorption and uh, quantum well continue and, uh, con and uh, the transitions in the quantum well continuous spectrum. One can see uh, that then the break condition uh, falls into the exciton resonance region. We see a, a drop in uh, the absorption, in the exciton absorption, in, uh, in accordance with the theoretical predictions. Uh, it is important because uh, if uh, we will um, shift uh, quantum well resonances by external modulation, uh, the absorption dip uh, should uh, remain at the same wavelength. And if, they, if we work at uh, that wavelength, uh, we, will, uh, uh, we should see uh, an, uh, the large uh, reflection modulation, uh, a uh, but uh, uh, the optical absorption uh, should uh, be uh, should be uh, remain low. It is interesting to compare exciton uh, and uh, uh, passive uh, contribution to the break peak. It uh, was also done uh, here ag again. Red line red line is experiment. Uh, uh, black line is uh, calculation with uh, quantum well resonances and blue line is calculation without taking into account uh, quantum well resonances, resonances. Uh, that is uh, also with uh, passive dielectric contrast. contrast. Uh, this is uh, this angle of the light incidence corresponds to double resonance condition where, where uh, when uh, break uh, frequency coincides with uh, the exciton frequency in, in the contour wells. And uh, we see uh, uh, that uh, when we neglect uh, quantum well resonances, um, uh, particularly exciton resonance, uh, the break peak uh, is uh, 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 almost uh, totally dis disappeared, uh, almost totally disappears. Uh, to sum up, uh, uh, we have developed uh, and uh, realized ex uh, exciton optical latches on indium gallium nitrate gallium nitrate quantum well system which operates at the room temperature. But maybe if I have forgotten to mention that all these experimental results were, uh, have been obtained at the room temperature. Uh, also, uh, the dro drop of absorption in uh, that uh, system w uh, has been also revealed. And it is shown uh, that correct fitting of the optical spectra of our structures uh, 
needs uh, taken into consideration not uh, only exiton uh, resonance but also neighboring resonances in the account. Um, our results uh, have been published in our work. Thanks for attention. Thank you. Please, questions? Maybe you show a slide uh, for the absorption and separation, extinctions and other mechanisms. Ex exactly here. My question is... So the black line is feed for the experimental data, yes? Uh, yes. The red line is experimental uh, no, no, data. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Black line is feed for experimental data. But then you say that you can subtract all mechanisms which comes from the scattering, or all contributions of the scattering. Do you know that? Do you measure that? Or you just only uh, calculate them to subtract? Uh, this is calculation uh, based on uh, our uh, considerations. Uh, that uh, there is uh, relay scattering. Uh, that uh, they should, uh, it should be noted uh, that uh, optical losses at uh, the low wavelength uh, side of the spectra uh, should uh, be also by scattering. Um, this uh, uh, was not expected to present uh, to uh, substantial uh, absorption in the quantum well uh, or everywhere uh, presented in uh, the low wavelength site. Okay. May I ask you, I, I didn't catch, where is the optical gap in your structure? Uh, Optical uh, gap, gap, yeah, into gap. a two periodical structure. Yeah, there, there should uh, be. A, yes, um, there should this, be is gap. Uh, this is uh, somewhere here in this uh, region. No, um, no, uh, uh, this is uh, this should be the break uh, feature when uh, if uh, uh, the number of the quantum well uh, should be so large. But uh, all structures uh, uh, have not too large uh, number of periods. So we work in, uh, not in the photonic crystal re regime, but in uh, the so-called super radiant regime, when uh, reflection at the break, break frequency is uh, not, uh, but uh, when the reflection of the break, uh, at the break frequency, uh, d don't approach is one hundred percent. So you suppose that sixty quantum uh, world not enough to uh, form. Uh, uh, we have to form uh, the uh, photon gap. Eh? We have uh, uh, quantum well thickness uh, very um, very low uh, with respect to total uh, period. And uh, indium content is also not too big. Uh, this was done intentionally to um, reduce uh, passive dielectric contrast. Seems also that broadening is very large in your case. Yeah, it's like 40 yes. milli electron volt, uh, which also reduce efficiency. Uh, broadening of the exciton line is about 40 milli electron volt, uh, but uh, we. Uh, suggest uh, that uh, this broadening is mostly inhomogeneous because um, no, uh, differences in quantum well uh, thickness and composition. So thank you very much and let us thank all speakers of this session. Pause.
центральный парк. Алло. Алло. Нет. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to start our session. My name is Vladimir Chalice, I'll chair. This session is quite short, it's supposed to be three talks, but we actually have two of them. And so it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Alexander Efras uh, from Naval Lab. Yeah, we invited talk 
electronic and optical properties of lead halide peroxide nanocrystals. So please. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dames and господа. Before we get started, I would like to thank Jerez Alfiorov and Robert Suris and other organizers of this wonderful meeting for this opportunity to give talk here as well as visit St. Petersburg. I have not been here for 10 years. So today I'm going to talk about electronic and optical property of lead halide perovskite nanocrystal. And the result you will hear about today we obtain is the result of expert theoretical collaboration between uh, our theoretical group at NRL and uh, experimentalists from uh, IBM Zurich, Stoffel Mart, and Reina, and um, ATH, uh, Maxim Kovalenko, and David Norris. My research in this area is supported by Office of Naval Research. As uh, most probably of us know, that hybrid organic and inorganic perovskite become rapidly one of the most prominent material in the photovoltaic field. During the last four years, the solar cell based on perovskite nanocrystal efficiency was raised from 3% to 22% and become comparable with the efficiency of standard solid state devices, silicon, cadmium telluride, copper indium selenide. And this uh, outstandingly good property were connected with direct band gap of material, very high absorption coefficient, long carry diffusion length, and clear all this material prepared by liquid uh, precision have very low productive cost. Um, clear people try to study other optical application of this class of material, and particularly people start to grow lead halide perovskite nanocrystal and without practically no effort there were very bright luminescence coming from this material and here is an example I show you uh, a luminescence collected from ensemble of sodium lead bromide chloride iodide nanocrystal in the alloy you see the luminescence cover practically entire region of visible spectra and uh, they show all remarkably bright photoluminescence, which characterized by quantum yields 50, 90 percent at room temperature, and narrow emission line width without practically no efforts. And uh, this bright emission clearly important for various applications. And uh, this source of this bright emission was tracked down to rather short radiative decay time which is at least five times shorter than decay time if standard colloidal nanocrystal, for example, cut selenide nanocrystal was optimized for 25 years, but this nanocrystal is already brighter than cut selenide. And even more surprisingly, this nanocrystal show sub-nanosecond decay time at helium temperature, 250 picoseconds. Here I show a result of this measurement. So here I show you TM image of uh, typical lead halide perovskite nanocrystal growing Maxim Kovalenko group. It has quasi-cubic shape with H length, which varies from 8 to 14 nanometers. Here I also show as example as uh, atomic structure of unit cell, which is formed by corner touching. Uh, lead octahedral and which void filled up by cesium. In organic perovskite, this void filled by organic molecule. In order to describe optical property of nanocrystal within effective mass approximation like we want to do, we calculated bulk energy structure of this material uh, using DFT theory for all three types of perovskite, ma uh, perovskite material and here I show bulk energy structure of cubic perovskite cesium lead bromide nanocrystal. In all this material, the bent edge is in R point of brilliant zone. And uh, as a result, 
top of the valence band is created uh, from contribution of 6s p orbit of uh, 6s orbit of lead and 4p orbit of brom which is all have s type symmetry and that is why top of the valence blends uh, block function can be written in such form it is s type block function with spin up and spin down bottom of conduction band is created from 6p orbit of lead and due to strong spin orbital uh, coupling, this uh, six orbit are split into two-fold degenerate band with J equal one half and four-fold degenerate band uh, gamma eight. And here I show block function as the bottom of uh, conduction band J equal one half for spin uh, J plus one and minus one half. Uh, it is known that R point of brilliant zone is isomorphic to gamma point of brilliant zone in cubic semiconductor. And indeed, you see that uh, in all two, six, three, five semiconductor, we know the conduction band has asymmetry. Now it becomes asymmetry of the valence band. And the valence band consists of six band, also typical for two, six, three, five compound. And now it is conduction band of this material. Uh, and uh, as a result, the effective mass pigeon and brown Hamiltonian, which was written many years ago to describe electron and hole spectra of material, also can be used for description of the uh, electron and hole spectra in perovskite nanocrystal, taking into account the band, band gap is reverse. Due to very large spin orbit coupling, a good description of electron and hole dispersion can be obtained by extracting a four by four part of this eight by eight pigeon brown Hamiltonian related to gamma six minus gamma six plus band of the valence and conduction band. And here I show this Hamiltonian, quite simple, four by four, more or less k in Hamiltonian, where P, P is a Kane matrix element, P operator of momentum, alpha E, alpha H contribution of remote band to effective masses of electron hole. So uh, this lead to falling dispersion of electron hole spectra where energy gap is distant between bottom of conduction band EC and top of the valent band EV. And we use k energy notation proportional to square of k matrix element. So uh, again, to describe optical property within effective mass approximation, we need to extract energy band parameter for this perovskite material. Uh, and we do it fitting the four band model which I presented you before to the result of first principle calculation which I show here for all three material. Indeed, effective mass of electron and hole in conduction valence band expressed through contribution of remote band and K and energy parameter. On the other hand, at very wide range of energy, conduction valence band has linear dispersion on P. And generally using these three expression, we can fit this uh, four band model to result of first principle calculation. And here I show table of parameter which extract from this fitting. On this table, I also show experimental energy gap for all the three material, chloride, bromide, and iodide. And uh, also, the dielectric constant which we use further in our calculation, which was extracted from Banyak energy of Exeter. Here I must start to mention that we'll study quite large nanocrystal where all happening at the band edge. That is why for all this nanocrystal, a single, single band parabolic approximation work very well. You can forget about non-parabolicity. You use all expression which is written in handbook on quantum mechanics for many, many years. So uh, when we uh, optical excitation create electron and hole at uh, the band edges of this gamma six, gamma seven band, which have uh, angular momentum one half, and they are mixed up due to electron hole exchange interaction, only total exciton momentum is conserved. All these four exciton state are split into J equals zero singlet state, and I show here the function. 
and triplet degenerate, triplet state, threefold degenerate with respect of its projection momentum, plus minus one and zero, also by function written here. If you study optical property of organic molecule or organic semiconductor, there is no spin orbit coupling. In the absence of coupling, the total angle of momentum J equals zero, you can serve during the optical excitation because light doesn't flip the electron hole spin and the result only J equals zero, singlet state is optically active in this momentum. Generally, uh, the selection rule are determined by calculation of this transition dipole matrix element written here with polarization E and P is momentum. And straightforward calculation for block function, which I showed you before, show that with spin orbit coupling, this transition matrix element is zero for J equals zero and not equal for J uh, equal one. As a result, you have optically active triplet state with J equal one and optically passive singlet state with J equal zero. And this result can be confirmed by analyzing of group theory, the irreducible representation of electron and hole, gamma six minus, uh, gamma six minus and gamma six plus. The multiplication give you two irreducible representation, gamma one minus singlet state and gamma four minus triplet state optically active. What? Something wrong happened here. Uh, don't know. So uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, triplet state, however, in antarombic perovskite uh, is uh, split into three sub-level uh, uh, due to antarombic perturbation. Each of these spin sub-level has uh, well-defined uh, dipole X, Y, Z, dipole, the orthogonal, and parallel to the uh, primary axis of orthorhombic unit cell. So there is three uh, optically active state at the bent edge of this material with orthogonal polarization. And here I show photoluminescence of single lead halide nanocrystal. In this case, a cesium lead brom chloride. Uh, this photoluminescence, the helium temperature show three peaks. And all of these peaks are uh, polarized and they will show you later this polarization structure directly connected with the three orthogonal dipole, as well as orientation direction of the measurement. So here I show decay time measured in iodide bromide chloride nanocrystal for a crystal which size is between 40 nanometer and 11 nanometer. You see photoluminescent decay time changing from 0.99 second to 0.2 second when increases excitation frequency. So this rise equation why photoluminescent time in this structure from exciton is so short. Uh, we can calculate uh, decay time using calculating probability of light emission. However, calculation of this decay time which express uh, electric fields of photon and matrix element P, uh, operator momentum P, has some troubles, uh, is different from standard calculation of decay time which exists in spherical nanocrystal. Because in cubic shape nanocrystal, electric field of photon which penetrates in nanocrystal is inhomogeneous. So let me uh, remind you how this work in the spherical nanocrystal. If you applied electric field to nanocrystal, electric field inside nanocrystal of photon reduce it due to the electric screening, which depends on the ratio of outside and inside electric constant. This is not the case for cube-shaped nanocrystal. Here I show you distribution of electric field to the cube-shaped nanocrystal to which we apply homogeneous electric field. You see also reduction of electric field of inside nanocrystal. However, electric field inside nanocrystal is not homogeneous. Is a little bit larger than the center of nanocrystal, as small as the edges. Here, also for comparison, I'll show you how this uh, electric field inside nanocrystal behave in spherical nanocrystal. 
This is constant line shown here by a dashed uh, line. So you see this electric field in spherical nanocrystal a little bit larger than electric field in cube-shaped nanocrystal. Here I show two-dimensional distribution of this uh, Z component of electron field on ZX mid-plane, uh, calculated for ratio of the electric constant six. You see the screening of the external field a little bit larger on normal edges of the side of cube and a little bit smaller on the side, side of the cube. Uh, electric field of photon inside spherical nanocrystal was parallel to electric field of photon outside of nanocrystal. This is not a case for cube nanocrystal again. And the electric field, uh, homogeneous electric field parallel to Z axis generate X and Y component of electric field inside nanocrystal. And here I show you two-dimensional distribution of the electric X component of electric field uh, on the ZX mid-plane. What is important here, this component change side when it cross Z axis of the cross section. Calculation were conducted for this ratio. So let's consider radiative, compare radiative decay time, which we calculated standardly in spherical nanocrystal with the result of calculation in cube-shaped nanocrystal. In spherical nanocrystal, here I show a well-known equation, the rate of exciton decay proportional to the uh, frequency of emitted light, refractive index, depolarization factor for spherical nanocrystal squared, and square of overlap integral between electron and whole wave function conf of confined exciton nanocrystal. In the cube shaped nanocrystal, the decay rate for each of these three orthogonal dipole are equal to each other and can be written in such form where I parallel square replace this factor, d square over k. I parallel is kind of average of effective electric field of photon in the side uh, nanocrystal is Z projection with uh, electron hole overlap integral. Importantly, the perpendicular, uh, this integral for X and Y component in the, this field, it vanishes due to even parity of the electron wave function of ground exciton state. And this actually very important because to make long story short, I can say the linear polarized dipole inside nanocrystal still emits linear polarized light, despite the fact that electric field of photon is inhomogeneous distribution. And this happened because of this property. So <coughs> the electron and hole wave function inside confined and exciton in nanocrystal uh, strongly depend on nanocrystal size. In the strong confinement regime, when uh, radius of work exciton is larger than nanocrystal radius, optical property of nanocrystal are controlled by transition between quantum size level of electron hole. And the first approximation, exciton wave function is just product of electron and hole wave function in this limit. And in parabolic band approximation, this wave function are identical to each other. And this is expression for uh, cube-shaped nanocrystal and parabolic quantum approximation, we can find it again. And then a handbook on quantum mechanics. In the weak confinement regime, uh, optical property of nanocrystal controlled by exciton center of mass motion quantization. So exciton is like hydrogen atom in the box, and wave function is a product of relative motion of electron at hole inside exciton, and wave function of exciton center of mass motion quantization so it's like atom moving from side to side. So let's uh, study the size dependence of decay time. It is mainly controlled by the size dependence of this I parallel square integral. So in the case of strong confinement regime, this integral is independent of the size. In the weak confinement regime, the square of this integral proportional to the volume of the quantum dots. This uh, dramatically increase oscillated transition strength in uh, this volume 
and is known as the giant oscillator transition strength of the weak confinement exciton. The phenomenon was first predicted and studied by Professor Rashba and should, in principle, have it, his name. Uh, using this uh, calculation, we can calculate radiative decay time and weak and strong confinement regime. And uh, here I show comparison of this uh, decay time measured for, uh, calculated for spherical shape quantum dot and cubic shape to another crystal in the weak and strong confinement regime as a function of the ratio of the electric constant inside and outside of nanocrystal. Surprisingly, you can see the decay time in spherical shape nanocrystal is faster than in cubic shape nanocrystal because first intuition would say that spherical nanocrystal screening of external electric field should, should be more efficient. This is not the case, however, and uh, you see that decay time in spherical shape nanocrystal with the same volume as a cube shape nanocrystal going faster. So, but uh, all this, all nanocrystal are in the immediate confinement regime when Bohr radius comparable with the size of the, uh, our quantum dots. And to study the energy of optical transition for this case and decay time, we use uh, one parameter consumption function where parameter beta here take into account electron and hole correlation. Uh, using this uh, ANSAS function, we calculate size dependence of the i parallel square integral for this three component com compound, chloride, bromide, and iodide. And we're able to compare result of our calculation with experimental measurement of the decay time measured at helium temperature in this material. Here, this uh, three region of calculation, strong confinement approximation, weak confinement approximation. In the middle range, it is intermediate confinement uh, approximation, which consisted with the experimental data. You see the experimental data shown by this blue point, uh, theoretical data shown by the plant point, and the experimental data show, shown here by big uh, blue squared you see that experimental data on radiative decay time in this material is uh, in quite good agreement with the result of our theoretical calculation, which was obtained without any fitting parameters, which confirms that this short decay time, which was absorbed in nanocrystal, connected with giant oscillated transition strength predicted by Rajma. Uh, so now I want to show you the typical uh, spectra of photolimesis measured from individual cesium lead bromide chloride nanocrystal. Uh, the many of them, 50% of them, show just one peak luminescence. However, here I show you uh, two peak luminescence measured and three peak luminescence measured at five Kelvin. Look on this spectra, first thing you realize that uh, assumption the intensity of the peaks connected with thermal population of exciton sublevel doesn't work here because distance between peak around 1 MeV and this upper level at 5 Kelvin shouldn't be populated at all. So uh, this, in order to describe the fine structure, we need to assume that temperature in this nanocrystal was significantly larger than 5 Kelvin. Secondly, you can see also that second peak quite often larger than first peak. It also inconsistent with any assumption of a Boltzmann population of this exciton sublevel. As I will show you later, this phenomenon connects with polarization property of emitted light. So here I show you our theoretical expectation on how photoluminescence from these three orthogonal dipoles should look like if you measure them in different direction. Then so show here polarization property of this emission line. Initially, we assume that all three sublevel are equally populated. And here I show the uh, spectrum which we expect in observation direction 100, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, and 3, 1, 2. 
first of all, it is clear that in observation 0, 1, 0, we don't see middle peak which have polarization y because this dipole doesn't contribute to observation direction 0, 1, 0. So these two peaks connect with the upper and lower sublevel of the fine structure of hexagon. In the case of 0, 0, 1, we don't see luminescence from upper uh, sublevel of exciton. In the case of 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, we see all three peaks, uh, and the most strongest peak come from uh, lowest peak, which have X dipole, because this dipole perpendicular to observation direction. And finally, you see spectra, which in principle can be seen in observation 3, 1, 2 direction, and the strongest line is middle, because if you look on the geometrical figure, you see that this line practically perpendicular to observation direction. Now let's consider the effect of thermal population. If temperature we assume comparable with sign structure splitting, you see it practically killed down the upper exciton level here. But there is an exception, like in the case 312, which uh, polarization contribution of the second peak here compensate difference in the polarization direction. So uh, our theoretical consideration of this uh, uh, polarization property for luminescence low temperature not only shows that this diversity of photoluminescence spectra which they see in single quantum dot spectroscopy, but also can in some way predict observation direction relative to autorhombic axis of the nanocrystal. And here I show two examples of such calculation. For example, for two peak spectra, polarization property shows that these two dipole practically are orthogonal to each other, and the upper level is not populated and not seen in this direction. So we can assume that these two levels are uh, thermally populated and extracted from this fitting temperature of the effective temperature of exit on this structure, which is 30 Kelvin. Much more complex analysis required to describe three peak spectra, but also we can find direction of observation 1, 2.4, 2.6. Here I also show the photoluminescence spectra measured in the case when you have just one line in photoluminescence, when only ground state is populated. What is important, this photoluminescence is linear polarized. And it is strong evidence that this one of the line of triplet because if it would be trian in this structure, trian line shouldn't be polarized at all. So you can distinguish in single quantum dose spectroscopy in which cases you have trian, in which cases you have uh, exciton. Finally, I want to show statistics for observation of single two-peak and three-peak structure uh, measured in individual cesium lead bromide chloride nanocrystal with average size from 8 nanometer to 40 nanometer, totally 51 quantum dot well study, it shows 35 splitting on total. Generally, 50% of all quantum dots show single one spectra, which shows that only one level is populated. And here I show statistic uh, distribution of the average splitting in two peak spectra and three peak, sp uh, three peak spectra. You see the average three-peak spectra uh, splitting is smaller than the two-peak spectra. And he has, it is stronger formation that all two-peak three and three-peak spectra came from the same uh, uh, origin, from three orthogonal dipole. Indeed, because two lines of spectra can evolve any of two of the three feature. The average splitting can be estimated like two sort of delta one and delta two. So predicted ratio for average splitting in two spectra, in three line spectra is 1.33, experimental value was 1.42. And we found that it is strong evidence that all emissions come from the three orthogonal dipole created by the structure of this perovskite nanocrystal. So this is my summary. We have calculated energy band structure of all three perovskite and there are four band models that describe the electronic property. 
Using this model, we calculate quantum confine level structure and optical property of this cubic or quasi-cubic shaped nanocrystal. We show the fine structure of the bent tension exciton consists of three linear polarized orthogonal level with the same oscillator transition strengths. Each of these levels emit linear polarized light despite the fact that electric field of photon in this cubic shaped nanocrystal is inhomogeneous. Due to giant oscillator transition strengths radiated decay time in helium temperature IPS sub nanosecond time regime, and measured decay time at low temperature was described quantity without any fitting parameters. This concludes my presentation. I would be happy to answer any question you might have. Thank you. So, any questions? So you observe three lines uh, is corresponding to, to, with three uh, J equal to one state. So the state J equal to zero is not observed at all, or uh, it may be, if it is not observed, it can be observed in magnetic fields. Uh, thank you for this question, very important question. So uh, question is where is dark state generally? Because uh, there are three optical active states which clearly see in luminescence, and somewhere there should be J equals zero state, which is optically passive. Uh, the unconditional submission papers, I cannot go into full detail, but I will tell you that we believe that different from all other material, a ground state in this material is optically active and uh, optically passive state is above this. And there was uh, experimental data conducted with in Ragach group, uh, the Lunis group from Noah, a sample which come from Ragach group. They tried to find this state by applying external magnetic field. In the, this, uh, this was standard method the Lunis used before to find dark exciton state in cut selenite nanocrystal, and they didn't see any activation of the sum additional level when they apply them. Sasha, <laughs> why these uh, compounds uh, jumped up uh, just now, not earlier? Sorry? Why these compounds yeah. jumped uh, up uh, just uh, now, not earlier, 10 years ago? Or yeah. Uh, is it the uh, I don't matter have, of I technology don't, I, or... I don't have any explanation because this measurement of exciton were conducted in Russia 30 years ago. And nobody was interested in this, <laughs> the exciton fine structures. As you just, nobody was interested. <laughs> no, the push no come... Special, no special reason. No, yeah. no special reason, but somebody started to use it photovoltaic. And all of a sudden, from 3% to 22% for four years, so practically, right. shows that something special about this material. Thank you. Yes, I had a question. So you said that the key property is the short radiative decay time. Yes. Um, and this is due to the giant oscillator strength. So is the... At, uh, at uh, helium temperature. At helium temperature. Um, but the fact that it occurs in these systems, is this just because the nanocrystals are larger? Yes, correct. This nanocrystal on average larger than Bohr radius of exciton. This is critical condition. So compared to other nanocrystals, uh, these are... Yeah. All other... It is not completely much larger, but it is... Uh, so Bohr radius is between 3 and 4 nanometer, and you have here 14 nanometer, 12 nanometer size. That is why decay time is so short. So is there some fundamental reason why the nanocrystals are larger? Mm, uh, <laughs> I'm not chemist, unfortunately. I cannot answer this question. Uh, this uh, nanocrystal has a cubic shape and their size. And what I can tell you is that if you reduce the size of this nanocrystal, 
they losing their autonomic structure, which I think important also for, for some reason, I don't want to discuss it now, it's a long story, uh, important for optical activity of that material. Okay, time is over, so let's thank our speaker again. <laughs> so we have a second talk, so the uh, presenter shows something here. Uh, well, it will be correlation between crystal and magnetic structure in epitaxial films of exotic iron oxide polymorph presented by Sergei Sutuev. Good afternoon. Uh, so uh, uh, my talk today is the uh, is to continue the uh, the list of presentations related to the uh, epitaxial uh, iron oxide films uh, grown on uh, on gallium nitride surface. Uh, so uh, why these materials are so interesting? Uh, mainly because uh, the uh, when we combine ferroics with uh, semiconductors, uh, we can uh, get some uh, interesting properties and interesting devices, uh, for example, for uh, spin filtering, spin injection, and uh, for these, uh, the, uh, uh, we need uh, some nicely matched uh, uh, ferroic materials and uh, some uh, potentially uh, important uh, semiconductors. So that's why we choose the uh, gallium nitride as a semiconductor. And uh, regarding the iron oxides, uh, there, are, there is a big family actually of different iron oxides uh, with uh, each one has uh, fascinating magnetic properties, though the formula is very simple. Uh, so uh, in principle, as I have uh, uh, talked during the previous presentation one year ago, we uh, have a technology to grow uh, four different, uh, four different iron, uh, iron oxide phases on gallium nitride epitaxially. Uh, however, today I would like to focus on this uh, exotic uh, epsilon uh, iron oxide phase, uh, which has a, a bunch of uh, nice properties. Uh, nice uh, magnetic properties, uh, first of all, because it's a ferromagnetic material with a huge magnetic crystalline anisotropy. And uh, th therefore, the coercive field is uh, up to two Tesla, which is very high value for such a simple formula uh, material. And then, uh, on top of this, it also has a, a ferroelectric behavior and a multiferroic behavior. Then uh, it is a metastable material, so uh, it does not exist in, in bulk form, and uh, all, usually uh, all the studies are related to uh, nanoparticles that are randomly oriented with respect to the, to the matrix. However, in this study, we uh, uh, know how we, I will present how to grow epitaxial layers of this uh, exotic uh, material. Uh, epsilon iron oxide, and we use gallium nitride substrates, as I told before. So the fabrication is actually the pulsed laser deposition or uh, a laser MB technology. Uh, uh, we uh, have uh, th this machine in, in Yoff Institute, in our group, and the, the, te the, deposition, te the deposition technology mainly consists of uh, ablating a target of iron oxide, in this case with the uh, excimer la laser pulses. So we get a flux of material towards the substrate. 
and uh, the growth is uh, uh, performed in an uh, atmosphere of a uh, buffer gas uh, that can be either oxygen, nitrogen, or argon. And certainly the, the temperature of the substrate can be varied up to 1,000 degrees C. The very important part of this uh, setup is that we can measure high energy electron diffraction in situ in spite of having oxygen inside, so we can control precisely uh, what we grow. The, uh, out, the technology is outlined here. So we have the, the target, then uh, the target is evaporated with a, with a laser, then we have the plume contain, uh, consisting of iron and oxide atoms, and uh, we deposit it on the substrate kept at uh, different temperatures from 400 to 800. And now we focus only on these two technological steps, uh, resulting in production of either alpha phase, which is hematite, or epsilon phase, which we are interested in at the moment. And uh, the other two phases that we can pr uh, produce uh, were um, discussed one year ago. So uh, why I focus also on the, uh, on the alpha phase, because it's a parasitic phase for, for this process, because uh, this phase is more energetically favorable than epsilon phase. So we have to struggle to, to suppress it. And uh, uh, in, in, in few words, it can be described like this. If we grow very fast, we, we get uh, something like, uh, which is shown in gray here, that is a, in, a transition layer. And, uh, and on top of this, we get the, the alpha phase, which we, don't, uh, which we are not interested in. If we, are, if we, uh, uh, go, uh, we, if we grow slower, we uh, get a transition layer and an epsilon phase. But uh, the trick is to, go, to grow very slow. And we, if we grow very slow at the beginning, we don't have a transition layer. So we get the, the nice uh, structurally per perfect epsilon phase right at the, at the interface. And the next trick that we have to continue, we have to start sl growing slowly and then we have to continue growing fast. Otherwise we again get uh, this uh, alpha phase. So we end up here, which is a, a, a nicely shaped film with nice crystalline structure and uh, uh, totally uh, consisting of epsilon phase. Uh, so uh, how do we know uh, uh, the, the crystal structure? We, we do the uh, diffraction measurements, but before I, I show the, the images, I would like to, uh, to tell how, uh, you what is the crystal structure of these two materials. Uh, they are actually very different. One is uh, hexagonal, trigonal, the other is orthorhombic. Lattice parameters are also very differ diff different. However, if you consider oxygen and iron atoms inside, then you see that they are very uh, similar actually, because we have uh, oxygen uh, as a, a closely packed lattice, and uh, irons are sandwiched in between. The, uh, the difference between alpha phase and epsilon phase is only the way how the irons sit in the octo uh, octohedral or tetrahedral uh, uh, sites uh, inside the, the oxygen uh, sublattice. And also the gallium nitride has the similar structure. It has uh, the, the alternating layers of ni nitrogens and, uh, and gallium. So this is the side view and uh, this is the top view. If you, uh, you see that the, the each oxygen layer has a triangular uh, structure, a hexagonal structure uh, consisting of triangles and actually all, all the the atom to atom distances are very similar for these materials. That's why uh, when we deposit iron oxide on gallium nitride, we get a nice epitaxial uh, matching and uh, they grow in this way so that uh, these uh, sheets of uh, oxygens are parallel to the planes of nitrogens and gallium nitride. Uh, and uh, we use electron diffraction uh, inside our chamber it is uh, not a simple electron diffraction, but as we call a, a, a tomography a, 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 a approach. So we take uh, hundreds of diffraction images, which are actually the, the evil spheres, and then uh, we compute the three-dimensional intensity distribution in the reciprocal space out of, from these images. Uh, we use the, the, the fast um, uh, speeds of the uh, hundred scores of the uh, graphic processing units that are uh, that you find in, in every computer nowadays. 
So uh, we can compute up to one uh, billion pixels on the fly and to, sh to, sh to compute the three-dimensional uh, distri intensity distributions in reciprocal space, which is uh, very convenient as you will see later. So uh, here is the example of what we get when we grow alpha uh, iron oxide. So this is the three-dimensional distribution here. And uh, then to analyze it, we, we make uh, three ortho ortho orthogonal cross-sections, one of which is the um, projection uh, along the surface normal, which you, the, the, this projection you normally don't see in, uh, in read. Uh, it can be only computed, not seen direct, directly by eye. So uh, we can uh, put, uh, superimpose the, um, the model lattices and uh, to see that, okay, this is really alpha phase and it is uh, oriented in the way that I described before. And for epsilon phase, the, uh, the, this three-dimensional map is much uh, more, uh, contains much more, uh, much greater number of reflections and uh, we have more circles here, certainly, so, but still all these circles correspond uh, nicely to the, to the experimental data. So this is uh, to confirm that we have, uh, we can grow both, and we see it immediately during uh, deposition, not afterwards. Uh, so this is just to compare that uh, the, the epsilon phase on the right, alpha phase on the left, and you see the differences, they are very uh, easily detectable and identifiable. So uh, uh, to, uh, to, make it, to make it stronger, we also measured X-ray diffraction uh, at a synchrotron. And I present here only the uh, theta to theta scans or the uh, reflectivity rods, uh, the specular rods. Uh, so they uh, contain certainly the substrate peaks, but also the, uh, the shown with errors, uh, arrows, the, the peaks of alpha and epsilon phase. And uh, to, to give an example, I produce this uh, very nice uh, pattern with only epsilon uh, phase uh, uh, reflections uh, marked with error arrows. But also sometimes we get, uh, if, if the technology is not perfect, then we get a mixture of epsilon and alpha in the same film. And certainly this is not what we usually uh, study later, just to show that uh, they both coexist, tend to coexist, but we have to suppress the, the, the other phase uh, to, and to get only the pure single phase epsilon iron oxide film. So we, we know how to do it. And uh, uh, now I'll speak a little bit about the uh, transition layer. As you remember, uh, there is a small, uh, a thin, trans a few nanometers uh, transition layer between the gallium nitride and the iron oxide. And in this transi transition layer, uh, there, uh, there is uh, a certain type of uh, disorder the, because uh, the, the, the one film with a larger lattice cell, as shown here, has to fit to the film with lower, uh, smaller lattice, uh, surface lattice cell. And we get, with this read tomography, we get such, such nice, uh, sequence of, uh, of, uh, of top views. So this is how the periodicity is changing when we deposit first uh, angstroms of our iron oxides. So uh, you see it starts with, uh, with just uh, gallium nitride uh, reflections, the, the, the bright spots, spots, and uh, then uh, gradually we have the, they are transformed to the uh, dense net of, uh, of iron oxide. But between these two, uh, between the start and the end, you can see that, there that the reflections get elongated in certain directions, and these elongations uh, can be related to, to, some, to some sort of disorder uh, when uh, the islands are nucleated at different sites, and then uh, when they meet together, they are, the antiphase boundaries uh, can uh, occur. And here is the visualization of these antiphase boundaries. Uh, moreover, uh, if we uh, examine, examine a, a, thick, a thick film with an X-ray diffraction, this is an 80 nanometers film, you, you, we still see that the reflections are very nice. The shape, they are uh, elongated in particular directions. These are directions per perpendicular to the oxygen-oxygen bonds at the surface. And uh, we conclude 
that our film probably uh, uh, consists of columns uh, that are staying vertically in the film and uh, the antiphase boundaries between these columns uh, produce this, uh, these streaks here. And uh, this columnar model is also confirmed by the AFM images uh, that, that you see here. The, the, so it's not a, a, a flat film, it is a little bit uh, corrugated and looks very much uh, similar to the columnar type. St still these columns connect each other and uh, we can speak about uh, a film, not a, not a set of islands. Uh, so uh, something uh, which is interesting to know is that uh, uh, why we have this uh, uh, exotic phase nucleating. And uh, we think that uh, gallium that comes from gallium nitride at, at an elevated temperature during growth can play some, some role in it, uh, producing these, uh, this material, which is uh, gallium iron O3, uh, uh, or otherwise uh, um, this uh, gallium oxide, both are isostructural to epsilon phase iron oxide, and they can uh, help in nucleating the, uh, the, the exotic uh, crystal structure of our film. So uh, we uh, tried to, to detect uh, if we have gallium in the film, but it is not straightforward because we have a lot of gallium nitride underneath and uh, how to distinguish between uh, gallium in the film and gallium in the, in the, in the substrate. Uh, and uh, uh, we used uh, uh, such an approach called resonant X-ray diffraction. So uh, that is actually taking a X-ray diffraction uh, uh, map of, of particular reflections and looking at their dependence on the, on the photon energy. So we, we scanned the photon energy across the gallium K edge at, at this uh, photon energy and we uh, saw if there is any uh, variation of the intensity in different points of the, of the reciprocal space. So first of all, uh, if, we, if we place ourselves in the middle uh, away from the reflections, then certainly uh, we see uh, 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 like an exas uh, spectrum, the, the, the K edge of gallium. So when it is the usual uh, um, exas experiment. But then if we measure uh, in the uh, particular reflection, for example, gallium nitride reflection, we get a, a, a depression in intensity, which resembles, by the way, in the shape, the, this, this line here. So uh, this can be modeled, but this is not our goal because certainly we have gallium in, in gallium nitride. This is not interesting. But what is interesting that if we play, go to the, uh, to the reflection of our uh, iron oxide film, we also see the variation in intensity. And these can be either going up or going down on the, on the K edge. So uh, uh, that means that uh, we probably have gallium in the film because uh, gallium in the substrate cannot uh, produce anything in this, in this break uh, position. That's why if something is produced here, that it is probably comes from the film. So this is the trick we used to prove that we have some gallium in the film. And we also measured some XPS uh, on, this, on a sequence of uh, thicknesses. And to be short, I just say that uh, we do see uh, gallium in thin films at, uh, at, me at intermediate temperatures. At, 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 at 400 C, we don't see any gallium, and at 800, uh, we again see, we see only a little of it, but uh, near the interface. So this is another proof that we probably have a gallium iron oxide near the interface, uh, helping to, to, form, uh, to form the, the iron oxide um, film. And uh, we conducted some uh, polarized neutron reflexometry to confirm that the, uh, there is, again, this transition layer with slightly depressed uh, um, nuclear density here and also depressed magnetic moment, which is not shown here. Again, this is uh, f uh, consistent with the idea of, uh, of the uh, gallium iron oxide near the interface. And to fi to finally, I would like to speak about the magnetization curves. Uh, that are quite uh, of the epsilon iron oxide films that are quite interesting because first of all they are very wide 
the, the, the coercivity is about one Tesla and the situation to about two or three te Tesla and they are also very uh, strangely shaped which is called wasp waist or a uh, pinched shape. Actually, they consist of, of two. If you can decompose uh, into such uh, zero coercivity uh, loop and the usual uh, loop which uh, is uh, recognizable for, the, uh, for, the, uh, for this um, material. And uh, uh, depending on the, on the, on the thickness, uh, we can, uh, we have also uh, the coercivity that, uh, that changes and uh, to analyze it better, we can, uh, there, is, there is a model to subtract this, this soft magnetic component giving the narrow loop and with, uh, after subtraction, you can see the, the thickness uh, series here. So uh, it is also a temperature series because the, the different colors show different temperatures. So we see that as the, the thickness decreases, we get na more narrow loops. And also, uh, the, as the temperature increases, the loops become narrow and, uh, and uh, small in, 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 magnet in magnetization, in, in vertical scale. So this is easily explained if we refer to the, uh, to the columnar model. And uh, uh, as we see, the, the, as the thickness gro grows up, also the, the, the size of the columns grows up. And uh, I think we have uh, to do with su uh, super uh, paramagnetism here that uh, make, makes these loops uh, ch change sh uh, shape. And, uh, uh, finally, uh, uh, we have developed a, a, a model to describe the loops. This is a stoner wolfert model to describe the uh, non-interacting magnetic particles, uh, taking into account the uniaxial magnetic anisotropy and the energy of the, of the dipoles. And uh, uh, this model uh, was used to, to fit uh, the curves here and uh, what we can see here that this part, when the, the responsible for magnetization rotation, is fit very well, but then when the switching part, it still has to be uh, uh, worked with because uh, it is not sharp uh, uh, switching, but uh, 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 smooth switching. So to summarize, uh, we have uh, developed technology to grow the very exotic epsilon oxide phase and uh, uh, we investigate into the, mm, the crystal structure of, this, uh, of these films and uh, their magnetic structures and we find that there are many interesting uh, physical effects inside these films to be uh, also studied in future. I wish to acknowledge people who were uh, participating in this work and I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Maybe one or two. Please, considering uh, possible applications of these structures, uh, what can you see, uh, said, uh, what can you, uh, can you say about <coughs> stability of this oxide in wet atmosphere? Uh, no, because it, uh, <coughs> it is a simple rest. Well, <laughs> it's uh, uh, be better than rust because it doesn't contain uh, hydrogen. And uh, well, these uh, structures, these samples uh, were stable uh, for one year, lying in the atmosphere, yes, without vacuum, no coverage. No coverage. And uh, okay, again, you, you can measure uh, diffraction in, after one year, you see the same uh, crystal structure. So they are quite stable, I believe. So, any more questions? If not, let's thank our speaker. We have the last talk in this session. So, it will be given by Dmitry Filatov, and the title is Ballistic Hole Emission Spectroscopy of Cephalcelmbuk Germanium Silicon Silicon Nano Islands.
Thank you very much for the introduction, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I will present uh, a talk on behalf of a group of collaborators from University of Nizhny Novgorod and the University of Saras. So the subject of the study uh, was the uh, self-assembly and anion of uh, germanium silicon on silicon. Uh, this object uh, was studied extensively in the last two decades, uh, primarily due to potential application in silicon photonics. So uh, it is well known that uh, the heterojunction of uh, germanium with silicon is uh, two type of one. And when the nano are small uh, enough, the whole uh, energy spectrum is affected by the size crystallization effect. There were some uh, papers in literature for theoretical calculation of uh, quantum confirmed energies and envelope uh, wave functions. But uh, it is always a lack of experimental techniques for uh, measurement of this uh, size quantization energies. Uh, one can uh, mention uh, the works uh, by group from Novosibirsk uh, on uh, admittance spectroscopy. Uh, this method allows uh, determining uh, the size crystallization energies directly, but uh, it is uh, limited and not all levels are seen. Uh, several years ago, we applied uh, tunneling atomic force microscopy to study the whole energy spectrum in self-assembled uh, silicon germanium nanoisons. We succeeded to visualize the local spatial distribution of density of states in this nanoion. And uh, here are some uh, tunnel spectra of small enough nanoison. And the uh, peaks uh, in uh, this spectra were attributed to the resonant tunneling through uh, quantum confined states as shown on uh, the main picture on the right panel. But it is difficult to extract uh, the size condensation energy itself because of uh, tip for potential induced band bending. One needs to solve for some equation. Uh, it is uh, not uh, simple and uh, finally it is uh, poorly reliable. Reliable. In the present uh, work, we applied uh, ballistic electron emission microscopy called BEAM uh, to measure directly the size crystallization energies in the uh, germanium isolate on silicon. Please allow me to remind uh, briefly some basics of BEAM technique uh, for those who are not familiar with the method. It is useful for future explanation of our experimental results. It was invented uh, by Kaiser and Bell as a method uh, for measurement of Schottky barrier height. The sample is a semiconductor covered by thin metal film, about 10 nanometers in thickness, and it is switched in the STM setup as a transistor. So STM tip is an emitter, the metal film is a base, uh, grounded and semiconductor is a collector. To measure the uh, Schottky by height, uh, the collector current is measured uh, as a function of uh, the bias applied between the base and the tip. Once uh, the term uh, level in uh, the tip material appears above uh, uh, the potential barrier, the collector current starts to increase. So typical beam uh, spectrum is, uh, uh, has some thresholds. Each threshold corresponds to some energy barrier in the spectrum. Later, this uh, technique was applied to measure the barrier heights in metal oxide semiconductor structures and uh, particularly to measure the quantum confinement energies in quantum dots. It is uh, necessary to stress uh, that uh, 
this experiment needs a special sample design. Uh, for example, here uh, the indium phosphide quantum dots were built in a quaternary alloy barrier, and the latter was in turn built in a P plus and plus uh, gallium arsenide diode. So, as shown on right uh, panel, uh, the quantum confinement levels are manifested in the beam spectra as uh, peaks uh, in the second derivative of the collector current. It is necessary to stress that this method allows uh, first uh, direct measurement of quantum confinement energies, and then this, uh, there is a natural origin. It is uh, the thermal energy in the uh, metal base. So here, uh, the topography and uh, beam image of this quantum dots are shown. So the dots are manifested as a spots of increased uh, collector current. So well, it is about electrons, but in the Germania Silicon Islands, we are interested in the whole spectrum. There is a variant of uh, beam called ballistic hole emission microscopy. When the uh, positive bias is applied to the tip with respect to the base, in this case, the electrons are injected not from tip to the sample, but from the valence band of semiconductors through the metal base into the three states in the tip material that in turn can be uh, uh, described in terms uh, of uh, ballistic hole emission. Uh, similarly, the three shows uh, are observed and uh, combined beam and this, uh, one can obtain uh, the complete uh, energy spectrum both the conduction and valence band. So the goal of uh, the present work was to explore the capabilities of uh, BHS in uh, investigation of the valence band states in uh, silicon germanium uh, dots. The samples uh, were uh, the diodes, uh, the substrates plus uh, p-type, the thin uh, epitaxial layer of, three, three, of 30 nanometers uh, thick was n-type, and uh, the iceberg grown by uh, standard uh, stansky krastanov uh, method were introduced in the cladding uh, layer as shown on the band diagram. Also, the samples with surface sizes were grown to study the morphology by IFM. Here, the experimental scheme is uh, shown. Uh, the diets uh, with the uh, windows in the upper only contact were made, and uh, the same tip was uh, approached uh, to the surface uh, in these windows. And uh, these uh, rings uh, uh, were grounded with a spring points, with a spring. It is uh, necessary to stress that we did not use metal base, the N plus uh, silicon layer will do Played the role of the base, and this allowed us to increase uh, the sensitivity of the method drastically. Uh, here is a photograph of the homemade setup for beam. Uh, the samples were placed on sample holder with built in collector amplifier. So, the results. Left panel shows the IFM image of a sample grown at uh, 500 uh, degrees centigrade. One can see a system of uh, well-known pyramid non islands, uh, which are presumably uh, where the size quantization should take effect. The right panel shows the collected current image uh, taken at positive bias. Uh, one can see some uh, white uh, spots uh, attributed to the uh, 
tunneling of uh, the electrons from the valence bay to silicon through the uh, quantum confined states in the uh, ions and uh, to the metal tip. The left panel shows uh, the BHE uh, spectrum uh, taken on one of this white spot or island. And uh, here we have observed several uh, steps, which is typical for zero dimension states. So uh, as I have already uh, talked about, uh, the peaks in the second derivative corresponds to the steps in the first derivative of the collector current uh, versus uh, biased voltage. And uh, so we are attribute uh, this uh, steps uh, to the, uh, the quantum confined hole uh, level in uh, the small enough uh, pyramid uh, non-islands. Uh, here the panel shows the IFMMH of the sample grown at uh, 600 centigrade. So one can see a typical dome shaped islands. They are pretty large, so one cannot expect the size quantization effect on the whole energy spectrum. Yes, yes. Uh, the right panel uh, shows the uh, BHM image uh, where the uh, light uh, spots uh, corresponds uh, to the uh, dome-shaped islands. Uh, the symbols uh, denote the places where the BHA spectra were measured, so on island and between the islands on the waiting layer. And uh, uh, here one can see two kinds of spectra. First, this uh, represents a set of uh, straight lines. This uh, typical for uh, the bulk semiconductor according to Kaiser Bell model. So the parabolic dependence in uh, original coordinates uh, d corresponds to uh, the straight lines uh, in the uh, first derivative of collector current. Uh, on the spectrum taken between uh, the islands, uh, uh, one can see on two uh, steps. We have attributed uh, to the quantum confined two dimensional subbands of uh, heavy and light uh, holes in the wetting layer, about uh, five uh, uh, monolays of nominal thickness of uh, germanium. So we uh, the measured uh, energies uh, coincides with the uh, once calculated uh, for the quantum well model, uh, taking into account the elastic strain and uh, composition of the islands and the wetting layer. So to conclude, we have demonstrated experimentally that uh, BHS technique is able to image and uh, do spectroscopy of whole uh, states in the self-assembly germanium silicon nonlinals, and obviously it uh, can be applied to other materials of such kind with two uh, type band alignment uh, when appropriate sample design is provided. And uh, also this uh, technique can distinguish clearly between the quantized and non-quantized whole states. Uh, here is the acknowledgments and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. So questions, please. Thirty nanometers. Uh, the thickness of the n-type layer was thirty nanometers. 
but uh, the uh, 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 yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, this uh, data was taken in the, from the work uh, published uh, several years ago. We have applied Raman spectroscopy to measure the composition of different types of non-islands. They were grown in the similar uh, conditions the, with the ones uh, studied in the present work. More questions? So I have a question. Uh, you, you showed the picture by uh, AFM and uh, your technique. Uh, they apparently look different. So, what, yeah, yeah, this one. Yeah, you see the dots over there, the islands, and on the right, I cannot recognize something. Similar. Yes, uh, uh, I agree that the image was uh, pretty poor because of too low values of collector current. We had to measure the just above the noise level, about one picam. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we have obtained some uh, pictures and uh, it seemed to us that we can recognize the island on the background of uh, some. Uh, anyway, the uh, spectra measured on the spots and between the spots were pretty different. That uh, we think this fact uh, confirms our conclusions more or less. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? If not, let's thank the speaker and all the speakers for the session. So the session is over, we have lunch now.
Good afternoon. Uh, my watch shows that it is already time, 15.10. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We will start the afternoon session, which is devoted to the excitons in uh, uh, semiconductor nanostructures. And actually, we have five talks here, and all five talks are about excitons in two-dimensional uh, transitional metal materials. So I think we will learn a lot about this. And the first talk is an invited talk. I'm going to uh, give a word to Thierry Amand, and uh, I'm sure you will learn a lot about these materials in transaction. So 30 minutes. So good afternoon to everybody, and uh, thank you, Mrs. Chairman. Uh, first, I would like to <laughs> acknowledge uh, for this kind invitation to uh, to this conference, very interesting conference and uh, wonderful city of St. Petersburg and wonderful people um, and which gives me the opportunity to speak about uh, exciton in the transition metal uh, decal cogenerates and uh, we will uh, focus in particular to uh, valley coherence but not only Okay, so I would mention this is a collaborative uh, work between different uh, laboratories. First, uh, most of the experiments were performed in our lab. Uh, we had a strong theoretical support uh, by uh, the theoretical team of uh, Yofe, and uh, samples, some samples were provided uh, by Tempe University and NIMS uh, Tsukuba uh, in, in Japan. Well, so uh, transition metal decal cogenerate, uh, initially, a long time ago, they were used uh, as uh, in lubricant for engines, so it was uh, rather uh, trivial but uh, useful. And uh, uh, more useful also, it is as a catalyst in chemistry. Uh, now, here uh, from uh, Novoselov uh, and James' work on 2D uh, crystal, a very strong activity started. Uh, to uh, analyze the physical property uh, of this uh, material. And this material, they consist, so you see, they, are, they, they consist in one metal, which may be uh, essentially for us uh, molybdenum and uh, tungsten. There are other, but we, we take this because they, they, they are semiconductor. And uh, a, a column cis element, uh, calcogen, which is sulfur, selenium, or tellurium. Uh, the bulk uh, form is uh, lamellar solid uh, with a honeycomb uh, structure. So you have here, uh, uh, this is a lamellar solid with a plane connected by a Van der Waals uh, interaction. And this is the distance, typical distance between layers for MOS2 uh, B layers. So the, the, crystal, the crystal looks like that for a B uh, layer. Um, then, uh, it is possible to slice down this material to one monolayer, and we, we get uh, the, the 2D crystal we will uh, study. We will see the reason why. So it's still uh, trigonal with D sub 3H uh, symmetry. And interestingly, there is a broken inversion uh, symmetry in the case of the monolayer, and this gives rise to a very uh, efficient chi 2 nonlinear susceptibility. Uh, and uh, the problem of nonlinearities in these materials uh, will be described by Leonid Golub in uh, next talk. Well, um, so uh, why one monolayer is interesting? It is because uh, you see when you go from bulk to uh, two layers, uh, you have something, uh, a material which is uh, indirect, the gap is indirect. But when you slice to one single monolayer, it becomes direct. And uh, the direct gap occurs in 
the, the zone edge in k and k prime points, there are two non-equivalent valleys in these materials uh, on the edge of the Brillouin uh, zone. So uh, the monolayers are very strongly uh, coupled uh, to, to light, and you have seen uh, yet, uh, already this picture, uh, which was obtained at Columbia uh, in Heinz team. Uh, this is the exciton line corresponding to this transition, and you see between two monolayers and one monolayer the strong difference. Uh, as for the spectral range of this material, you see, depending the choice you do of the metal and the calcogen, it ranges from orange to uh, near infrared. So you can cover very large, uh, very broad uh, range of spectral uh, domain. Well, and this is a, another example uh, of absorption curves uh, for different uh, selected uh, materials. Uh, you see uh, basically uh, the A and B uh, transition, which corresponds to exciton uh, between uh, two, uh, the two top uh, valence bond, uh, which are split by a very strong uh, spin orbit interaction. Typically, it ranges between 200 and uh, 400 uh, milliEV. Um, well, so you see this, this A and B peak, which are very uh, important. So it was obtained by these uh, authors. Um, and the spectrum is uh, strongly dominated by uh, excitonic uh, transition, in fact, uh, as we see here. And um, very we, we have a very strong coupling to light, much, more, uh, much stronger than in gallium arsenide or cadmium uh, telluride quantum uh, waves, which are uh, nanostructures uh, to which we can compare uh, these uh, 2D uh, crystals. And as a fact, uh, uh, there was a strong coupling was uh, achieved uh, in a micro cavity uh, between two uh, Bragg mirrors. You put uh, one monolayer. And you see that uh, there is a, a record uh, va vacuum Rabi uh, splitting of nearly 50 milli electron volts, which occurs, uh, which makes possible to study polariton, exciton polariton at room temperature. So uh, it opens the field, of course, for uh, all the bosonic process and even maybe uh, Bose condensation uh, study in. Uh, rather easy manner. The problem is to get the sample, which is more difficult than former structure. Another very interesting uh, point in uh, this uh, monolayer uh, crystal is that due to lack inversion of crystal symmetry and strong spin orbit interaction, so we have uh, two, these two inequivalent valleys with uh, a strong correlation between the spin and the valley state. So the K valley uh, uh, we have spin up uh, for the valence uh, electron and the minus k valley, we have a spin down and the two valley uh, corresponds with time uh, reversal. So this is uh, the, the optical transition and we see that uh, the valley degree of free dome, that is k plus or k minus, can be addressed by circularly polarized light provided you have the correct frequency in the, your light. And this leads to this chiral interbound selection rule. We, we guess, uh, so the, here we see also the, 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 the spin orbit uh, splitting in the conduction band, uh, which is not small, it's a few tenths of milliEV. And uh, recently it was measured that uh, spin decay time for conduction state is about 70 nanoseconds at low temperature, and for the whole it can be two microseconds, so we have a very robust uh, spin state uh, which can last long time and this will lead to uh, many possible applications in, in spin or valetronics. So I do not want to enter too much into details, but a lot of uh, potential application, application arise, for instance in nanoelectronics a single layer transistor in nano optoelectronics with phototransistor, uh, electrically tunable uh, excitonic LED uh, were also uh, demonstrated. Um, then, uh, due to this very robust uh, spin valley uh, 
uh, correlation, uh, some uh, valley hole measurement was predicted and even measured after uh, optical valley initialization by Mac and co-workers, and even we achieved some uh, multi-layer lateral spin valve uh, device uh, in collaboration with Jean Lamour uh, Institute in Nancy, uh, and we using a B layer, uh, in fact, uh, of this material. So now uh, I will uh, concentrate on excitant states in this material. The problem of trion, uh, that is a charge excitant, is also possible, but it will be explained in a further talk in the same uh, session, and we shall see. So. Uh, the main uh, optical uh, properties. So this is a quick summary. Uh, so you, we have the exciton, a bound electron and hole. When you remove a, a valence electron in some uh, valence bands and you put uh, in the same uh, valley, uh, Coulomb attraction allow to, to build some uh, intravalley exciton. Uh, here, so uh, this is a classical expression for uh, in envelope function approximation for the excitonic uh, wave function. This is uh, uh, envelope uh, function with a relative motion described by uh, principal quantum number n and some angular uh, quantum number. And this is uh, very importantly the product of the block uh, function in high symmetry point where uh, uh, which constitute uh, the, the exciton. Well, so classically, we, we have a 2D uh, series which should work, and the theory was established a very long time ago uh, when studying lamellar uh, systems, and it should go uh, like this uh, well-known uh, law. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it doesn't work at all. So, uh, first, uh, there is a problem of the excitant binding energy, and in fact, uh, the transition in this material are so um, dominated by uh, excitonic transitions that it's very difficult to see the band gap. And so uh, the, only, the, the best method we know uh, to determine the excitant binding energy is to uh, make some uh, scanning tunneling uh, spectroscopy on the system. So it, it was done uh, in this team at Berkeley. And uh, so you can uh, estimate a gap. Uh, here it, is, it was performed on bilayer uh, graphene, and you can compare this gap to uh, the photoluminescence line you get for exciton. And so, subtracting the two, you get some order of magnitude of your uh, binding energy. Uh, more, uh, another model is obtained from linear reflectance by uh, Chernikov in Heinz team. And uh, you could see the excitonic series. It doesn't follow uh, the hydrogenic uh, law. But uh, now it's well accepted that we have to take into account the, the cladding layer, that is either vacuum or some dielectric. And this leads to uh, non-local screening model, uh, formally described by uh, Leon Keldish, uh, on a thin layer. And it seems this, this model is rather largely accepted now, and it seems it works rather well to, to describe the position of the excited state of exciton and ground states. And then, from this, it's possible to derive uh, a binding energy, which in this case will be 0.3. The important point is that uh, you see the exciton binding energy is huge. It's a, a significant fraction of the band gap. And, um, well, uh, I, I forgot to mention one, one point here. Uh, uh, the, the binding energy is so strong that uh, finally it, it is um, one, one may question if it is reasonable to use uh, Vanier uh, description for exciton. And there was some uh, previous calculation uh, by uh, DFT uh, calculation plus Beth Salpeter uh, in uh, Berkeley who show, for instance, the extension of the exciton uh, wave function. And we see that it covers, in fact, many uh, lattice parameters. So probably the Vanier uh, description remains correct, although uh, we have a very strong binding energy. Well, now I would like to uh, speak, to say a few words about uh, spin orbit interaction and Coulomb exchange. So we have seen 
uh, these strong uh, valence spin orbits, there is a small, uh, smaller spin orbit interaction in the conduction band, and this leads to quite different uh, temperature uh, behavior of our excitants. So we see two class of materials, the molybdenite and the tungstenite. The molybdenite, the uh, uh, intensity, the total intensity of photoluminescence decrease when you increase temperature, why it is the reverse for tungstenite. So this was also uh, obtained uh, later here. And uh, why is it so? It is because uh, for uh, molybdenite, it turns that we have uh, the, 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 the dark transition, the, we have dark excitant which corresponds to the spin forbidden uh, transition and this dark, dark excitant, uh, they will be populated when you increase the temperature. Uh, on the uh, opposite, uh, for tungstenite, uh, dark excitant uh, will be populated uh, naturally by thermalization of uh, excitation and when you heat, uh, they will be activated to the uh, uh, bright uh, pairs, and then uh, luminescence increase. So this is uh, this was confirmed by uh, calculation. Uh, I, maybe I have not to, to detail too much, but you can look more details here. It was uh, the, we recover this uh, uh, in our lab by uh, doing DFT calculation and. Uh, uh, putting on top uh, Betzalpeter uh, equation. Well, so we, we, we come to the point of valley coherence. So we see that uh, for our uh, exciton, uh, we have uh, two types of exciton. Either you take valence and conduction state to build your exciton in a K plus valley, and this will be, uh, sorry, it will be accessible with sigma plus light, uh, or you may uh, pump with the sigma minus and you go to the K minus uh, valley. So you can, uh, see you have a two state here and you can assign the effective spin to these two uh, state uh, uh, set of uh, excitant state and you can say on a block uh, sphere for pseudo spin uh, that this uh, excitant correspond to the North Pole and the other one corresponds uh, to the uh, South Pole. Well, so let's try now to see how survive uh, uh, linear excitants, that is coherent superposition of sigma plus and sigma minus uh, excitant. So we excite, uh, for instance, with helium neon. Uh, here you see the, we have uh, about 30% of linear polarization, so it shows that uh, coherence are rather robust uh, in this material, uh, despite relaxation, and we see that uh, exciton dipole will be aligned along the laser polarization. Ah, sorry, excuse me. Uh, well, so we start, we start like that, okay? So we have a coherent superposition of uh, sigma plus and sigma minus, so it gives some excitons effective spin along x direction for pseudo spin, and this is the polar diagram we obtain in such a case. So we have the linear polarization. When you rotate the laser, you see that the polar diagram follow exactly the laser. Voila. And, and so uh, you see that exciton dipole is strictly aligned with the laser. Now um, we can play some, something else. Uh, we can try to, to, to split the two uh, valley states uh, why once prepared in the X state, and uh, this splitting can be obtained in different ways. Uh, you can obtain this dynamically using optical Stark effect, and this was done in these labs. So in optical Stark effect, you, you, you light a strong pulse uh, uh, slightly below the excitant transition, and uh, if you use, for instance, sigma minus polarization, it will push, push the, the K minus state upwards and you create some transient splitting. So in that case, you will have some uh, rotation around an effective magnetic field uh, which uh, represent uh, the light interaction. Uh, another method we use, it is uh, to uh, more simply put some external perpendicular magnetic field and use Zeeman splitting 
between the two uh, valley states of exciton. And if you start with the X exciton, and if there is no perturbation, then you will have some, uh, the coherence superposition will evolve uh, classically uh, this way with um, some dephasing, so you have some rotation of the exciton dipole. And uh, well, so this is what we have done. Uh, and so you see here the Zeeman splitting between the two excitonic lines. And uh, it is possible to predict that uh, since the lifetime of exciton is shorter than the precession time in this experiment, if you solve a stationary uh, spin block equation in steady state, you will get this equation with uh, some dephasing time which result from the uh, effective spin decay density and also a pure spin dephasing time. Uh, and there is a very simple uh, law which can be extracted from uh, the ratio between Sx and Xy, uh, which gives you simply the angle of precession of the effective spin. And uh, so uh, we do the experiment. So this is the initial point, zero magnetic field. You put some magnetic field upwards. You see the rotation of your emission dipole with magnetic field. If you reverse the magnetic field, you, you have the reverse orientation. Of course, this experiment, it looks simple. It's not so simple because you have to correct from the activity of the lens, focusing of the sample. So after this uh, picture are done after this kind of correction. And uh, applying uh, this simple uh, law, we uh, can extract some dephasing time, which is approximately one third of a, a picosecond, which is very fast, in fact. So in fact, the situation is uh, rather uh, puzzling. So this is, again, the law for different value of the magnetic field, uh, giving the angle of rotation of the spin with respect to um, the magnetic field, which enters in omega. And this is another representation where we, use, we, 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 we do not rotate the uh, basis of, uh, for detection of polarization. And in that case, uh, we have something which resembles the, the Handle uh, effect. And, and, and we see uh, the, the model fits the experiment uh, quite well. Uh, well, so if we postulate uh, some uh, decay time for exciton of two picosegons, that was we have measured in independent measurement, this leads to uh, a pure dephasing time for spin of 0.45 uh, picosecond, which is consistent with forward mixing experiment uh, obtained in Austin uh, in uh, Moody, uh, Gallon Moody uh, team. Voilà. Um, the, the critical parameter is, of course, um, uh, to, to in this TS2, uh, the long range exchange. Uh, uh, which couples the plus one and minus one exciton when the exciton uh, have some uh, motion. And this leads to longitudinal transverse splitting. And uh, there is a kinetic model for 2D system, which was uh, formerly derived for quantum waves, uh, which is known and which, which is this expression for the intrinsic uh, uh, spin dephasing time. This expression being valid provided the magnetic field is not too strong, which is our case. Well, to finish, I add uh, some, uh, another uh, small topic um, and other coherence which could be manipulated with magnetic field. It is uh, the problem of dark state coherence. Um, from uh, DFT calculation plus Bet Salpeter, it was seen uh, looking at the imaginary part of the polarization of a 2D layer that for A exciton, uh, there is a possibility of coupling to uh, Z polarized mode for, of light, that is, uh, light uh, in TM uh, mode, transverse magnetic. And uh, this is true for A and not for B. And what uh, we have done to have to inc increase accuracy. We have encapsulated the sample in uh, boron nitride. You see the, the lines becomes very narrow. We are now close to the radiative limit. 
And so we can uh, work, so this is the reflectivity spectrum, uh, we can work with uh, very clear uh, samples. And what is seen? If you detect here, you have the bright exciton line, which is here for WSC2, and uh, the position doesn't change whatever is the polarization, is either circular or linear, it is the same. But if you detect on the side, uh, then you see that if you put analyzer along the Z direction, a new line uh, rise, and in fact, we shall see this corresponds to dark mode of exciton. And uh, well, so it is uh, the polar diagram here, we obtain in the XZ plane, so it's really linear polarization. Uh, for the upper screen, uh, we have spin conserving tr uh, transition, but for lower screen, we have apparently spin non conserving transition. So it is puzzling. What is the solution? Uh, but before I show you, this is a general for a tungstenid. We, we see also a dark mode for WS2. For molybdenum selenide 2, uh, uh, it is not seen, but it is normal because we have seen that dark states are above the bright states. So due to relaxation, there is no population. So we could only see that uh, in absorption. Well, so the solution was obtained uh, here. Um, in fact, if you look at a, a given valley, it occurs that there is some spin orbit mixing between uh, different uh, groups of valley. Here, the, the first two valleys, uh, they, they, they are valleys which are uh, even with respect to uh, mirror symmetry uh, in the layer. And here, this group of valleys, uh, the orbital part is odd, but the spin is reversed. And finally, it can be shown that uh, two of these valleys can mix together due to spin orbit interaction. And then this state is not a pure spin state, and in, case, in that case, it is possible to have uh, some uh, spin conserving transition, but which is weaker. So I am out of time, so I, I will skip a little bit this. And uh, just I want to say that if we put some vertical magnetic field, and a new line appears. So this is our uh, former line, Z mode, but a new line appears below. And this new line, in fact, uh, turns to be a different combination of pair of block states, a pair of valley states. Uh, the Z mode corresponds to symmetric combination, and the, the absolutely dark mode corresponds to uh, anti-symmetric combination. And in fact, the, with magnetic field, you couple the two, and so you see some brightening of the dark, uh, the absolutely dark mode. And this uh, is uh, with a very nice fitting to uh, determination of uh, this uh, fine structure splitting, which is half milieve typically, and the G factor of the dark exciton, which is about nine. Okay, so uh, this leads to the conclusion that finally uh, we could uh, determine uh, the intravalley, uh, totally the intravalley exciton uh, fine structure. Uh, this splitting. Uh, so the shift of bright uh, due to uh, short range exchange, in fact, it is uh, computed. We, we have not for the moment uh, exact uh, determination and this was measured. And we predict the reverse order for uh, molybdenide uh, material. So this is the conclusion, I am out of time. And uh, I would like to thank my colleagues, especially the experiment which were done by Gang Wang, Fabian Cadiz, Cédric Robert, and many of the uh, theoretical interpretation by Michel Glasov, Jena Ishenko, and uh, later Leonid Golub for nonlinear systems, and uh, Watanabe for uh, nitro boron nitride. I just want to take a small minute because it is the 25th uh, conference for nanostructure, and, but for me and my team, it is the 35th year of collaboration with Yofe, and so you see all the subjects we, we, which have uh, been uh, studied during this collaboration, and so I would like to thank all these uh, wonderful researchers with which we could uh, discuss. So thank you very much for your attention, 
And uh, please, if you have questions, I can try to answer. Questions, please. Um, technically, you can have this valley rules without spin at all. That will still be circular polarized transitions to different valleys. You do not need a valley spin coupling. But from your magnetic field experiments, it's evident that spin is involved. Uh, are there any TMDCs where the spin uh, transition rule works against uh, the valley one. Because we, we heard a talk from Kibis. Uh, so uh, can you, uh, imagine that you have a kind of graphene with different energy on two sides. You will have a gap, but you uh, okay. uh, don't have any spin involved in optical transitions. And the valley rule will be exactly the same. Two valleys will be uh, populated by differently, um, different circular polarized light. You don't need to involve spin in this selection rule. I'm asking if there are dehalcagenides where spin selection rule, which is because of the uh, different orbitals in atoms, and uh, pure valley rule are opposite to each other rather than help each other. We, we, we have not met that, but... Uh, we because okay. there is no bisymmetry, it could work in uh, the favor, but it could work against. Because well, spin rules is because you have transitions between uh, different orbitals in yes, an atom. Yes, yes. yes, one has P and another is S or D or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, in graphene, for example, you only have P orbitals, but still optical transitions are allowed. Yes, so you don't need to have different uh, orbitals. Between, uh, so yeah, the question is, yeah. is it possible to have spin uh, selection spin. rule work against the valley selection rule or not? Maybe your co-authors will uh, tell later, but... Well, I've, for the moment, I cannot answer that, yeah, but... <laughs> okay. We can discuss it, yes. If I am allowed, uh, have I understood correctly that in some cases you have dark exciton below bright exciton and some yes. cases up? And what is the physical reason why sometimes it's dark exciton comes above bright exciton? Yes, the, 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 the main physical reason, it is due to, um, uh, to spin orbit interaction. Uh -huh. So, um, basically, uh, you see that uh, for uh, molybdenid, uh, spin orbit interaction is thus that uh, the, the bright transition, in fact, is the lowest one. Mm -hmm. it, it is because of the splitting of the conduction uh, bound by spin orbit interaction. So this uh, splitting, in fact, results from antagonists, uh, from different uh, couplings to, 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 to bands, which are uh, much far. And, and so, depending the the precise situation, you may be like that or like that, uh, it depends. Okay. So, uh, and we, we have a general rule between uh, molybdenide and tungstenide. Okay. So this is uh, the main reason. So okay. this is uh, quite original with respect to uh, the classical uh, cubic quantum yes. wells where we have no spin yes. orbit, for instance. Uh, well. Okay, thank you very much. Let us thank the speaker and we move to, to the next talk which will be uh, given by Leonid Golub from Yofu Institute. So it's 20 minutes. Thank you.
for the introduction. And I continue the subject of, of transition metal dehalcogenides uh, in this session, and especially uh, will be concentrated on exciton properties of uh, those materials, and uh, more precisely, to nonlinear properties, which are also uh, seen in TMD monolayers. This uh, work is a result of collaboration between uh, our theoretical team in the Yoff Institute. We, I worked together with Mikhail Glazov and uh, experimental group in Toulouse, uh, which was presented by Thierry in the previous talk. This is uh, the outline of my talk. First, I touch, uh, I speak briefly about band structure of uh, transition metal dehalcogenide monolayers, which has already been a bit discussed in the previous talk. Then I switch to nonlinear optics of excitons in TMD monolayers. Uh, then we discuss uh, some uh, properties which are caused by low symmetry of those uh, systems, leading to mixing of exciton states. And then I uh, present you some uh, some uh, less known uh, nonlinear effect called up conversion. Well, uh, I would like to to give you a message that uh, 2D uh, 2D materials like TMD monolayers is a good platform for nonlinear physics. Uh, in molybdenum sulfide disulfide, it's seen a very strong second harmonic generation signal. And here you can see uh, that in different places, marked by different color, we have strong second harmonics. And uh, third harmonics is also present here, uh, which, is, uh, has a, which can visualize this one layer flakes. And also two photon absorption is present in such uh, systems. And this is the band structure of many of uh, TMD monolayers. It, is, it has this uh, lattice which, which, which is different from the well-known graphene lattice by two things, that uh, the two sub-lattices have different atoms, therefore there are no inversion center. And another thing that uh, one sub-lattice is a little bit above another one, Therefore, the symmetry of this, uh, of this system is D3H, which will be important. And we deal with two valleys in the K points of the brilliant zone. And they are important, uh, the important property is that in, in circularly repolarized light, we, uh, we uh, deal with only, with only one valley. And uh, the uh, band structure, real band structure calculated in different method, by different methods is shown here. It is taken from some theoretical paper, which is actually also a collaboration of our group and uh, Toulouse theoretician and Moscow. And uh, what is important that uh, we and enough, uh, the minimal model which will be enough for us, is that we have conduction and variance band uh, and uh, one uh, higher conduction band, which is due to some reasons, is called C plus second, and another valence band, which is marked V minus three. And the symmetry is shown in this nice picture. And for me, and I will refer it to as a S type uh, block state, block uh, states with zero momentum and with plus or minus one, which uh, corresponds to X minus or X plus Y uh, block amplitudes. Uh, and why it is important? It's important to, uh, because, uh, before, because I will study exciton physics, and excitons are very pronounced in TMD monolayers, because if the energy gap is similar to all normal semiconductors, but binding energy is, is a half of electron volt, which is just four times smaller than the energy gap, which is unusual and therefore the, 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 the oscillator, stre oscillator strength is strong enough and Bohr radius is five angstroms and theory discussed in the previous talks that it, it is even 
one can ask, so is it comparable with the lattice constant or still strong, bigger? It's fortunately still bigger. Okay, and we, uh, and I can refer to experiments where those excitons are clearly seen. And uh, by the way, there is deviation from two, strictly two-dimensional hydrogen series, and it occurs due, due to deviation of the interaction potential from the Coulomb low. It is uh, more better explained by logarithmic like a potential which was established by Leonid Keldesh and even earlier by Ritova in their theoretical papers. Uh, and also specific symmetry of TMD monolayers will be important. And in this minimal mo uh, four band model, we have this uh, Hamiltonian four by four uh, in the, in the K, K plus valley it has this form in K minus we have, we should change uh, the k uh, to minus k and uh, make some changes. And the, uh, the, those momentum matrix elements are called here gammas of different, uh, with different numbers. And what is important for me that exciton wave function, which is a product of smooth envelope and block amplitude, uh, uh, and the, the block envelope is a product in simple, the simplest model, it's a product of uh, two Bloch functions of in the conduction and in the, the valence band. Uh, it's marked by the number which is which is symmetry uh, by it's it can be plus or minus one. But if we take into account uh, the real D3H uh, symmetry of the system, which is important for the nonlinear nonlinear physics, then we have k dot p mixing of some block functions to some others, and uh, therefore the, block the, the wave function of exciton became more complicated with, uh, with uh, a mixture of states of, of another symmetry. For example, S state has a mixture of P state in another band. And we should k dot make this k dot P mixing for both electron and whole uh, block states. And this uh, real, taking into account this real symmetry, D3H symmetry of, this, of the system uh, leads us to the violation of selection rules. If we take the valley where sigma plus uh, light excites the exciton at zero K, uh, we, we see that the dipole matrix, matrix element is more strongest the most strongest in the sigma plus polarization, but it also has k linear term in, the, in another polarization. And this uh, parameter A is a co proper combination of uh, products of green and uh, red marked momentum matrix elements, which is forbidden in, in centrosymmetrical system, but is non-zero due to D3H symmetry of our system. And here there are energy denominators. Uh, this is for band-to-band -band absorption and for account, accounting for Coulomb interaction, we have here the Zomerfeld factors for S exciton and for P exciton uh, in sigma plus and sigma minus polarization. So in this valley, which is active in sigma plus, sigma minus is also uh, absorbed. And this uh, leads to, to transitions in both polarizations. And it's important for nonlinear optics where, for example, for the second harmonics generation in this, um, in this two band uh, schema, I can say that uh, two second harmonics can be easily absorbed by in, on P. Uh, two, two, photon, two photon activity is on P excitons or in it, it requires uh, some intraband process, but uh, such excitons are inactive in, in direct recombination. But taking into account the above discussed uh, low symmetry of our system, we see that two f that one S exciton, uh, that S excitons are became active in two photon processes, and P excitons active in one photon processes, vice versa, and this all leads to two photon photoluminescence and second harmonic generation uh, shown in, uh, seen in experiment. And this is idea that we can describe second, uh, second order nonlinearity 
But to quantify the effect, we uh, performed the group analysis, the second optical harmonics polarization, which is proportional to two powers of electric field. In this D3H group is described by just one linearly independent component, He2. And uh, if I take into account in the matrix elements, uh, not only uh, sigma plus, but also sigma minus uh, polarization with this small parameter, then I get this chi2 for 1s and for, 2, and for 2p, for example, exciton states. And the, the, why we did this analysis? Because it allowed us to, to, to make a prediction, that, uh, to make an estimate that uh, both at 1s and 2p one can get second harmonics, but at 1s it is parametrically stronger than at 2 P exciton, and this is indeed seen in the, in the experiment in performance in Toulouse where 1s is shown here and 2s is even multiplied by some factor, but it's also present. Well, as, uh, as 1s and 2p or 2s and 2p exciton states are both active in two photon absorption, it means that they are somehow equivalent and, to, and we uh, studied this idea, this is a pure theoretical transparency, where I show that S and P excitons are mixed uh, in this D3H symmetry in TMD monolayers. And it's because if I take uh, the um, S shell exciton, it is dipole-like because it has a symmetric envelope and plus or minus one uh, pr projection of momentum for block state. And if I take P shell, we have momentum one here and momentum one here, and therefore it's quadruple-like. But in this low symmetry, those combinations are absolutely equivalent to, uh, to the dipole, to the dipole, and they are uh, transformed according to the same representation. And therefore, mixing of S and P shell is expected f just from this symmetry consideration. So the situation, the exciton fine structure looks something like, somehow like this. We have in pure hydrogenic model, we have uh, degenerate to S, to P, it is independent on the angular momentum. But uh, due to non-Coulomb interaction, we have splitting. And 2P is also splitted and one uh, doublet is equivalent to, in, to the doublet here because they are belong to the same representation E prime. Therefore, we have this beta, this mixing, and this mixing in the Hamiltonian. And this mixing is uh, between any S and any P exciton state, but if the two S and two P are very close to each other, therefore this mixing is the most pronounced here. And this mixing can be uh, produced, I can say produced by Coulomb interaction Microscopic, uh, so this beta is non-zero from symmetry, but microscopically it can came from Coulomb interaction in these systems, uh, exchange Coulomb interaction between the electron and hole. If I take its long range part, which is V is the Coulomb, my, uh, Coulomb Fourier uh, image, I have also the um, overlap of envelopes, and if I calculate it with the count for this uh, trigonal symmetry of my system that I get a long-range exchange contribution to this mixing constant beta, which is like this, and this gives me an estimate of which is shown here. I have also a contribution from short-range part of Coulomb interaction. It's local, and this operator V has some matrix elements which reflects symmetry, D3H symmetry of the system. For example, it mixes S and P states which are k dot p, uh, by k dot p interaction mixed with uh, p and s. So short range Coulomb interaction also gives me some, uh, some contribution to the mixing constant, which is a product, here I have a product of this momentum matrix elements gamma and those short range Coulomb matrix elements and they are multiplied by uh, Zomerfeld factors for s and p states. Estimate gives me that the same estimate for short range and long range uh, as for a long range uh, contribution to the mixing constant beta and these values are in agreement with calculations of, with other theoretical papers. 
Okay, this mixing also gives rise to second harmonic generation, and uh, this mixing gives a comp contribution which are parametrically different from the previous one, but uh, more or less of the same order. Okay, in the last uh, two minutes, I touched such, um, such a phenomenon as exciton up conversion. What's this? Uh, in the experiment, the excit excitation uh, here leads to the emission from uh, higher, from higher um, energies, exciton emission from higher energies, and those, li uh, those lines are uh, scaled squ as intensity squared as intensity of these peaks in second power. So it uh, gives, gives an idea which has been put forward by my colleagues in their uh, Nature communications of this year that it's caused by exciton-exciton collisions which uh, resulted in uh, which resulted in the formation of uh, exciton in, in a higher band. So let's consider two excitons which, uh, which interact and then which interact, for example, their electrons interact via Coulomb, and then at the end we have electron here and a hole here. It's like a Auger process. It's exciton Auger process. But what is important that here it has a resonant character because the difference between bed gaps is more or less equal to the binding energy. So we had this exciton and this exciton, and at the end, we have this and this. Well, uh, theory of exciton Azure process is we consider it direct, this uh, direct process, and we also con uh, consider it its exchange counterpart, and uh, direct leads to formation in the final state of 1S only state, uh, exchange of any, uh, of exciton at any n, uh, and uh, our theory predicts that exchange interaction process, the second one, is more effective. Therefore, we uh, concentrated on it. We calculated the dependence on the number of the final states. It scales with n, some power, and we know how it ho happens. We also um, uh, plotted the dependence of this Auger process on the screening radius, and the Auger rate can be always written in this form where this is number of excitons and this is Auger recombination time or one over tau is rate which is also linear in the number of excitons we have this uh, estimate for it uh, its temperature dependence has a maximum where delta is the mismatch between the uh, energy gap and okay it's deviation from the resonant condition and finally, I would like to say that this estimate uh, 25 picoseconds is in good agreement with experimental findings. Okay, this is the final uh, transparency of my talk. We did two photon uh, absorption and second harmonic generation analysis. We showed that excitons are mixed, SNP states are mixed here, and we studied up conversion of excitons in team demon layers. Thanks. Thanks Thank you very much. We have two minutes for questions. No more. Questions, please. Yeah. Yes, yeah. May I ask you to display the second, uh, I guess, the second uh, slide very second. Very, uh -huh. from the very, very beginning? beginning. No, 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 the second. This one. So the first, no. This one. No. You see where you uh, present the <coughs> estimation of uh, exciton radius and so on. Ah, okay. Yes. So you see uh, uh, that the exciton radius is uh, kind of, uh, of not of order, uh, comparable with, uh, with lattice parameter. Yeah, yeah. So it <coughs> looks rather Frenkel exciton, not Vanier Mott exciton, but you consider it uh, in yeah. terms of, uh, yeah. of Vanier Mott exciton. By the way, for uh, Frenkel mm -hmm. exciton, there should be uh, so called uh, 
longitudinal uh, transfers uh, um, yeah, uh, splitting. Yeah, for moving. So, but uh, for moving yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, it depends on uh, it depends on orientation of uh, yeah. uh, of the uh, dipole moment. But I, I don't uh, yeah. I don't see uh, something like this here. Okay. First, uh, uh, I was brief enough because Thierry to, uh, have shown in his talk that we asked ourselves, so small radius is small enough, but he showed in his, uh, in his talk the size of exciton wave function calculated. Uh, and it, it was clear that there are uh, around 10 atoms under, under the exciton wave function. Therefore, okay, in other, in other words, I have uh, 500 MeV binding energy and two electron volt uh, energy gap. So it's close, but it's still smaller. Then about uh, longitudinal uh, transfer splitting, we, we, we took into account this long range interaction, which is K linear. So it's, we, took, we deal with this, what you want. Yeah. I agree, but I, don't I agree okay. that it's okay. not, so, uh, not so correct to calculate the exciton uh, even from Kelvin's potential, but it was just an estimate. And the estimate shows that it's smaller. I'm sorry, may, may, maybe you continue this interesting discussion later because we have uh, a little bit more questions. So, sorry. I, I... I have a double question. When, when you make the two photon spectroscopy, the pointing vector uh, is orthogonal to the plane of the material, I guess. Sure, yeah. So, imagine that you do the same experiment, but the pointing vector is now in the, in, in the plane of the layer. So you have two options for the polarization of the photon. Do you have selection rule for the 2p state in that case? Uh, we have not analyzed this. I, I think we have always difference between S and P polarization in any system. So it will be Maybe. We did not analyze it correctly. Exactly. <clears throat> Can you show for a second this slide with K plus, with your dipole, uh, the, with the formula with K, no, next, next. Yeah, so back, yeah. So you are saying that due to the second term, you relax the valley rule. No, I'm not saying it's No, no, it's, it's evident. Written, it's written 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 evident. Here, I yeah. do not argue against that. Uh, so, can you, technically, when you go far enough, you should completely remove uh, the valley rule, apart from if the things are related to spin. Is there I, any experiment which would uh, clearly separate spin I, and valley effect again? I'm quite sure that in exciton we always have small No, case. no, for exciton but, you only have small you, case. But if you go from the K point of the brilliant zone to the, I don't know, to the gamma point, you will for sure have, uh, another, have another selection rule. Sure. Okay, let us send the speaker now and move to the next talk, uh, which will be given by Mark. talk about uh, trines in uh, traditional metal dehydrogenides and here is the outline of my talk. I will start with short introduction then I will 
of overview the experimental results and in the end of the talk I will show you our theoretical results and comparison of the calculation with the experiment. I will talk about tungsten selenide, the material based on tungsten and the bulk although bulk material is indirect gap semiconductor, the mono, its monolayers are uh, direct band semiconductor and uh, uh, and uh, to, 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 to be able to change the uh, density of the charge carriers, resident charge carriers in this monolayer, it, it was integrated in a charge tunable structure. Here is the experimental results. Here shown the differential reflectivity spectrum of this monolayer. And uh, if you, with the change of the gate voltage, one can move from the N-type semiconductor to the P-type semiconductor through the neutral regime. There are no resident charge carriers. So in neutral regime, we see neutral exciton line and some line that we assume to be uh, the excited exciton. If we change to P-type semiconductor and we have resident holes, we can see also the exciton line and the line of the positive trion. The trion that consists of two holes and one electron. And if we change gate voltage again and go to the N-type semiconductor, we can see also an exciton and two lines that belongs to negative trion, the trion that consists of one holes and two electrons. Here are another experimental results. Here you can see the evolution of the sp spectrum of photoluminescence from this layer. We've changed from N-type regime to neutral regime. In this figure, you can see two lines, red one and, and blue one. From here, in natural regime, you also can see an exciton and some lines that we assume to be for non-replica. It is not trans. And in type regime, we cannot see an exciton and see two lines that belong to the negative trines. Also, we checked this doublet and uh, you can see in this figure that both lines of this X minus doublet has the same polarization. So, in the overview, I can, see, I can say that X minus and X plus trines have different energies and different fine structure. Positive trion has one line visible and uh, the negative trion has uh, two lines. And the questions of the theory, how to describe these results. Here I will show you again the band structure of the tungsten selenide. And uh, the main thought for this figure is that the spin orbit splitting of the valence band is rather large. So we consider the holes only in the topmost valence band, but the spin splitting of the conduction bands are 
much smaller and we have to consider electrons and buff conduction bands. So we write the tri and wave function as follows. Here is the block function of the unpaired particle electron or hole. It depends on the uh, tri and types. Here is the block function of the paired particles, the body and energy of exciton and trines is, is smaller than the band gap, so they can write the block function this way. The block function of the, the paired particles can be symmetric or anti-symmetric, so we can have symmetric envelope wave function for an anti-symmetric block function and opposite if you have the symmetric block function you will have anti-symmetric trend. And here is the envelope wave function of a relative motion of the paired particles related to the unpaired part one. And here is the wave function of a center of mass motion. We assume that the trine as a whole is free to move in the sample plane. Here is the Hamiltonian of the relative motion of the particle forming the trion. Here is the kinetic energy and here is the interaction between the identical particles and between the different type of the particles. Due to the strong dielectric contrast between the between this monolayer and the vacuum of the another materials of the one have to treat the interaction not as a column interaction but a screen column interaction by this effective interaction potential and this potential has the asymptotic of the column interaction in large in the large distances if the this rho is uh, large and the, in small distances is it is uh, like the logarithm the r uh, zero is a effective screen radius and in our calculation we will use it as a somewhat of uh, trial parameter some changeable value R0 equal to zero corresponds to the to, to the two-dimensional column limit and in our estimation in these materials this parameter is about three or four nanometers. Here I will show the method of a calculation to make a Calculation we will use a variational method that is a compromise between the accuracy and the uh, some numerical time that is needed to make a calculation. First of all, the trine binding energy is the difference between the energies of trine and exciton because the third particle that remains after the recombination of the exciton is free to move in the monolayer plane. And to calculate the binding energy of an exciton, we also use the variation method. The, this trial wave function. This wave function is a combination of the wave function of the ground state of the two-dimensional hydrogen atom. And it also take into account uh, the admixture of the excited state because the interaction is not a 
exact the column interaction. This trial function has the three trial parameters. To calculate the, the energy of the trial, we use the more complicated uh, trial function, and it, it can be divided on two parts, this uh, trial function. The blue part, the Chandrasekhar wave function, is a wave function of the trial that uh, consists of two lighter particles and uh, one particle that is heavier. And uh, this part is the is, is the wave function of the particles bound uh, to the center that can have two orbits. And this part uh, describes the polarization of the two identical particles to optimize the column uh, repulsion of the charge carriers with the same charge. And the red part is the part describing the trine with two heavier particles. And uh, frankly speaking, in most cases, even if you have a trine with two heavier particles, you can use only this blue part because the red part uh, has uh, to be taken into account only if you have very heavy particles, very different effective masses. I think, as I remember, the mass ratio has to be 1 to 10 or so on. In other cases, you can use a more simple wave function. And so, we take into account also the wave function we also take into account the antisymmetric trine, the trine that has the antisymmetric coordinate wave function, that is the excited state of the trine in the absence of a magnetic field. And this wave function can be constructed from this one by adding this part. And this wave function is the orthogonal to the wave function, the trial wave function for the ground state of the trial. Here are the results of the calculation. Despite that we have the beautiful experimental results for the for one material, we made a calculation with the effective screen radius as a changeable parameter. And here you ca can see the de dependence of the exciton binding energy and the ratio between trine binding energy to the exciton binding energy. In the case of the equal electron and hole effective masses on the dimension of screening radius. Here are the units of uh, of the energy and the length are the three-dimensional Bohr radius for the exciton with the dielectric con constant equals to one. Here you can see that the increase of the screening radius leads to decrease of the exciton binding energy and also it leads to the decrease of the ratio between trine and exciton binding energy. In the limit of a two-dimensional column interaction with screen radius x equals to zero, you have the well-known result for a two-dimensional trine. Okay, I have, uh, here is the dimensional results for the trine binding energy. This is the binding energy 
of the symmetric triangle with different effect effective masses ratio between electron and holes. And here is the abiding energy of the anti-symmetric triangle. And here the, the, we show the dependence of the triangle binding energy on the electron to hole effective mass ratio. So you can see that the positive and negative triangle has almost the same binding energy if the electron and hole effective mass are almost equal that we indeed have in tungsten selenide and the excited state of a triangle disappears if electron to hole effective mass is about one, effective mass ratio is about one half. So I will speak shortly about uh, the fine structure of the triangle lines. Uh, in case of, a negative, of the positive triangle, the fine structure only depends on the electron because the whole configuration is the invariant if we have a symmetric triangle and there are four possibilities for the triangle and uh, this gives uh, us two uh, dark states and one and, and, and two bright states that are Kramer's doublet and this leads to one line in the spectrum and in case of negative triangle there are more possibilities exactly 12 possibilities and we have three pairs of the bright states and one of these states this one uh, involves the resident electron in excited state so in case of a low enough temperature and not so much uh, high charge carrier's density in the experiment we will see only two lines that we see and here this comparison with the experiment we fixed the effective screen radius as we, so we have the exciton binding energy about 500 milli electron volts and in this case we, hold, we have almost the same binding energy for both trines and uh, this is different, uh, is slightly different but the same order as we see in experiment. Uh, the fact that the binding energy of the negative trine is, is higher than, than the binding energy of the positive trine can be obtained in our model only if we have electron effective mass larger than the whole effective mass. But uh, the observed difference uh, needs to have the whole, the whole is uh, 10 times lighter than the electron. That is very un unrealistic. So the only explanation that we have uh, 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 short range ex exchange interaction and our estimation uh, gives that the, if we have reasonable parameters we can uh, we can describe the experimental difference and the fine structure of the x minus doublet so these are my conclusion and thank you for your attention One minute for questions. We are running of time. Sorry. Do do we have question? Questions? Uh, have I seen question? No. Then, then, then maybe I uh, ask just shortly. Uh, have I understood correctly your uh, anti-symmetric triangle? It is like what is called usually. Um, oh. Triplet triangle. Tri triplet triangle. Yes, yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> In Sorry, semi semiconductor uh, quantum yeah, world, yeah, it, is called, it is called uh, yeah, uh, triplet triangle. Okay, thank you. So I understood you correctly. So let us thank the speaker.
And we, we move to the, to the next talk, which uh, will be given by Dmitry Kazanov from Yofu Institute. So, please. Hello. <clears throat> I'd like to thank the organizing committee uh, for the opportunity to give, to give the talk on the 25th International Symposium. Uh, and uh, my talk is Optical Activity of Chiral van der Waals Stacks. And to begin with, I would like you to remind uh, what is the chiral objects. Well, uh, chirality, chiral objects are the objects that are distinguishable from the mirror counterpart. Uh, that's why one, two objects uh, which are already you know is, are your hands. Uh, but actually there are a whole bunch of different chiral objects uh, in the world. And uh, uh, one of the most popular scientists, uh, the biologist, uh, Louis Pasteur, uh, he was uh, trying to understand, um, he, he was trying, he was studying the tartaric exit and uh, he found out that uh, there were uh, two different stereo isomers uh, in it uh, that were helix-like uh, right and left helix-like structures. And uh, actually, this, um, uh, th this, uh, this helps people to understand the optical activity in, in, such, uh, in such an exit. Um, but what is optical activity? I, I would like to remind you again uh, that optical activity is the rotation of the linearly polarized light, uh, which uh, travels through the optically active media. And um, actually, not only the uh, linearly, uh, it will gain the rotation, uh, but it will gain uh, some sort of ellipticity. And it is due to the difference between uh, left and right uh, hand polar polarization transmission through such, such structures. And actually, again, there are a lot of structures uh, which have natural optical activity in semiconductors like words structures or in tellurium. And even uh, a lot of work have, have been done in photonic structures uh, with some sort of strange forms uh, of the surface, uh, which uh, again, possess the optical activity. Uh, but uh, as you already heard, uh, we would like to uh, understand uh, the optical activity of uh, 2D uh, traditional, uh, transition metal decalcogenide materials. And uh, as you already know, those materials are amazing. They've got some optical uh, properties which are very perfect. For example, strong oscillator strength of excitonic in 2D monolayers. And uh, what I want to say is that uh, if we take one single monolayer, uh, uh, it is optically inactive, uh, just due to the high symmetry D3, D3H, and uh, the optical response is, is a tropical. But uh, this picture changes uh, if we um, have a couple of monolayers, and uh, for example, if we, if we twist uh, and make some sort of the chiral structure, uh, we believe that uh, such, such a stack of monolayers would be acti optically active due to uh, the reduced symmetry. And that's why our work uh, was to develop the uh, theory of optical activity through a uh, couple of monolayers. Uh, <coughs> um, we consider a uh, couple of monolayers which are twisted uh, from one another on the small angle. Uh, there is the linearly polarized light uh, which travels uh, through the structure with uh, wave vector Q. And uh, the twist and of course, we, we want to walk uh, near the excitonic resonance and optical gaps uh, to have interesting uh, enhancement. So, uh, <clears throat> what is the, uh, we uh, tried to write the effective Hamiltonian uh, in the basis of circular polarized light. And of course, each monolayer, each single monolayer, uh, uh, it has got the excitonic resonance uh, on the excitonic frequency omega zero. And of course, uh, every excitonic resonance uh, is described with another two parameters, the radiative and non-radiative width 
or deteriorate. Uh, the green term here, um, it describes the radiative transfer of polarization from one layer to another. <coughs> and another most important one uh, is the intralayer tunneling. Uh, due, to, uh, due to the fact that these structures are van der Waals, the distance between them are very, they are very close to each other. That's why we can uh, push uh, this term, uh, which is the tunneling amplitude. And uh, um, of course, there is, another, uh, there is a phase, um, S phi, S phi uh, where S is the left and right circular polarization. And due to the coupling of exciton from two layers, uh, this system will have two eigenmodes. Of course, uh, one of them would be symmetrical one uh, with the lower frequency and, and another one is the anti-symmetric with the frequency omega zero plus t. But the difference from quantum wells is that uh, here is the phase uh, which, which comes uh, from, from that interlayer tunneling between monolayers mono <coughs> and the twist, of course. Uh, after that, uh, when we, we, we understand our model, uh, we can try to, to find uh, the transmission co coefficient through such uh, structure. So the reason incoming field is zero and the transmitted field uh, would, be le would be proportional to the polarization of each layer, each uh, first. Ah, of course, I forget to say that, um, um, first of all, I would like to um, show the simplest case of only two monolayers, and after that, uh, I'll say something about uh, mo mo more monolay uh, and, and monolayers. So here is two monolayers, um, and the transmission coefficient uh, depends only the field from from each of them, and uh, here you can see red and the blue lines, which corresponds to uh, different uh, non-radiative decay of the structure. So it's like the bad and good quality of structure, and uh, here you can see two uh, on the red line. You can see two different dips. Uh, one of them is very strong, and another one is small, and uh, of course the frequencies are corresponds to the frequencies of symmetrical and anti-symmetrical modes of this system, of such a system. And uh, the, we understand that the, the first dip with the lower energy uh, corresponds to the symmetrical one and it interacts with the light with the double strength. That's why it's very, it's very deep. <coughs> and uh, the second one is the asymmetrical mode, which, uh, which is almost the dark and uh, interacts with light uh, bad. Badly. Uh, the blue line shows that um, all those uh, resonances are overlapped due to the broadening, and that's why uh, here we can just see the, the deep on, on the symmetrical mode. Uh, after that, we can uh, try to understand what is, the, what is the rotation angle and what's the optical activity of such structure. And of course, uh, transmittance uh, depends on the helicity and they are not equal to left and right polarized light. That's why we can define rotation angle and ellipticity angle uh, like that. <coughs> and uh, at the bottom, there are two pictures of, again, uh, gamma, uh, the small non-radiative width and the big one. And as you can see, there are again uh, two, two uh, peculiarities uh, which are corresponds to symmetrical and anti-symmetrical mode. But what is interesting that uh, here, the dark mode and the bright, or symmetrical or anti-symmetrical, uh, their amplitude are almost the same, but uh, they, they just have different sign. <coughs> and uh, it can be understood as the interaction strength from the modes also depends on the helicity and the uh, difference between symmetrical and asymmetrical modes, they are the same, that's why uh, the amplitude is the same. And uh, as you can see, it is hundreds of de milli degrees for, for structures of only two monolayers. <coughs> for the, for the non-radiative width, uh, for the uh, larger non-radiative width, again, we can see those two resonances, but they are, uh, they are just broadened due to the big gamma. And of course, uh, here's the expression of uh, how rotation and ellipticity angle uh, expressed, and uh, we can see that it is linearly uh, dependent on the uh, twist of those monolayers and wave vector, of course, and uh, <coughs> that's it. 
So uh, after that, we can try to understand uh, what is happening in the multiple layers. Uh, here, uh, here is the transmission coefficient through, uh, <coughs> through just five monolayers. And as you can see, there are five dips. Uh, and again, the first one is the biggest. And uh, we can understand that those five dips, again, corresponds to the eigenmodes of the system. Uh, but this <coughs> the dispersion of the system would be uh, something like that. And uh, the first, the lowest energy uh, peak, corresponds to the superradiant symmetrical mode. But here, uh, this superradiance effect, uh, due to the superradiance effect, this symmetrical mode interacts with light with n times stronger than in just, in just a monolayer. <coughs> and another, another four dips uh, can, can be seen in, in very good quality structures. Uh, here I present uh, three different, three different um, uh, amounts of layers of such a stack of chiral van der Waals structure. And as you can see again, uh, due to the broadening, we cannot see any, any uh, dark modes. Um, but the main, the, main, the main contribution here is uh, due to the symmetrical mode. That's why uh, uh, there is big broadening and uh, the transmissions go deeper uh, with the uh, increasing number of layers. And finally, uh, we'd like to understand the, what is the optical activity for, for such uh, n monolayers. And uh, as you can see, that again, uh, here are uh, the pictures for, uh, for, for the large gam gamma. And <clears throat> as you see, uh, there are again uh, the contribution of uh, symmetrical mode and anti-symmetrical mo modes. But of course, they're all broadened and uh, we can't detect them. Uh, here you can see that um, the expression for that case for that case, uh, is line again linearly dependent on the uh, chirality, on the uh, angle twist of the, <coughs> the monolayers. And it depends on the parameter L, which is the uh, distance, not distance, but the length of such structure. And, and actually, uh, those, uh, what is the values? Uh, the, level, the values for, for example, 10 monolayers is like one degree per micrometer, uh, the rotation angle and the ellipticity. Uh, if our structure is high, high enough, uh, the rotation angle can be even enhanced a lot. <clears throat> so, we have developed the theory of van der Waals stacks uh, of optical activity. Uh, after that, we have seen that the, in the spectra of rotation and ellipticity, we can see the eigenmodes of such a system. Uh, jack modes that are hidden in transmission, in transmission spectra uh, can be revealed in rotation and ellipticity angle. And uh, even photoluminescence of such chiral van der Waals stacks uh, is expected to be circular polarized. Thank you for your attention. So thank you, Dmitry, for being so precise in time. So we have time for questions. Please. Do you have questions? Yes, please, Misha. Thank you. It's very interesting. So could you please comment what happens with the uh, rotation angles if you start to increase the number of quantum wells further. So you stop at n equals 10 and then uh, can you really have some macroscopic rotation well, angles? Well, or? actually, I, I don't thank want you. to. Yeah, thank, thank you for the question. Well, uh, we don't want to do, uh, to do that thing just because if, if, you, if they have very, very long stack of multiple, uh, of m multiple monolayers, I think uh, such a structure could, could be understood as, an, as a bulk structure. So I think those, uh, those uh, effects would be, well, they, we, I think we, we can't just approximate it uh, to the many quantum wells, to the many monolayers. So may I then ask if you go to the bulk uh, mm -hmm. case, it will be already indirect? Yes, backup. yes indeed. So we don't want to. You don't want to go. Okay, any, any further questions? Uh, 
in, in your this equation below, you have parameter t. Yes. Uh, so this what is, is this parameter? This is the tunnel in front. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, maybe s uh, another. Uh, uh, well, he here yes. I. Yes. What is this t? This is just uh, the tunneling amplitude of the exciton from one layer to another one. So the exciton tries to tunnel uh, and gain some phase due to the twist of the B layers, due to the twist in, in one layer to another. So it's like the tunneling of the excitons. And, and if uh, uh, the second is not rotated, then phase is equal to zero, yeah? Yes, yes. Yes, there, there won't be any optical activity. And uh, how this phase phi knows about the rotation? Uh, well, I would try to say that, uh, I don't know, the exciton, uh, when, when exciton is excited, there are some bonds uh, inside the layer. And I think it's, it, it's something like, uh, when you rotate the layer uh, for, for this for this light for, for the exciton, it would be uh, easier well to transfer and uh, to twist a little bit just to well be precise in the in those bonds that are inside of that layer. You mean uh, microscopical bonds? Yeah? Yes, microscopically. Yeah, but in the in, layer. In this case, layer. I would feel uh, some uh, <laughs> some dependence of phi on microscopical angle, really. Because uh, if, if everything is dependent on microscopical bones, mm -hmm. then if you rotate by very small angle, mm -hmm. then geometry changes. And I cannot predict uh, that the phase of such uh, tunneling <coughs> will be equal to uh, to mechanical angle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, we, we are thinking about that, and uh, we think that if the angle is actually small enough, uh, they won't change. Well, th this is correct, uh, that this phase is, uh, is due to the mechanical twist. Uh, but w we think that there were actually some, some papers that says that some parameters, for example, well, there was the indirection there was the energy band of some monolayers, and they, they, they showed that uh, those dependence were, was um, due to the twist. So they, they twisted uh, some monolayers, and well, and it was due to approximately 20 degrees. And after 20 degrees, uh, this effect uh, was gone. So well, we can say that this is the linear, the phase is linear to the mechanical twist. So. Okay. Thank you. I think we have to thank the, the speaker now, and we move to the last. Thank you. We move to the last talk, uh, which uh, will be given uh, by our Rahim Iman from Magdeburg University. Marburg. Marburg University. Sorry, Marburg University. Hello? Okay. So, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the last talk of this session. And let me thank the organizers for the very nice opportunity to be back in St. Petersburg and to give a presentation at, the, at this excellent workshop. It's always a pleasure to be here. And um, so, today I would like to present you, after actually these excellent talks that we heard in this session and the interesting presentations, there's not much to learn actually anymore. But hopefully we can still extract something from this presentation and I hope I can motivate you for the work related to the influence of substrates on the, on the optical properties of monolayers. In particular here, tungsten diselenide, because tungsten diselenide can be used as a quite nice prototype uh, system for these investigations. And it was easy for us to access and to, to, um, man uh, to manufacture, so to, I mean to exfoliate and prepare. So that's these are the people behind this work. So I had to uh, put them afterwards into the picture. One of these 
these two guys, <laughs> lady and gentlemen, uh, worked hardest on this project or uh, this work. And uh, I would like to acknowledge some people and some groups who helped us with this. So from the Stevens Institute of Technology, we received nice samples, CVD grown samples. And from, from the home group, we got also very nice exfoliated samples. So we could combine and study the effects of the substrate for different kind of samples and make a conclusion on this. And of course, we have the financial support from the DFG. And I always have to thank the DID for all the opportunities. So Marburg University is located in the center of Germany, for those who don't know where it is. So we are talking about this system, and I'm happy that it was introduced so well before, so I don't need to talk about this much. So it's this nanometer thin material, actually sub nanometer thin, and you know how this now looks like. And this is just an example MOS2. And I hope it's going on here. Hmm? Let's go on. So. so this is the local coordination, and that's the top view of a, such a cell, as you know. And what's interesting is the transition from bulk, that's how you find this in nature, rather, to a monolayer. And as you know, um, you will have, that's just still an introduction, so you have an indirect gap as a bulk system and a direct gap in the, in the monolayer regime. And for us spectroscopists, it's of course optimum to have signal from a sample, and that's the case for a direct semiconductor. If you do linear spectroscopy, that's the ideal case. You can see here, uh, the difference, again, between bulk and a monolayer system, you see how much stronger the emission from the system is when it's in a monolayer system. The quantum efficiency the, uh, increases, I mean, the quantum yield increases towards the monolayer regime. You have an energy shift that's related to the, let's say, structural properties. And you see nice absorption features here and photoluminescence features for these materials. So do it yourself is the motto you can do you can do it at home. You can do it also easily in the lab with scotch tape. So that's also what we did. We took the scotch tape method, prepared samples. Actually, this is not from us, just from the literature. But to in, illustrate how easily you can find um, monolayer areas after scotch tape preparation on substrates. And um, there's a pool of TMDs. So as I said before, we focused on WSE2, but of course there are several other materials which you could consider for very interesting studies, of course. And uh, here you see a chart where you see the periodic element of systems from which you can um, assemble these transition metal decalcogonides. So I would like to motivate again a bit. So the applications and highlights are summarized in this slide. And uh, most of you are, known, uh, are familiar with uh, some applications like the field effect transistor based on MOS2 nanocavity lasers were recently demonstrated, for instance, for photonic crystal systems or whispering gallery remote lasers based on microdisks where monolayers were put onto the um, microdisk. And here you see a work presenting single photon emission from defect states incorporated in these monolayers. So it's, of course, a very nice testbed for various um, studies and, of course, the realization of novel devices. So naturally, you need to deal with the substrate also from time to time. So the next step would be to go towards van der Waals heterostructures, but that's not with me today. So just um, many intriguing effects that take place in these 2D semiconductors have to do with the excitons. So how do they behave? And how are they influenced by the environment? So that's a, actually a question which has to be gradually addressed. And it's, of course, at the beginning, we have some work other groups have work presented on how the inf environment influences the excitons. But as I, as I said, it's a gradual process to full understanding of how the excitons in these systems are man modified by the environment. So in this picture, I show you a very simple representation of excitons, bi -ex uh, tri trions, and bi-excitons, which usually arise in these systems. And here you can see, again, a summary of the, the exciton in the 3D system and in a 2D system where you experience a strong modification due to in-plane confinement. And that's a very schematic chart. So you expect the binding energy to increase drastically as you go from 3D to 2D, and the gap is not anymore. I mean, the absorption spectrum also changes because of the density of states that changes. So this was studied well already. So you find that um, <laughs> excitons behave like a bit hydrogenic, so hydrogen-like behavior was studied. 
you see 1s, 2s, 3s, and 4s, so on higher order excitons. And this very nice entry point into the physics of excitons, and much, much more work was done than I summarize here. But you can see mainly that what's of interest is for applications that the exciton binding energy in these materials is very, very strong in comparison to common semiconductor materials. It's on the order of 0.5 EV. Yeah, that's an other dimension if you compare this with, um, for instance, even large band gap semiconductors that maybe have 100 MeV maximum, I mean, from my understanding. So, um, gallium arsenide for 4 MeV, yeah. So, very different world. So, that encouraged people to employ these materials for lasers and for strong coupling systems. I just mentioned microcavity lasers where the, the work is uh, going towards um, thresholdless lasing or for cavity polaritons where you can ex exploit the very large binding energy and oscillator strength in these 2D materials for a very nice Rabi splitting at room temperature, giving you a pathway to room temperature, for instance, polaritonics or Bose-Einstein condensation. Yeah, okay. So, of course, um, these crystalline sub systems with sub nanometer thickness, the substrate and surrounding matters, and we want to explore this together a bit, and I have still enough time, yeah. So let's probe the possible influences of the substrate and give a brief overview. What could happen? So the exciton radius in this system is rather big in comparison to the layer thickness, and that's again only a sketch here. Yeah? So you see that even if the exciton radius is on the order, or let's say one nanometer, that's actually common understanding now that it's one nanometer roughly, and you will still have the field lines penetrating the environment or the substrate. So the substrate and the surface properties have affect this, this system. So roughness and local strain can be an issue. Dielectric environment, okay, directly constrained, for instance, can be an issue regarding binding energy and band gap position. The local chemistry and doping of the substrate. One cannot address everything, everything in one work. And it's very difficult to unravel which, which, which thing contributes to what. But you can do some systematic work to see how strong do these factors influence the optical properties and, as I said, gradually explore this effect. So we investigated WSE2 samples, mostly exfoliated and then isolated on uh, different substrates. And you see that it's easily um, identified under the optical microscope. That's very nice. You can see the monolayer flakes because of their strong absorption easily under the microscope. And I think that's common uh, knowledge also here. I don't need to... Um, explain this too much, but it's really cool, right? So you, here it's not a nice contrast in this picture, but this is a large flake a sapphire which large dimensions. Here you have CVD grown sapphire on sapphire. These are both sapphire samples. Then you can exfoliate on MGF2. It turned out that's not a nice material for us, I think. HBN can be naturally a good buffer between a substrate. So we actually tried with SC, I mean with silicon nitride first, but it was, um, we found that um, our luminescence spectrum was so bad that we had to switch to HBN on silicon nitride, for instance. So in our study, we used an HBN as the actual substrate. You see here contrasts where you can identify contrasts where you can identify monolayer regions just by the contrast of the microscope image. And here you see Raman signal. So along along these yellow lines, so you can identify easily monolayer regimes by the Raman signature. So each monolayer material has some peculiar modes and you can find their wavelength, a wave number, and then you can attribute it to monolayer, bilayer, and so on. So we used opaque samples and transparent samples because these are most interesting for applications. Usually everybody employs silicon dioxide because it's so easily accessible, but if you want to have future devices on optically transparent materials, um, yeah, you also need to understand how these work. So we used the very different materials for ranging with the refractive index from 1.38 to 2.2. We wanted to have also a large span. And the surface quality here, we found range between atomically flat to atomically rough. And of course, we, as I said, we cannot always distinguish all the effects separately. So, but these samples are very diverse. Um, CVD grown samples were compared to exfoliated samples to give a better understanding. So the experimental setup is quite simple. It's actually a self-built microscope where you can analyze the PL, where you can direct the PL to APDs or three cameras for time resolved measurements, and you can ex uh, evaluate uh, so signal that, uh, that you measure at room temperature or at low temperature. So the good news is if you have a no AFM, you can still 
work independently on monolayer TMDCs because you have uh, PL signatures, which give you an, a clear, um, clear understanding if you have a monolayer or not. And you have the Raman signature, which also tells you that this is a monolayer or not. So together you have unambiguous proof actually that you really deal with monolayers. So people could criticize you, for instance, from time to time, why you don't show AFM measurements. Keep in mind, uh, there's always a way to combine PL and AFM measure, um, and Raman measurements to convince uh, referees. So you don't need always AFM to show that it's monolayer mono material. Okay, so how do Raman spectra usually look like? Here, that's just a summary. We see for different materials, there is no change, hardly a change. If you plot it in logarithmic scale, so you see very well that's the main uh, mode for this material at this wave number. And there is another mode next to it at a shoulder, as a shoulder, so to say. And if this shoulder is below 260 wave numbers, then it's already a bilayer. So here, we could at least clearly show also that we al always deal with monolayers and so on. Let's look at spectra. Because I'm a spectroscopist, I rather am interested in spectra. And I wanted to compare with the team, so what is the difference if we use different materials and um, as a substrate? And you see at room temperature that there's always a nice bright feature at a certain wavelengths, which is reproducible. And you have also a shoulder. And these are commonly uh, attributed to the exciton at room temperature and the trion. This at higher energy is the exciton, while the shoulder at lower energy is understood to be the trion at room temperature. So later we will understand that's not a free exciton, so it's a bound, actually, rather bound uh, feature, but excitonic. Okay. Here you see sapphire and silicon dioxide and stuff that doesn't make that, it's not a big difference, just sometimes the sample quality is a bit worse, but the features are the same. I could show, I could show you charts of the energy position in line with, I, I skipped that, but the, really is always the same feature here, but in comparison, CVD grown sapphire changes. I mean, CVD grown on sapphire, I mean, the spectrum changes. You see a broad feature. That's because of strain in the material, and um, yeah, your growth quality is not as good as if you take natural crystal and exfoliate. So we found that you end up, and that's not only one sample that looks like this, Basically, all of these CVD grown samples looked like this. They were as broad as here with a very, yeah, with a bit uh, um, shoulder, uh, shoulder tuned to the to lower energies, which is the, here the trion. Here, the distance between exotons and trions is not rather small. Here in the sapphire system, uh, CVD grown system on sapphire, the things change. But interestingly, you will see later that at low temperature, everything looks again the same. Yeah? Even the CVD grown sample can be very nice. But at room temperature, you get a different picture. You think, oh, it's crap, throw it away. Maybe not. So it just shows you that there is a difference. So MGF2, we thought that the material with the lowest refractive index could be useful for some, some later applications maybe also to have some material at hand. And here HBN, which always is nice to have if you encapsulate with HBN, then your material properties are usually restored. That's perfect because HBN serves as a very, very nice buffer layer. So it's a very nice surface for all the 2D materials. So it's of course important to include it. And you see the spectral features still are very, very similar. If you compare our superhero sample SEO2, which everyone uses, and HPN samples, so everything is so far okay. Nothing shocking. And let's look now how the power dependency, um, pump power dependency of the spectra looks like, because this tells us now if we deal with free excitons or not, if we have bound excitons or free excitons. I mean, we, or we used, of course, methods uh, that was, was, were shown, in, I mean, were used in literature, just we employ them here in our study. But you see here that the, the slope, this is a linear alpha factor, uh, is powered to the factor of, to the, I mean, P to the power of alpha, so pump power dependence is here shown, so you see always a factor below one. It's not a li um, linear slope, it's sublinear. Um, and this is consistent. MGF2, as I said, was not a nice sample. It jumps out of the row. But all these features, exciton and trion, are not um, free. They are localized somehow. So let's not talk about what kind of localization, but let's say there are not no free excitons. And you can compare the exciton 
um, and try on um, intensities and get some ratio, and you see for different substrates this ratio can vary. Why it can vary? Of course, because the substrate is not always the same, it's not the same doping, not the same quality, so you will have sometimes more uh, charge carriers, surface charge carriers, or, or uh, the, the electronic potential is different. So here you give rise to more trions, here less, and here exorbitantly high amount of trions appear. And here again it's quite regular. Then you look at the helicity, because you want to see if valley, valley physics play a role. You pump, for instance, polarized, circular polarized, and look at the same polarization or the opposite polarization, and then you find that um, these features have to do with valley physics because the factor is above 0.10, I mean 10%. That means everything around 50% means that you deal with excitons, not with defect states, but they are bound, as I said. So localized excitons and trions were found. Different ratios indicate the different doping from the substrate. And the emission of the CVD samples here is shifted due to strain. And that's also confirmed by Raman spectra. The origin of the variation in the helicity values um, is not clarified yet. Okay, let's look at the low temperature spectra. As said before, if you look at the room temperature spectrum, that doesn't tell you anything about the quality of the sample. Look at the low temperature features, and if you see then exciton, trion, and bi-exciton, then you can say you have a good sample. Sometimes, and this is not only from one sample, we have several we had made several tries, but picked representative samples. Here, the SEO2 looks always very, like six. Prototype, very nice. Then the sapphire, exfoliate on sapphire, um, then, and so on. You see, here, the sapphire, CVD grown sample on sapphire, shows all the nice features that you want to have as the silicon dioxide substrate version. But while the exfoliated on sapphire couldn't, yeah. So not automatically um, you can blame the, the sample, uh, the, the method, growth method or exfoliation. So here you see that um, in the blue highlighted columns, you always have the features you want. I will explain them which features they are. And here in the yellow columns, we mostly didn't find them. So um, let's look at the spectra again and look at the power dependence. Why we took look again at the power dependence? I said before, if you have a linear incre a li linear alpha factor, I mean a factor alpha factor of one, that represents an regular exciton, free exciton. If you have something below one, it should be a bound state or not, I mean localized. If you have something above one, it, it, it can be the bi-exciton. So of course we wanted to understand, is this the bi-exciton which comes out so power dependent? So this is the most dominant feature at higher powers and it's very power dependent. So you see also here, it's really the bi-exciton. And the others with a factor around one represent free exciton and free trion. And this thing here at the side, this is a defect. It's a localized state. No, it's a defect, sorry, not localized. So you find here also the very low factor. Let's look at the picture for the others. So don't go into detail. Don't get uh, confused about the, all the lines. The message is simply that wherever you have these this very tall peak in the center here that arises, it's really the bi-exciton, it has the highest slope, and in the order you have exciton, trion, bi-exciton, and defect states. Here you find them as well, but not with nice intensity because the sample was very small and difficult to adjust and also as not so, not so um, luminescent like the others here in this case. Maybe, or maybe we didn't align well, but here you see this and this and this shows all these nice features that you want and this one not. Okay, let's look at a summary of this. Bioexitons are only observed for pulsed excitations. So due to the intensity dependence, you, in, peak, in CW you cannot find them. And if you do helicity measurements using polarized light, you can um, distinguish between localized states which have um, a different behavior than the excitonic features no helicity is expected for the defects because if you pump polarized, the polarization can be lost. For excitons, it shouldn't be. Um, I want to skip that because time is running. And I want to show you that we checked the dynamics at room temperature and found that exciton exciton annihilation plays a role. We did this for all samples and they always show a similar, almost similar behavior, but sometimes it's more pronounced, sometimes not. For instance, here, exciton exciton annihilation can be modeled in all cases well, but here it's prominent 
and here not. If you do it with a street camera, you can see it very strongly. This is a B molecular fit, or even more advanced, it has uh, three factors actually in the equation. So it's more than a B, it's at least B molecular fit. So it shows you that the power dense dependence plays a big role in the decay dynamics at room temperature. So you have three components, recombination, optic just recombination of excitons, that could be diffusion limited annihilation, exciton exciton annihilation, and long range annihilation. So radiative um, coupling. The dynamics at 10K yeah, is different. And in order to make it brief, I show you just that if you systematically analyze that, you can find some trends, can a bit attribute it to features related to the samples and substrate and the, and the exciton peaks that arise in each substrate. But it's, of course, now too much to, for this. So to conclude. The choice of the substrate has a big influence. The spectra and the Raman signatures look mostly similar. The appearance of exciton modes varies. Trion exciton rates indicate different doping levels. Helicity is important if you want to distinguish excitons from defects. And annihilation place take, takes place at room temperature, exciton, exciton annihilation. And um, yeah, so what you see at low temperature, I didn't tell, so I don't conclude because of the time. So we will work harder on this, I promise. <laughs> So thank you for your attention. Okay. Thank you, Arash. But actually questions are now for coffee pause, so we are out of time for questions, sorry. And uh, let us speak all uh, let us thank all speakers of the section again. And at the end of the session.
Okay, good afternoon. Uh, I'm sorry for the delay. I was asked to postpone the beginning of the session, but I think it's time to start. Uh, my name is Sergei Ivanov. I am from Yofo Institute. And it's my honor to be the chair of this very interesting session devoted to quantum photonics. And we have here today uh, four presentations and three invited talk and one oral presentation. And the first invited talk will be presented by Professor Höfling from Würzburg University and also University of St. Andrew, Scotland. And the title of the talk is Quantum Dot Single Photon Emitters in Semiconductor Heliomarcinite Based Micropillars and in Monolayered uh, Tungsten Selenium uh, Biselenite. Please, thank you. Thank you very much. Everyone can hear me quite okay? Okay, I would like to thank the organizing committee, but it seems they are still evaluating the press poster awards or whatsoever. So I start without them. Nevertheless, uh, great thanks for inviting me here. It's not my first time in St. Petersburg by far, but the very first time at this conference. Uh, and I come here with pleasure. Yeah, um, so the first part will be actually about quantum dots, um, semiconductor quantum dots, the good old indium gallium night quantum dots, and we want to put them just here into the center of a micropillar cavity and uh, do some quantum photonics and at the end with it. So this will be much more on the technological side and um, then also on the application side compared to what you have seen before um, in many cases. And the second part, actually, we um, investigate some single photon emission out of the 2D monolayers, which you have heard a lot. These are just local defects there, and want to add some uh, novelty on that uh, in terms of cascaded emission we have seen there. Um, so first of all, I would like to thank the people who actually have done the work. I'm just standing here, um, and uh, the group actually in Würzburg um, who has done that is um, mainly on the 2D materials and also the quantum dots. Uh, Christian Schneider is a driving force here over years. And these are our quantum dot people who worked on some micro pillars for a time and time. And these guys contributed to the 2D material work here. And Sebastian on the quantum dots and Martin Kamp guiding some of the work um, initial, at the very initial stage. And we have a long time collaboration, meanwhile, since 2011 with the group of Chao Yang Lu and Chan Wei Pan in China. Um, who don't know them maybe from by name. These are the guys also who sent the quantum satellite up. And they are very interested in single photon sources to go beyond um, some multi-entanglement, which they can do with down conversion, for instance. And this is why they are interested in our uh, um, sources here for uh, quantum photonics. So um, what is the platform we use? So we just use gallium arsenide based substrate. Um, and we grow indium gallium arsenide on top. Uh, at a few monolayers then, 1.7 monolayers for indium arsenide, um, on top of the wetting layer some islands form. And this has been um, known for years and pioneered particularly here at the Offer Institute also to get quantum dot lasers to run uh, in the telecom wavelengths range and so on. But we do that now just really to concentrate on the properties of a single dot and not the ensemble. So most of the results I'm going to present, I think essentially all, are based on randomly grown quantum dots. I mean, we grow these. This is a, this is a statistical process. And um, so this is the position of these um, dots is then random. We know also how to place these dots, but the optical properties are not so good for, the, um, uh, for these dots yet compared to the others. So the best device is actually we have to place um, around these quantum dots in order to get the best properties. And this is a cross-section TM of the structures we use. So now, um, if you grow um, vertically, here's a quantum dot. The nice thing is you follow the potential profile here. You get what is known from quantum mechanics. You have confinement of the electrons and of the holes uh, in the uh, conduction band and the valence band. And you just resemble the structure which you know from atomic physics. Uh, you have the S and P shell and so on. And um, if you just, um, um, the electrons in the holes are bound together by Coulomb attraction. And you have really discrete atomic-like state, uh, states, but in a semiconductor platform. <clears throat> and now if you look at the emission spectrum here of such a quantum dot ensemble with some high spatial resolution, um, what you see here is that there are distinct emission lines which you can have for higher and higher excitation lines. 
So these, for instance, here are excitonic lines stemming from two different quantum dots. And now if you excite very, very high, you get lots of different charges. And this is also what is important later um, because there are different charge configurations possible for non-resonant above band gap excitation. And you can have a full plethora of uh, different emission lines if you excite with high um, uh, values and you have charged, uh, positively, negatively charged excitons. However, if you filter here the emission out of one of these lines, you are sure that there is only a single quantum dot here emitting. Um, a single line because you need to find a time to re-excite the system in order to get um, uh, another photon out of that. So this is what is typically done. We put a filter here um, on this one of these lines and due to charge uh, uh, Coulomb interaction actually we are sure that any other line appears at a different wavelength and we are sure that there is only a single photon emitted at a time and this is what we follow. So now, this is easy. This is how you can make a single photon source. Um, but there are a few restrictions what we want to do um, if they are really useful. And this is now engineering which has been uh, taking place over years and years in our labs and many other labs. So of course, first of all, the efficiency should be high. This means per trigger, we want to have one photon out. So the efficiency should approach 100%. And what I'm going to show are values between 60 uh, and 80% which we obtain nowadays. This means per optical trigger or even electrical trigger, we get about 60% of the photons out. Uh, then there is, should be a weak probability of multi-photon pulses. This is given by the second order correlation function, which should be uh, close to zero, um, ideally at least uh, less than one in order to be a non-classical state. And for quantum information processing, not for quantum communication, direct one, but for uh, quantum um, information processing and for um, quantum repeater applications, you need um, a wave packet overlap which approaches one, meaning that the photons should be indistinguishable. If you have consecutively emitted photons or photons emitted from different dots and you make quantum interference with them, them they should be indistinguishable. And this is a main figure of merit I'm going to characterize and present today. And because many of these quantum dots are all at different wavelengths, uh, you want to tune them and fabricate them in a scalable manner. So this is already a wish list which is challenging enough. I'm going to address some of the advances we made towards that. And you can add maybe some other things. Ideally, they should be all electrically injected. Uh, but this is in contrast to many schemes which require indistinguishable photons because it's a non-resonant process. And of course, high temperature operation would be desirable. Here nitrides or other uh, materials like HPN also can do um, a good job. Uh, but we focus on low temperature for Kelvin results now during the entire course. So these are the quantum dots we utilize. So we put them in order to make high efficiency um, single photon emission into micropillar cavities. So we use typical Bragg wavelengths uh, gratings here, um, grown monolithically by molecular beam epitaxy. Here is a quantum dot layer. This makes a vertical confinement and by laterally etching the um, structures here, we get um, uh, the uh, lateral confinement. A typical diameter we use is two micron. Two micron gives us a nice far field profile. Uh, for instance, for nanowires, what you have to do is you have to taper the nanowires invertedly or directly in order to get a nice far field profile. We get this more or less for free for these devices on a two micron, but maybe the efficiency cannot be as high. The good thing, however, is that these quantum dots, if they are in the center here, are still nicely buried here. So the distance to the outside world is about one micron, and this helps us to ensure a better quality of most of these quantum dot emitters. <clears throat> so now I'm going to present something um, which um, has made a major, major step forward. So Peter Michler pioneered a way in order to resonantly excite the quantum dots from the side, which was a challenge in the micropillar case. And uh, our colleagues in China just used uh, one polarization of a uh, laser and used cross polarization to measure actually the emission. And you need to do that in order to suppress the laser because they want to go strictly resonant on the laser and avoid all the charges and everything around to make a very quiet excitation of the quantum dot itself and get very high efficiency out. And for this they used here a setup where they used cross polarization um, so excited with this one, and they detected in the cross-polarization. 
Um, and here's a sample and backwards. Of course, with this, you throw away about half of the uh, every second photon because um, you just filter the other ones out. And this is a major drawback now of this technique, but it provides you with very high quality photons. And in order to avoid this factor of two, people are working hard now to establish better excitation ideas. So time to wake up. This is now a very heavy slide. Um, I will guide you through this one, but it contains a lot and a lot of useful information. So first of all, what is that here? This is a buff band gap excitation, P-shell resonant excitation, and this is S-shell resonant excitation. This means it's strictly resonant. So if you follow just the first graph, what you see here is if you excite a buff band gap, you see there are lines. They are not too broad, but still you have <coughs> quite a few of them excited. <coughs> and also the line width is relatively broad, and you have other background here. So you can filter that out, of course, but it means it is not ideal because other charges around during other times may just shift the wavelengths over time. You don't have only a single line um, being excited, but all the other background actually is full of noise as well. And this moves the line um, around. You see here P-shell resonant excitation. You have mainly one line, and this is uh, already narrower. And what you see here is S-shell resonant excitation where you really have strictly one line being excited. And now if you follow to the right, these are just higher resolution images. Uh, you see here the line which goes from 2.5 gigahertz down to 0.43, which is near the Fourier limit of that one. <coughs> and you see here the fine structure splitting of that one. And uh, if you compare the line width here, you see this is much broader than the strictly S resonantly excited one. And this is the main advantage. If you are at the Fourier limit, you can really get indistinguishable photons here. We utilize <coughs> here to, uh, not even the Purcell effect for that one. And what you see here then is for high excitation, strictly as shell resonant, you see the Molov triplet, um, which has been uh, seen before in CW, but this is now for pulsed. Uh, you can see this also in pulsed resonance fluorescence. So this was the first result then uh, with pulsed resonance fluorescence excitation. Uh, which is needed, of course, because the real advantage of quantum dots is you can trigger the emission compared to all the other spontaneous systems. And, um, of course, for really setting the trigger, what you want to do is to set, send in a pulse in order to trigger the emission. And this has been done here. What you see here are Rabi oscillations. Um, and if you go to the pi pulse, you want to have high efficiency. And, of course, the second order correlation function shows here going almost down to zero. Um, that there is a high purity source, so you don't have a lot of multi-photon events. And um, so what is done now is something which um, Yoshi Yamamoto and Charlie Santori um, actually pioneered here in that paper. is a technique to characterize these single photons by just sending from one quantum dot micropillar the photons out of the cavity and putting them in a delay line and then overlaying some of the um, same emitted quantum dots again with themselves. And for some of the consecutively emitted photons, these overlap then. And this is why you see here, over, dependent on the delay line, uh, some different number of peaks. And this depends on the length of the delay. <coughs> and the important thing is if you do things properly here at zero delay, then two photons are um, um, overlaid. Uh, so do quantum interference. And for being indistinguishable, this peak should go down to zero. While as if this one is um, uh, Distinguishable single photon source, the central peak should go up to one. And the main uh, advance here was that the, it was a triggered single photon source with very high uh, visibility of the quantum interference wave packet overlap of almost approaching 100% at that time. And uh, this is going, getting closer and closer to the atomic physics values. And atomic physics, of course, um, uses um, re more resonant techniques. And this is astonishing because you are still in a semiconductor environment, but you are at low temperature, so you freeze out a lot of the um, defacing mechanisms uh, of the phonons, of course, at these low temperatures. Okay, but this was a planar sample here. So the efficiency was limited to 30 to 40 percent. And uh, to really benefit from the uh, full um, extraction efficiency you can get in these structures, you would like to um, edge micropillar cavities. So for this, we just have stolen what Pascal Senela uh, made for some time ago here um, using such a planar microcapillar cavity. She scanned over a wafer, <coughs> putting some resist on top, and then by uh, just scanning over the wafer, we can locate a quantum dot which we like. 
So this is with one with a green laser, and then we shine a blue ultraviolet laser in. And this one, actually, the exposure time, we just adapt that we know um, that we can uh, develop the system in a way that the micropillar um, diameter is just and resonant with the quantum dot emission line. So this one can do with quite good accuracy. And then we can directly edge down um, this micropillar cavity in the center we have the quantum dot. And now we know that the quantum dot is nicely aligned within the micropillar cavity. I've pointed out before that we can grow side control quantum dots and send pattern pillars around. But the quality of these quantum dots is not yet really competitive uh, for in terms of high indistinguishability. We recently just obtained the first mole of triplet in resonance fluorescence on a side control quantum dot. Um, so this is why for that, we, it's not a fully scalable technique, but for some devices, one can do that. And these are some results obtained in our group, so fully patterned and characterized in our group. So you see at low temperature, we have very bright emission, quantum dot uh, being in res almost in resonance here, and then for increasing temperature, we tune out um, and see the quantum dot and the cavities and separated. Um, so here also determined values and estimated values from the diameter. So you see the theory with a maximum Purcell factor of about six agrees well with a measured one here for on and off, on off resonance. And the full resonance here is at 20 Kelvin. Um, so, and this shows that the efficiency is good for that one. The efficiency we address here. So for this very particular device, we had an efficiency of 75%. This means that um, um, setting an optical trigger with s resonant pulse, we get 75% of the photons out of the micropillar cavity. But then we have cross-polarization, so we just don't get a factor of two less finally um, compared to that. But 75% is the extraction efficiency, optical extraction efficiency of that device and uh, per this trigger. So you see here then the Ravi oscillation, and we set it ideally to the pi value and then determine the um, Hongo Mandel. Uh, dip later. And what you see here is then the purity. This is a second order uh, correlation function um, of the um, uh, emitted uh, single photons, and this is the HPT measurement set up here. And you see we have less than 1% G2 value for that particular device. Um, this is 1.3 million counts on the CCT. Um, these are now the results. Um, comparing the indistinguishable photon case and the distinguishable photon case. I mentioned already that we put these quantum dots on a delay line. Um, and what you see here is now the case where the um, uh, polarization of both is parallel. So what you see here is that the central peak really goes down um, almost to zero. Whereas if you make um, just rotate one of the photons on its way and do orthogonal polarization, you see the central peak is about the same height. So you can really compare the different cases. And uh, the reason why this central one here is down to zero is because um, these are bosons and uh, on the quantum, uh, be in the beam splitter, quantum interference makes them, if they're indistinguishable, to go out on the same beam splitters. So you would not have any correlation peak then in the center because they never go out on the same side. So the wave packet overlap of this particular device was um, 88%, but here you see a drawback of that one. Uh, because in this particular pillar, it was that going to the pi pulse, we sacrificed a little the, um, wave packet overlap. So it was really going down into the values of the 60s, um, 70s, and so on. And this is, of course, no good. This is why there is a lot of confusion in literature. You can always find a lot of values in the abstract, all look very nice, 90%, 99%, and so on. But often they are from different samples or at least from different operation points. Because if you go to very low excitation, you can have high indistinguishability. Um, but what finally counts is that you have high efficiency, high brightness, um, and high indistinguishability and high purity at once. <clears throat> uh, while this doesn't look so bad, our colleagues in China actually have searched for more and more pillars and found even a better one. I will quickly summarize these results here as well. Uh, so these are ours for comparison. This is one in, uh, measured in FA and Shanghai. And you see here is a comparative case here. Also, this goes essentially down to zero. However, their indistinguishability was much better. It was actually so good that they could even extend this over microseconds to see very high indistinguishability of these single photons. What you see here now is the photon indistinguishability for a few picoseconds. Actually, it's still on the range of nine, more than 90% here. 
And this is at the Pi Pulse, where the source actually is most efficient. And this is what you see here. And it saturates above 92%. With a delay line, they measured this one with a large delay line, up to um, 14 something microseconds. And these are more than 1,000 consecutively emitted photons. Meaning that if you emit a single photon, you can just put a switch and just send it into a into photonic circuit or so on and do something with it. And you know these photons are indistinguishable and they arrive then at the spot if you predetermine it at the same time when you want it and can do quantum interference there. And this is the advantage of these triggered single photon sources. You could potentially scale this up to large numbers um, for that one because you have high efficiency and can, can trigger these things. Uh, so this is quite promising in this regard. And now let's look at um, what they obtained actually at the setup. So this is again a uh, Rabi oscillation here. This was a state of here in that paper. So they had already uh, almost 4 million clicks here for that one with a detector efficiency silicon APD of 30%. You see here the Rabi oscillation. And then in the recent, more recent experiment, they increased that efficiency by just doing more anti-reflection coding and so on on these devices, and what they have now is direct count six um, megahertz, and you know the repetition rate of the Thai sapphire lasers, which is order of magnitude 80 megahertz. This means they get about 10% clicks now, these devices, despite the cross polarization. So this is then the overall efficiency of that, uh, what you see here. And by correcting for the dead time, actually you are above uh, about nine per, uh, million clicks here now. Um, for that device because for sometimes the detector is blind in reality there would be more clicks uh, for that one So this source is now um, Ready and they have utilized that in the uh, first two experiments um, and this was um, uh, a Dalton kind of uh, quantum random quantum walk So if you have a golden port here, you know from classical mechanics if you throw in a part a classical particle here it will fall down somehow randomly, but it will end up in a normal distribution here. Um, so this is one of the experiments uh, you can do. And the thing is, the question is now, what happens if you put in either fermions or bosons in such a circuit? This one is here realized in a similar way, but with uh, waveguides. And if you now put in here bosons, which are indistinguishable, it turns out that this pattern which comes out is quite complicated to uh, calculate. Um, so it seems that very recently people have found a better algorithm uh, to calculate that. I don't know if Misha is here. Uh, a few weeks ago he asked me about the number. Uh, it was previously about 20 photons when you go beyond what you can do with classical computers, but the new algorithm maybe pushed that now for 30 to 40 uh, photons you would need to put into such a circuit. Um, so, and it is very difficult to predict by classical manners the output here. Um, and this is why people are interested in solving um, that problem here. While this is just a question of um, interest and it is not really of a big application, this is a so-called boson sampling issue. And uh, what you see here now is what's implemented in the setup. An attacube cryostat, single photons going out. Here you see Pockel cells, which redirect the quantum uh, dot single photon sources here in, an elect in a circuit. And this circuit actually is then here, uh, you detect here the output by these nine um, uh, detectors here, and then you map out what you see. And the result is now shown and summarized here. So what you see here, they have done that experiment with um, um, three, four, and five photons. Uh, so this is a record number of arbitrary states herein. And they were able to reproduce um, previous results. And the three photon is 30 times thousand brighter than any previous experiment with down, with down conversion. And this is a general four to five boson sampling uh, for that one, particularly with a trigger. And they are going to scale this with better and better detectors now um, uh, within the next few months. Um, yeah. And of course, ideally, you would just generate the single photons on chip. I'm very convinced that Maurice presented a big and a uh, very nice talk on that one at the beginning for integrated quantum photonics. You could use um, waveguides and all these beam splitters on chip. And uh, what you see here, you can just put the quantum dots here on chip, make them tunable to emit single photons as shown here, and also put the detectors directly on chip as we have done uh, years and years ago in collaborations in the European project. So finally, you could put everything on a single chip. This would be one of the things. I think I'm not having a lot of time anymore, but just quickly, we know what 2D materials are now. 
And in system2D materials, you can have defects. This has been shown by many, many groups, and you can actually artificially introduce them by strain. And uh, what we have done is we have put C2D monolayers on gallium arsenide substrate and overgrown with aluminum phosphide in order to avoid absorption. And we did some substrate engineering, which we compared to the um, regular SAO2 um, on the substrate. We put the monolayer on gallium aluminum phosphide. It was rougher. However, we see that we can really stabilize the charged one here and the line width gets narrower. This is still not what Toulouse can do nowadays, almost approaching the homogeneous line width. Um, but it is already much better, and this helped us to see particularly one feature better. Um, so there is not a lot of news. Um, I will come back to the real news of that one. Before, a lot of these samples just showed a lot of chitter here. So the lines were wandering around and um, even blinking some effect, and we could reduce that a lot for that one. And this had also an influence on the defect states which we saw. Um, these defects um, just were showing a much narrower line width then, finally. And um, so you see here a previous sample, because um, next to these uh, 2D states, you can see some localized states, and they can emit uh, single photons. And what you see here is that this line width can be much reduced of these as well, just because of the substrate engineering. Then we were sitting on that one. We measured, uh, again, G2. As you've seen in the past uh, few slides, we have learned how to do that. And this is now the correlation function, x and x, so we don't set a filter here. So we see single photon emission of that one. Um, you see here going down, not to zero like before, but it's at least um, within the noise regime, um, clearly a single photon source. This has been shown by others. Uh, what also has been claimed was bi-excitonic emission of these devices. Um, but there was a very, very um, weak, actually, uh, proof of that one, which was that uh, there is a factor of two or so between the input-output curves. This is one indication of bi-excitonic emission as you may see here. Um, but what we have done is really we have followed the full cascade emission of these devices. Um, so the fine structure splitting was 400 microelectron volt. Just what is the key result here is, I've shown before the XX correlation. This shows an anti bunching in the center because a single photon can only be emitted once at a time, so you have an anti-correlation. Now if you have, however, a correlated emission, this is an experiment um, uh, Jean-Michel Gerard has done years and years ago on quantum dots, um, is that first I would have the bi-excitonic state, it would emit. So I set the wavelength range here that I first detect the bi-excitonic emission, and then I've set another one correlator in order to see the X correlation, and they should follow each other. And this is actually what is seen here, that they really follow then each other in the anti-correlation uh, plot. So we have clearly then uh, demonstrated here the cascaded emissions. So first we have the excitonic, bi-excitonic emission, and this is immediately followed on a short time scale by the um, excitonic emissions then. Um, so which is a proof of cascaded emission and service of the bi-excitonic-like feature of that one. With this, I would like to thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for very impressive talk. Please, questions, comments? Yes, please. Sven, is there still a room for improvement, the uh, micropillar cavity? So you mentioned that you have maybe 60 or 70 percent uh, output efficiency. So can you go to 90 or even more? Can you comment on that? I mean, 90 would be very nice. Of course, this is why we have investigated also micro uh, nanowires and so on. And it is needed at some point. Um, let's say for a standard design, 80 percent is doable and possible. With going to low Q factors, we seem to have an idea how to go beyond that for 80-90%, but we would sacrifice some Purcell effect, yeah. But this means just regular processing. Of course, what you can always think of is three-dimensional engineering, really, of things and funneling photons. Uh, but it will be difficult to go really to 90 and beyond. I think this is where you really need other kind of techniques. Uh, at the moment, what really kills us most is that we have these um, throw away half of the photons by the cross polarization. And this can be either solved by processing or by spectroscopic techniques. And I think the game is just over and everyone works on that. Thank you for nice talk. Uh, I wonder what is the highest temperature yet allowing to obtain uh, reasonably indistinguishable photons in this material system? And yeah. what are prospects uh, to sure. increase this temperature? That's a very good question and it's not fully studied yet. We have published one PRL on a planar sample and showing it was rather stable up to a few Kelvin. 
Uh, Pascal Senelat just recently put a paper on archive, which has just appeared now in PRL. I don't know the details, but what is known is that the uh, microcavity helps you to stabilize the emission. So you can go to a few Kelvin or so on. Uh, but I think the next step would be nitrogen temperature or so on. And here I'm not a believer in that. If you really want to have highest quality single photons, I think 4 Kelvin is easily doable, and then you would just go to 4 Kelvin. Um, like nitride sources can emit now at room temperature and so on, but indistinguishability there is just quite poor. And was, I don't, I'm not even aware of this has been directly measured yet. So it's not a satisfying question, I think, but I think 4 Kelvin is really easily doable with helium, and then you stick around that uh, range. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, in anisotropic quantum dots, there is usually the splitting between two orthogonal uh, excitant polarizations. Mm -hmm. uh, so did you observe some signatures of it, or have you tried to charge quantum dots to avoid the splitting in yes. trying? That's a very good question, and we try to follow that now in very detail. It's some of the quantum dots we excite on a planar sample, uh, because our laser has a fixed polarization. Some of them emit bright, some not. And it's very likely that you shoot just between the H and V axis of these, and you should um, ideally excite a, a coherent superposition of them, and you make the rotation, and at some point you get the photon out. Uh, we, we think we understand what is going on there, but we wanted to study it recently. But for this, we need to rotate both the laser and the sample somehow, and this is not a very easy experiment. Uh, but certainly some, one should look into that. We have seen it on charged quantum dots as well. Originally, charged quantum dots were preferred because they don't run into the dark state for the non-resonant excitation. For the ren resonant excitation, it seems that our good excitonic emitters are better than the charged ones in terms of really efficiency and so on. I have two questions. So first is uh, how many photons you need, in, it's about the boson sampling experiment. So how many photons you need to beat uh, down conversion? This is what I, I'm not an expert in that. So up to recently people said 20. Uh, to do um, something which cannot be done by classic computers now. But I recently discovered a new protocol from quantum people, actually, who improved uh, um, uh, the algorithm of uh, determining um, the boson sampling yeah, but result. And it should maybe be 30 to 40 now. Okay, because you can also do experimentally boson sampling with, uh, with down conversion, but they are for sure. ballistic source. Right? Okay, and that's another point. Exactly, yes. That's the point. Yes, and there have been experiments, and also some people used already six or more photons um, there. Um, the thing is that what kills you at some point with the scaling is that you don't, it's not deterministic anymore. Here you can make sure that they all run into the setup at the same time. And this is really why they look into that. They have made this now as a single photon priority in their group, uh, because I think they really can just show quantum supremacy if they really have these deterministic sources. Okay, and second, the easy question. So do you expect entangled photons from your uh, defects in these uh, monolayers where you showed uh, cascaded emission? Um, one could principally think of that, but the fine structure splitting, which you refer to, is yeah. quite large with 400 microelectron volt. And it's not easy to tune that. People are working now on strain, even to introduce these defects and so on. So possibly this is uh, doable, maybe, but it's not that we investigate that further. Okay, well, we should stop the discussion. And let, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. And we move to the next invited talk, which will be given by Professor Akapian from uh, Technical University of Denmark. And the title is Quantum Nanophotonics with Nanowire Quantum Dots. Yeah. So good afternoon, everybody, um, and uh, I would like to start by thanking organizers, of course, for inviting me to give uh, to present our results. So uh, uh, I will cover today three topics: uh, crystal phase quantum device in nanowire, fast single photons, and I start with uh, nanowire quantum dots tuned to atomic transition, like schematically presented here. So we have developed samples with quantum dots in nanowire, 
and then tune them to vapor of, uh, of atoms in, in rubidium. So uh, as was well explained in the, already in the, pre in, in the previous talk, so what is a, a quantum dot so, um, in a nanowire? It's, it's, it's a low band gap semiconductor uh, surrounded by the large band gap semiconductor. We have a confined level for the electrons in the conduction band, confined level for the holes in the wire band. We excite them resonantly or non resonantly or non-resonantly depending on the system and get single photons out. So it's well known that single quantum is a source of single and entangled photons, which is essential for quantum information science and technology. So what are our uh, natural atoms? Here we have uh, rubidium atoms in a vapor. Uh, experimental setup, a part of it, it's, it's very simple, just a cell uh, with a low pressure of, uh, of, of rubidium atoms and the uh, energy levels schematically are shown here. So here's only the uh, relevant uh, le level that we use. So we have a ground state, which is hyperfine split with uh, 6.8 gigahertz or 28 micro EV. And uh, uh, from here we have an excited level. Um, uh, and when we say, uh, and all this is around seven, eight nanometers, exactly where we develop our quantum dots. So now when we say, when we couple uh, natural and artificial atoms, so that what we do essentially, we take our uh, gallium Mars dot in a nanowire and tune it, uh, or tune the emission such that it, it will uh, uh, emit uh, around uh, this, this uh, uh, energies in, in uh, atomic system. So we can tune to one, one of the transition, another transition, or in between. And depending on the application, we can, we can play around. Uh, so why to couple? Why we want uh, this? Uh, the easy answer is, of course, we want to combine the best of, of two systems. Uh, and uh, the, the, each system has its own advantages and challenges. And it comes, obviously, from, uh, from the nature of, uh, uh, of, of this, uh, each of the system. So uh, gallium arsenide dot in nanowire, it's, uh, the quantum is always uh, surrounded by, by the environment. And that's why it's, it's very easy to manipulate a system. For instance, we can, can put contacts in the dielectric fields, but this uh, environment brings actually uh, defects uh, that uh, change local electric fields and actually it's very harmful for, uh, for coherent properties and, uh, and, uh, and other things uh, in, in, the, in the quantum. So this actually dot is, suffers from the environment. And natural atom is absolutely opposite. It, uh, it has essentially no environment. That's why it's, it's uh, much more difficult to manipulate it. For instance, it's difficult to imagine how we can put uh, a contact on a single, uh, on a single atom compared to, compared to a nanowire, which is almost straightforward. However, it doesn't have an environment, so it doesn't suffer from environment. That's why it has a very, uh, very narrow uh, uh, atomic transitions, and it's actually very nice. Uh, a source for quantum, uh, quantum information size. So what we want to do is to combine the, the best of both, uh, easy to manipulate uh, uh, artificial atom, which is quantum in nanowire, with uh, 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 atomic systems that doesn't suffer from the environment. And uh, uh, potential application could be uh, enabling uh, exchange of quantum information between two different uh, uh, remotely uh, located uh, nanowire quantum dots. And of course, uh, if, even if we try to uh, uh, to grow these two dots uh, nearly identical, they never the same. So they always emit photons of, uh, at, at different wavelengths. And an easy trick is uh, to make a frequency tuning of each of them to a uh, well-defined atomic transition, uh, uh, which is uh, the same everywhere. Uh, and tuning mechanisms can be very different. Uh, we can simply apply magnetic field. We can, uh, again, put contacts and apply electric fields. We can also use strain. And uh, then we can uh, essentially make them to... Uh, to emit photons of the same frequency. And this could be uh, a node uh, in a quantum network where uh, different photons can exchange quantum information over long distances. Uh, so um, this, uh, here I summarize uh, several works uh, in this direction. Uh, so one of them is uh, one of our first work when we had uh, gallium Marsnet quantum nodes uh, and tuned all of them independently to, uh, to the same uh, transition of, of, of rubidium and essentially also locked them uh, 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 such that if there is any s uh, slow spectral diffusion that uh, changes uh, the emission of the line out of resonance, our feedback mechanism can counteract and, uh, and, and bring it back uh, to, the same, uh, to the same line. And of course, gallium arsenide and uh, rubidium are not the only system that, uh, that we can uh, bring together. This is a work from a group of Peter Mitchell, for instance, uh, our next speaker, uh, that used uh, uh, indium arsenide dots uh, and coupled them, uh, uh, tuned them to cesium atoms. And also the tuning technique was completely different, was uh, uh, laser detuning uh, from, from the quantum dot. Uh, here is another example where uh, entangled photons from, uh, from gallium arsenide quantum dot were tuned to uh, uh, to uh, atomic lines uh, also in rubidium. And here's maybe a, a bit different one. Uh, uh, so all, in all these uh, uh, three systems, so three examples, 
uh, we used uh, uh, quantum dots tuned uh, to atomic vapors. And here is, uh, is the first example where a single quantum dot uh, uh, was uh, coupled to a single, uh, a single natural atom or trapped ion in, in, in this case. So uh, what was uh, demonstrated here is an excitation from a quantum dot was transferred to an excitation of, uh, in, in the ion. Um, so, um, but all these uh, examples here use uh, self-assembled quantum dots. And we want to make them in nanowires because nanowires uh, uh, have, uh, brings us different additional advantages. For instance, if you want to make a, go to complex devices which have uh, not just a single quantum dot, but several quantum dots, in nanowire allows us uh, easy vertical stacking of multiple quantum dots. And another maybe even better advantage is that uh, contacting in nanowire allows us direct contact of, uh, contacting of, of, of the quantum dots there. Uh, so we were looking for a system, uh, and uh, the easiest to, to, to start is, again, gallium Mars and quantum in nanowire, but such system, it, it turned out, was not available uh, because the growth control was, uh, uh, was very challenging. Ex uh, uh, essentially, uh, there were uh, two kinds of, uh, of, uh, of results of this own literature. Here, this, these are two, uh, two groups that uh, demonstrated growth control. However, optical quality was not so good. Uh, lines were, uh, was not yet good enough. Lines were... Uh, uh, are not very narrow, and uh, antibody G2 uh, didn't go uh, went just just beyond 0 0.5. On the others, but but here's a sample. The, the growth was kind of controlled. Another example where we had uh, uh, where one could find uh, good optical qualities, but the growth was not controlled. Here, quantum dots were formed randomly in the uh, in the corners of uh, of a nanowire. So what we want essentially uh, uh, again combine uh, two both things. We want to control the growth of uh, gallium mars and quantum dot, but also to get a good optical uh, quality. And that's actually what, uh, what we got uh, these days. Um, so the nanowires are grown with uh, 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 using VLS growth, vapor liquid solid uh, technique in the molecular uh, beam uh, epitaxy reactor, uh, essentially here uh, with a group of George Sillin, who will give a, a last talk in, uh, in this session and explain much more details uh, about the sample. Here I will only summarize uh, what we have. So. Uh, that's what we have. So it's uh, aluminum gallium arsenide nanowire with a uh, five-second uh, quantum dot. Uh, one, one of the examples with five-second quantum dot uh, inside and surrounded also with a shell. Uh, these are our TM studies uh, showing the profile of uh, gallium concentration, aluminum concentration. And here you can see. Uh, so the brighter color, color means uh, more material. The darker means less. So here, where we, we expect the quantum, we have more gallium and uh, less aluminum. You also see in the profile here, aluminum goes down and gallium goes up. So we essentially can uncontrollably insert or grow uh, gallium arsenide dot in nanowires. And it, it turns out that these dots are also of very good uh, optical uh, properties. So uh, they have very sharp uh, and intense lines. They have uh, uh, also, also very narrow. So here is just a resolution limit of 30 microv. But by tuning them to atomic lines, we essentially found the real line width, which is uh, 9.4 microv. Still not, the, not yet the Fourier limit, but... Uh, but uh, I think it's, it's, it's a very good number for non-resonant excitation. So to summarize what we have on, on, on these dots, it's a narrow line with intent emission, more than 100,000 counts uh, per second. Uh, rough tuning of the emission, we can go all the way from 750 to 780 by changing the, uh, uh, the height of the quantum dot, essentially the growth time of the dot. Um, and uh, now we would like to tune those to, to atomic transitions. An experiment is, uh, is very simple. So again, what you want to do, we, uh, we apply our tuning knob, which is a magnetic field, and uh, change the emission of the emitted photon uh, from the quantum, not too much, or to go through all the resonant transitions in the rubidium. All right? Um, so uh, we excite the dot, apply magnetic field to, to, to change the, the frequency. It, it goes through the uh, cell with rubidium vapor, and then we detect it. Um, what we have is, is, is shown here. So, um, uh, here we have the uh, emission wavelengths uh, of, of the exciton line in the quantum dot. Uh, on the, on the x-axis, we apply magnetic field from 0 to 1 tesla. And uh, what you expect to see is the Zeeman split of the exciton. That's exactly what we see here. But one is uh, it's not tuned to rubidium, but the second one goes through uh, this two transition in atomic vapor. So, of course, uh, as, as it goes through one and then second, the, the photons are absorbed. And that's what we see here, first absorption. Then Again, we are in between these two transitions and second absorption, and that's what we get here. Now we, um, 
Uh, for uh, reproducibility, uh, we repeat the experiment from, uh, from one Tesla back to zero Tesla, and again, we, we see the same, uh, the same two dips. And now we fit uh, the experiment data with, with the model. So the model has only one fitting parameter, the uh, line width uh, of the emission. Uh, in the next slide, I will explain how it works. And by fitting it uh, to this uh, model, to the data, we get this uh, 9.5 uh, 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 micro EV. So how the model works? So for instance, if we have a, um, let, let's consider this to be an absorption of uh, atomic line, and we can have, uh, for instance, very narrow quantum dots. So as we scan a quantum dot through the atomic line, if it's, uh, if it's narrow comparable to the width of the atomic line, uh, it will be fully absorbed. But uh, so we will get uh, almost full absorption here. But if a quantum dot line is, uh, is broader than the peak or much broader than the peak, then of course it can be never fully absorbed. So it gets only partial absorption that, that we see here. So that's, uh, that, that's, that's the model we do. So you can see that uh, the uh, line width of the dot uh, corresponds to the uh, absorption uh, when we scan it through the rubidium. And that's the only parameter in the model. The rest are fixed, like uh, temperature, Doppler bottleneck we consider, and uh, all the other parameters are, are known experimentally from, from all, 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 all the measurements around. And that's uh, just a summary of the model. For instance, for 0.5 micro it's, it's a red line. Everything is fully absorbed, and uh, as we increase the uh, um, uh, the line width and going for into 20 micro EV, then we have a very partial absorption. That's uh, how model work, and that's what we get. And from this model, we get uh, 9.7 micro EV. Again, it's it's a very good number uh, uh, for uh, non-resonant excitation. So we, we can have actually only better results. Um, now it's an intermediate summary for this uh, for this part. We have uh, achieved the gross control together with high optical quality. We tune them to atomic transitions. And we have uh, performed uh, so-called high-resolution spectroscopy uh, by scanning through the atomic lines. Um, now I move to the second part. It's about uh, crystal phase quantum devices. So the first question, why to talk about crystal phase quantum devices? It's based on uh, something based on crystal phase quantum dots, sort of a new type of quantum dots. And, and the reason is the following. For instance, if we uh, take one single dot. It's well known, well studied. It's actually an excellent source of uh, many things, single photon emitters, rectangle photon emitters, and, and so on. But uh, if we want to uh, make advanced uh, or complex or advanced structure based on multiple quantum dots, for instance, two, then we have a problem because we cannot uh, really control the growth of, uh, of single quantum dots such that uh, two dots are the same or are different by design. Uh, and the main problem is because it's, it's a heterostructure, it's two different material, low band gap semiconductor surrounded by a high band gap semiconductor. Even if you can control the shape, geometrical shape of it, uh, like uh, doing uh, uh, lithography and so on and filling with, with the material, even then, because of this material, there are two different materials that can have diffusion in one of the other. So even then, two dots will, uh, will be different. And uh, again, we have many experiments with a single quantum dots showing beautiful results, but not so many if you go to a couple of quantum dots, because again, it's, it's very difficult to control the growth. Uh, there are only maybe a few groups that uh, show the, the good results. And the same works with, uh, with the nanowires. It's, uh, it's very difficult to do so. And the question is actually, can we make quantum devices that we control from the very beginning uh, at the single atomic layer during the growth, such that we grow it and it stays there? And uh, it seems it's, it's uh, at least a, uh, uh, fundamentally possible. It's a different approach. We will do this uh, uh, crystal phase quantum dot. They are grown, it's, uh, so, uh, and that it's a nanowire. It's a nanowire of the same material, uh, indium phosphate or gallium phosphate, but of different crystal structure. Uh, most of the wire is wurzite, and here we can insert a, a single uh, uh, zinc leader structure. Um, so uh, what are the advantages? So uh, wurzite and uh, zinc leader structures have uh, different uh, uh, band structure, different band offset. Uh, the big advantage is only one material, so no diffusion of, of, of different atoms. And the, uh, and the most important is they have atomically sharp interface. So if we can successfully grow this one and then control the growth, then we can suddenly make uh, two uh, quantum dots which are exactly the same, or we can make different uh, quantum dots which can be different but by design. So it allows us uh, to make advanced structures based on uh, well-known quantum dots that we have. Um, and the vision could be to make, for instance, this uh, uh, solid state quantum, uh, quantum uh, register where we have uh, different uh, or multiple quantum dots, all a bit different, such that each can be individually addressed, but they, all of them can be uh, brought into superposition and essentially coupled. Um, so uh, we work now with, uh, uh, towards this goal, we work with two material systems, one with the indium phosphate and the gallium phosphate, 
and uh, they have different advantages, different challenges. Challenges for in phosphate, uh, the physics is, is well known, so it's uh, it's a very good part. But uh, as of today, it's uh, difficult to to control to master the growth of, of crystal phase there. With gallium phosphate, it's a bit opposite. Uh, physics is uh, still under on on discussion, so we have worth site emit, we have uh, uh, worth site uh, structure of gallium phosphate is. Uh, there are only a few experimental works. But uh, the easy part, easier part, it's uh, nearly ideal, uh, ideal growth. So here we could achieve the controlled growth uh, of, of, this, uh, of our crystal structure. Um, now I show you some, result, uh, some results from, from the both structures we have. These are from in new phosphate nanowire. These are the SEM of the wires. That's how they look, how they grow. Uh, Again, uh, we do not control uh, insertion, but what, what we can control is the density of the stacking falls uh, of, the, of, this, of this quantum density growth. So we can essentially control and make a wire with very low uh, uh, percentage of, uh, of, uh, of, of this uh, crystal phase quantum, but such that we can uh, spatially and spectrally uh, isolate uh, uh, one of them, like one shown here and one shown here. And they behave essentially like a quantum that they, uh, without any, um, intentional improvement of the sample or putting, putting them in any cavities, uh, they have uh, intense uh, lines, uh, narrow lines, uh, as, as shown here with this in interference measurement. And they also show cascaded emission, so that's as, as we demonstrated uh, recently. Uh, these are the two uh, uh, single lines from uh, crystal phase quantum in new phosphate tunnel wire. Each of them is a, is a sort of single photon shown by antibiotic here, by antibiotic here, and they show the cascading emission like from the bioxon to the exciton as is a well-known quantum node. Um, we put such a device or such a uh, uh, wire with crystal phase uh, quantum nodes onto the gates, apply gates, and we also can control this uh, uh, charge uh, in them. So essentially, when we change the voltage from one, one uh, charge situation, we can go to another charge situation. Um, now, uh, but in this indium phosphate, it's, it's very difficult to, to control the growth. So that's what we can essentially do with gallium phosphate. Uh, that's how we, uh, we grow nanowires here. So we can grow purely worsite nanowire and then decrease temperature, and then we can control the growth short zinc section. Then, and if we repeat the experiment, decrease, increase, decrease, increase, so we can actually in insert uh, a zingle intersection inside otherwise uh, world site nanowire. Um, and here is a result of the experiment. So it's a controlled growth of uh, uh, attempt to grow uh, a zingle intersection. For zero seconds, of course, nothing grows. For one second, we have a very thin element. For two seconds, it's, it, it's wider. For three seconds, even more. And of course, sometimes, as you can see here, some uncontrolled uh, single. Uh, uh, the stacking falls, the crystal phase dots are also formed. Uh, if we zoom in, we can clearly see that we have a very sharp atomically uh, uh, um, uh, layer of uh, in interface between, between, between the two structures. So just a single monolayer. Uh, now we can try to, to grow uh, from what we can get a quant register, control growth of multiple structures, and it essentially also works. But here we don't have good optical results because uh, the material system is, is, is very difficult to understand and essentially has also defects. Um, so to summarize uh, this part, so we mastered growth control in gallium, gallium phosphate. Uh, we know the physics of randomly formed uh, in phosphate uh, crystal phase quantum dots that they follow the all-known physics, and we can control charge here. So the goal, of course, is control uh, to master growth control in new phosphate. Um, Essentially, what we know by now, it's uh, that the crystal phase quantum are clean, defect-free system. They have bright emitters. They have atomically sharp interfaces and uh, have also type 2 transition. And this can uh, uh, bring us to think about new devices with new concepts. And uh, here's just one example. For instance, we can have uh, two quantum dots, controllably grown, uh, separated such that they are not coupled. So this is an individual dot and this is another individual dot. So wave function of the electrons do not overlap. It can be set by by increasing the distance between them. So we have two individual quantum dots. However, it, it's a type two transition. So hole is confined uh, in a special different location here. So now by putting controllably hole here, we can uh, make these two uh, dots to, be, uh, to couple them via this uh, shared hole level. So what we have, uh, what we can essentially do, it's uh, switch from individual quantum dots to couple uh, quantum dots at will, if we can uh, control the growth and, and put uh, the, the hole here whenever we want. Uh, and then what we have, it's like well-known uh, lambda OV systems, like well-known atomic physics, but with additional uh, spatial separation. So we can in, even try to put uh, fine gates here and address them uh, 
uh, quasi individually by, 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 by applying uh, voltage on the gate. Uh, so that's one of the ideas we, we would like to, to achieve later. Now I go to the last part of my topic. It's about uh, fast single photons. So to go to fast, I have to explain what I mean by slow and fast light. And um, the idea is, is very simple. So it's a, it's a typical wave packet that we have. So the, uh, we have here phase velocity, which is represented by, by this red dot. We have a group velocity of the, of the envelope velocity, which is represented here by this uh, green dot. And you can see the, the green dot moves slower than the, than the red dot. And slow light means a slow group velocity. I will come uh, soon, very, uh, very soon what is a fast light. So we want to control uh, uh, the velocity of light. How do, how do we do it? We just look uh, 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 what, what represents uh, the group velocity because the group velocity, that's essentially what we are going to control. And the main thing is it's, uh, if you, we can control the uh, derivative of the refractive index, then we can uh, control the group velocity. If dn over the omega will be uh, more than zero, then we have here something more than one, and then C divided by more than one will give us speed of light uh, less than uh, uh, sp speed of uh, speed of light less than sp speed in, in the vacuum. But if we can find a system where the n over the omega is, is less than zero, then suddenly here we can have something which is less than one. So if we can have, have fast light, something appears to travel faster than speed of uh, light in vacuum. Um, so uh, the conclusion, the refractive index uh, and its derivative, essentially its derivative, will set the group velocity. Uh, and uh, where, this, where we can find such a system? It's very simple. It's uh, any atomic transition, essentially, it uh, gives us uh, such a system. So this is uh, the schematics of what happens. This is the absorption of atomic line. And here how uh, refractive index uh, goes if we change uh, the frequency. And what we can see here, uh, the refractive index uh, is decreasing, so uh, its derivative is negative, and it's called uh, uh, anomalous dispersion. And, uh, and if we can find single photons and tune them exactly here, uh, and this energy of, uh, or this frequency of the atomic transition, we can ex make experiments with a single photon, uh, with a fast light at the single photon level. Uh, so before we do it, uh, now, what is fast light? It's something that sound that appears to um, um, travel faster than speed of light in vacuum. And uh, it's, uh, as a phenomenon, it's, it's, it's well known. And uh, one example is uh, when a pulse approaches gain medium, and it appears that uh, it can exit the medium before it enters. But the trick is very simple. So the uh, very beginning of the pulse gets into the medium and it gets amplified there. And that's why it appears to exit uh, the medium before the main pulse uh, enters. So it's, uh, it's very simple here. So we just add photons to the very beginning of the pulse. The alternative uh, scheme is, uh, is also simple. It's uh, absorption in, in the tail. So pulse can enter the medium and then tail can be absorbed uh, more and more and more and we have a reshaping of the pulse. So it also appears to travel faster than speed of light. So it's very counterintuitive, but fully explained by, uh, by basic physics. All we have is uh, reshaping by adding photons like here or subtracting photons by, by here. And again, it's all well known in, uh, in laser pulses. But what will happen if we have just a single photon? Can we have fast light? For instance, if we, if we will add more photons, it will not be single photon pulse. If we will remove photons from one photon, so there is no, 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 no light anymore. So then uh, there's a question, so can single photon travel in light? And if they could, what, uh, what would it mean? And we actually have a system where we can test uh, this experimentally because we have artificial atoms that can be tunable sort of single photons. We can take them and tune them to atomic transition to the natural atoms and where we can have experiment with, with slow and fast light. So before I move to the fast light, I'll show some experiments with uh, some of our uh, previous experiment with, uh, with the slow light. Um, uh, so uh, slow light can also be achieved not exactly on the transition, but in between the transition. That's actually easy to do experiment. Uh, so our medium now is described by uh, electrical susceptibility here. And uh, if you remember, we can uh, uh, change the group velocity by, uh, by controlling uh, the uh, refractive index of the medium, which is, uh, which is n. And that's uh, meaning if we control susceptibility, we can control the um, uh, complex refractive index of the medium from which we can control the uh, real part of it, which, is, uh, which sets the group velocity, and the imaginary part of it, which uh, will set the absorption. Right? So the, the key part is the control susceptibility of the medium, which is here. And, and the control is by this coefficient a, which is proportional to the, uh, to the vapor density. And vapor density is proportional to the, to exponentially proportional to the temperature. So uh, the recipe works work like this. Temperature will set the density. Density will set the, uh, the refractive index and the extinction coefficient, and therefore group velocity and, uh, and, uh, and transmissions through the, through the cell will be affected. 
and that's uh, what we expect to have. So uh, this is a transmission through this, uh, uh, through this uh, two absorption line in, 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 uh, in rubidium uh, at a very high temperature. So if we hit both resonance, everything, everything is absorbed. But in the middle, we have very high transmission. Um, that's how refractive index behaves. Uh, so here we have, uh, it's almost flat, so the medium will be not dispersive, the temporal shape of the pulse will not be changed. And as you can see, the group velocity is reduced here. Of course, if, if we tune it here, it's, it's, uh, it will be almost zero, but however, there's almost uh, total absorption, nothing will be measured. But if we tune in between the two pulses, where it's uh, very transparent, still very transparent, we can have already uh, group velocity reduced uh, by uh, less than 10%. So that's why we do experiment, uh, and this is, uh, is the result by uh, measuring the arrival time of single photon uh, as uh, we increase the temperature of, 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 of the cell from going from all the way from warm uh, uh, rubidium to, to the hot rubidium. And we can see that the uh, pulse is detected uh, later and later in time. Uh, and here we can have uh, we achieved uh, single photons which travel with only 3.3% uh, of, of speed of lightning model. Now I go to this uh, fast photon. So now we want to tune uh, uh, the uh, single photons, not in between, but exactly here at, the, at one of the transitions. Um, and uh, uh, to bring them to this anomaly dispersion region where uh, derivative of the refractive index is, is negative and where we can expect uh, the fast light. But then the question is, can we detect these photons? Because uh, faster, far, uh, you know, there's the, the always relation, uh, Kramer's Kronig relation, faster we get photons, more absorption we get. And, uh, and the, uh, the next question, if, if even if the photon can be fast, can we actually detect them? And detection scheme is, uh, is not just uh, simply detecting the arrival time, because we need a more precise uh, picosecond resolution. That's why we build this uh, uh, Max Zender interferometer. So single photon goes here, uh, or it can travel this, uh, this way or the other way via the fast light medium. And if it goes faster, so we can uh, shorten the, uh, um, uh, you know, in increase the, the, uh, the pass length such that it will arrive with its uh, counterpart at the same time and detect uh, interference. Uh, I see that I don't have much time, so I will just uh, uh, go quickly to the last slide. Just what I want to say, so we use uh, our uh, quantum system coupled to atomic uh, lines. Uh, so we tune uh, this photon to one of the transitions and uh, uh, lock it there. And when we lock it uh, uh, at this at atomic transitions, then we, then we do the interference experiment in, in, in the Max Zender inter interferometer. Uh, we always measure also the reference line because what we want to detect is the relative shift of uh, the photon tuned to absorption line uh, compared to the uh, shift which is uh, to, the, to the interference pattern of photon which is not tuned. Because again, these uh, times are, are, are very tiny, picoseconds. And that's what we have. So these are the uh, interference measurement of the reference uh, sing, uh, single photon. It's just a usual interference pattern. And this is a photon that will be tuned to, to atomic line. If we zoom in, we, we see very nice uh, fringes. And uh, so now what, uh, what will happen when we will tune uh, this part to the rubidium? And uh, here is the result. So we see that uh, pulse uh, got reshaped. Uh, and uh, part of it is detected earlier than the, the reference part. These are our fast photon, and these are our uh, slow photon. Since uh, uh, the very brief explanation why we have two parts, it's just because uh, single photon uh, is broader than atomic transition. What falls exactly in resonance is got uh, fast, and the rest is got slow. Uh, does it mean that uh, we have, uh, uh, or the, that information goes fast than speed of light? Of course not. All we have here is again reshaping, but not by adding and, uh, and uh, removing photon. Just we reshape the temporal profile from single photon in Fourier space. So one of the components uh, get uh, different uh, delays, faster or slower, and uh, we have uh, afterwards they, they combine together, and that's uh, the reshaping that, uh, that we have. So I would like to thank uh, all my uh, collaborators over the year, it's the years that I worked uh, together to achieve the, the results. That, uh, I've shown here, and uh, in a summary, so we have artificial atoms tuned to natural atoms that uh, can allow many experiments. One of them is uh, fast single photons. We have now gallium arsenide dots now in nanowires tuned to atomic transition, and we are developing crystal phase quantum dots uh, uh, to, with the goal to get uh, quantum devices uh, with the precision of a single atomic layer. And the outlook is uh, out of all of them combined to make uh, a prototype of quantum network that can send the quantum information from different remote nodes uh, located in uh, far from each other. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very nice talk. And we have time for a couple of questions, please. Uh, I have a question about the crystal phase growth. Uh, is it possible to grow a micro pillar is in this way? A micro pillar? Yeah. So what we grow essentially we grow a nano wire, which is a micro pillar. I, I mean to to make a Bragg mirror, then a ah, quantum dot, and mirror. then again a uh, Bragg mirror. That might uh, be tricky. Why? So. In, in principle, we can grow, but I, uh, but I think it will not work because it, re it, it requires uh, volume to work. So, so what we can do, we can just uh, put a mirror on at the bottom of the, uh, of the nanowire, but not, uh, not a Bragg, uh, Bragg reflector. Okay, the last question. In the region of abnormal dispersion, uh, very strong absorption and not only the strong variation of refractive index, and it means that uh, the pulse of light will be strongly distorted. And being measured at uh, un unknown for me conditions, it may be some seeming uh, appearance of a fast line due to modification of a pulse shape as a whole. So your comments? That's what I also said, exactly this, that's what happens. All we have is a... Uh is a uh, reshaping of the temporal profile of the, of the pulse uh, because, of, uh, because of the medium. That's an, an actual explanation. We have uh, so different, com different uh, frequency components of single photon uh, uh, see a different refractive index. Those uh, are absorbed, but those that are not absorbed uh, appear to shift because they are still traveled, but uh, you know, it's just reshaping of, of the Fourier components. The question we answer that it, it, it's, it's possible, it, it's also possible to measure. Because still, if you, if you read the literature that says know, it can be hidden in quantum noise, so you know, people give some arguments. But it's possible to measure, and uh, it appears to travel fast. But of course, it doesn't, doesn't violate any causality. In my, in my understanding, it's just reshaping of the temporal profile, as, exactly as you said. OK, well, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we move to the third invited talk in our session, which will be given by Professor Peter Mischler uh, from uh, University of Stuttgart. And the title of the talk is Entitlement Enhanced Interferometry with Deterministic Single Photon Sources. Okay. Okay, please. Yeah, good afternoon and uh, thank you for the introduction and the very kind invitation to come to this uh, very exciting conference and a very nice uh, city. So in my talk, I will discuss uh, our recent work on an Engelmann enhanced interferometry with the deterministic single photon sources. So here's the outline of the talk. In the first part, I will give you a very short introduction into the generation of non-classical light with semiconductor quantum dots. I think many things have already been presented by uh, Sven and Nika, so I can go uh, very fast here. And then I will uh, discuss some basics of entanglement enhanced interferometry. And the main part will be uh, the, to show you how we have generated these uh, uh, noon states, so-called noon states, uh, with our quantum dots uh, and uh, demonstrate uh, phase super resolution and also phase super sensitivity. Yeah, so uh, in my talk, I will uh, basically report about three different type of uh, photon generation, which we have used uh, as a basics. And all of them have been introduced by the previous speakers. So we use excitonic photons, bi-excitonic photons, and trionic photons. So I don't have to discuss this here. It has just been introduced here. So what is really important, uh, and uh, also Sven has uh, already mentioned this, is the type of excitation of a single semiconductor quantum dot. 
If you excite a single dot uh, above barrier, you generate many carriers around the dot, and then the carriers were captured inside the dot on a very fast uh, time scale. But this is a kind of a statistical process, and uh, because of that, if you do a time-integrated measurements, you see many different uh, uh, PL lines from these different charge configurations here. But even more important is that due to carrier-carrier scattering, you, can, uh, have, uh, you have defacing processes, and as a result, you have limited photon uh, coherence, which is uh, schematically shown here by this uh, blue line here. So a much better choice is a kind of a resonant excitation process, uh, where you excite uh, a single, for example, a single electron hole pair in the S shell of the quantum dot, and then use this uh, uh, radiative recombination for, you, for the generation of your single photon. So in this case, you have just one sharp single emission line, and even more important, uh, you have no carriers around, so you can hope to generate a nearly perfect single photon as it is uh, sketched here and already discussed before in, in, in Sven's talk. So we want to do this in a deterministic way, and for that we use a, a pulsed resonant excitation scheme. Uh, and uh, here is a, a simple schematic, it's a kind of a block sphere where the ground state is at the bottom. The excited state, for example, can be now the excitonic, the exciton, the biexciton, or trion. And if we now apply a certain laser pulse, with, let's say with a pulse area of pi over two, we would generate a superposition state between the ground and the excited state. If we raise the power, for example, for a pi pulse, then we prepare, for example, here, uh, the, the bikeston in a deterministic way, uh, and so on. And that means uh, the fingerprint now of this deterministic preparation process is the observation of our Rabi oscillation here. Uh, and you can use then the pi pulse for deterministic uh, generation. Then also you can convince yourself that you generate uh, yeah, single photons on demand by measuring the photon autocorrelation. The previous speaker already uh, discussed this, so the fingerprint is a vanishing uh, peak here at delay time uh, zero. So this is the very basic we use now for the generation of these small, complex, and angled photonic states, which I will discuss in my talk. But before I show you the results, also some basics with respect to uh, sensing with light. Now it's, uh, of course, uh, well accepted that sensing with light is one of the fundamental technologies in many fields of research, for example, in medical and biological sensing, in gravity wave detection, in micro microscopy or imaging. And a very general task in this kind of uh, technology is to measure uh, phase phi with the precision delta phi. Now, if you use classical light, let's say, for example, a laser, uh, and that means you have n not and angle photons in this case, and you repeat the measurement uh, n times, the uncertainty uh, in this estimate is given uh, by the so-called standard quantum limit, which is nothing than the short noise limit here. That means delta phi is given by 1 over square root of n when n is the number of photons. Now, if you use instead non-classical light, for example, a maximal and angled n photon state, then the phase estimation is no longer given by the standard quantum limit. It is limited by the really fundamental Heisenberg limit, uh, which is given by 1 over n. And now when you compare these two limits, you can easily see that we have an improvement here by 1 over square root of n over this standard quantum limit here. And that's why people are excited to use non-classical light for sensing. That's all about uh, here, uh, this is this improvement by 1 over square root of n. Yeah, now uh, maybe you have all heard, and I'm sure, about this seminal work of uh, observation of gravitational waves from a binary black hole merger from this LIGO corporation. And people here have used basically uh, an optical setup, a, a very big Michelson interferometer. Uh, and the idea was that when a, a gravitational wave passes this interferometer here, this will lead to a, to a certain uh, change in the distance of the mirror here relative to each other. And so they can measure this by measuring a phase change here in this setup. And when you ask how sensitive the measurement is, uh, then this is limited by the noise of the laser which has been used here. And if you increase now uh, the power of this laser, 
you see that you can always get a better and better phase resolution. And this is fundamentally limited by this standard quantum limit here, this experiment. And what they have done is they have actually used uh, extraordinary high laser power uh, with some cycling of the laser in, in sub-cavities here. Uh, they achieved 200 kilowatts here, and that gives this extraordinary phase resolution of, uh, or space resolution of 10 to the minus 18 meter here. Yeah, so now if you go for another application, for example, in, in, in biology uh, and in biophysics, uh, and that's obvious you cannot use a 200 kilowatt laser for sensing, because if you do this, uh, the sample is gone. And the important message here is that you have a certain limitation to a low photon flux. This is also true for sensing in, 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 in quantum information science. Now what you can also do is you can go uh, to shorter wavelengths and that is very easy to understand because, uh, for example, if you have a certain, let's say, intensity noise here, delta S, this translates uh, to a phase noise, but a much smaller phase noise for shorter wavelengths that can be seen here. However, also going to shorter wavelengths is not a, a, a real uh, a good choice in, in biology, for example, because you will suffer from dipole scattering in living tissue and also from water absorption here. So that means you have also a limit uh, to the wavelengths range you can really use for sensing. And here's the question is coming up. Can we exploit now the non-classical properties of light of entangled photonic states for better sensing? So this is the question we want to answer in this, uh, in this contribution here. So how can we uh, now generate these uh, entangled uh, photonic states? And here's a very simple scheme where I want to explain this. So this is basically a Mach 10 interferometer, and we have in one arm a certain uh, phase plate where we can introduce a phase. And at the last beam splitter here, we have two detectors to measure uh, the arrival time of the photons. Now let's assume we send a single photon here on this Mach 10 interferometer. In a, in a classical picture, this single photon can either go the upper way or uh, it can go the lower way. But of course, in quantum mechanics, what we have is a superposition state here, which is given here. Whereas uh, in one arm, we have introduced this phase factor here, which gives us the phase factor here of uh, e to the power of i phi here. Now, in a, in a kind of a more formal way, we can express this uh, with a phase shifting operator uh, working on the, uh, operating on this uh, single photon Fox state, which gives us just this phase here. Now, when we use a laser instead of a single photon, that is a coherent state, the, this phase shifting operator works in the very same way because the photons are not entangled. So they are independent, and that means we have the, phase, the same phase shift here also for a coherent state. But now what makes it different, if you would use a, N, a Fox state uh, with N photons, then this phase shifting operator gives us a phase n times the phase shift for, uh, for example, a coherent state. And that is uh, shown here then, so that we, means we would have then uh, such a noon state. The word noon is also clear. It is n o o n uh, with this phase factor which is n times larger than uh, for, like for, for a coherent state. And if we now make a, a correlation measurement at this output port here, uh, then uh, actually, and I will show you this later in, 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 in a simulation in the theory, we expect to see n times faster oscillation frequency than for a laser or a single photon state. And this is called super resolution. Now, if we fulfill a certain uh, yeah, visibility criteria, I come back to that also later, we can also beat the standard quantum limit when we are fundamentally limited by the Heisenberg limit, which is, uh, gives us 1 over n, and that is called super sensitivity. And if we achieve this, this can never be done by any classical light source like a laser or something like this. Okay, so what has been done in the past, people have used actually spontaneous parametric down conversion sources to generate uh, uh, this uh, noon state and to beat the standard quantum limit. But these are all probabilistic sources which have some limitation in, in scaling as we all know. And our question is, can we actually do the same uh, with a deterministic light source. And we used an uh, MBE grown self assembled quantum dots uh, from two different groups. Uh, one has been grown in the group of Oliver Schmidt at that time in Stuttgart, and the other one uh, is coming from Würzburg group uh, from Sven Höfling's uh, uh, Institute. 
So the work has been uh, performed, which I will show you now, uh, by two PhD students, uh, Markus Müller and Hussein uh, Mural. So for our studies, we used actually three different kind of uh, photons. One uh, is uh, we use a so-called dryonic photon, where we make a resonant excitation process of the dryonic state and then use this photon for building up the noon state. And uh, the other set of experiments has been done by using a resonant two-photon excitation process to generate the bi-excitonic photon, bi to generate the bi-exciton, and then we have either used this bi-excitonic photon or the exciton one from this radiative cascade here. Now, in both uh, cases here, we have uh, yeah, nearly perfect spectra. So you see we have just one emission line here in this case and two lines with the very same intensity for this resonant two photon excitation process. So we convinced ourselves that we produce very clean single photon states. Uh, the autocorrelation uh, measurements are perfect here, so we are below 1% of G2 value here. And also we convinced ourselves that we have a deterministic preparation process by observing these Rabi oscillation, which I uh, explained in, the, in my introduction. So now what we have done is we have used this uh, kind of a basic uh, Marzender interferometer and we now send in one single photon here. This can be either the excitonic one, the bi-excitonic one or the trion one and uh, send this through this interferometer. And as I explained before, uh, in a classical picture, so this photon has two uh, 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 different, different uh, uh, possibilities to go through the interferometer and so we basically form this kind of noon state here which serves as a reference because when we now measure, for example, here at one detector, the, uh, the, the, the uh, detected counts here, we, we expect to see uh, uh, dependence on, on this face plate here, which goes with cosine uh, phi here. So this uh, is a kind of a reference here. Now, the more interesting case is when we go to the n equal to noon state. In this case, we have to extend the interferometer since we only use one and the same quantum dot as a light source. Uh, and we use then two successive photons from this light source uh, in a way, and you can see this here, so that we introduce here a delay line which exactly compensates the delay between these two photons. And because of that, in one over four of the cases, we have a situation that the two photons here are at the same uh, distance to this beam splitter. And here we can now utilize the Hongo Mandel effect, which tells us that the two photons will either leave the, the beam splitter in the upper or the lower way. So this is schematically shown here. So we will have either this situation or the two photons will go uh, the lower way in, a, in, in this picture. Of course, uh, quantum mechanic description is this superposition state and this is the n equal to noon state. And an important point is here that we experience here a phase of two times uh, for the single photon case. And if we now make a correlation measurement here at this output port here, uh, then we expect to see an oscillation which uh, goes with uh, cosine of 2 phi. So we have double the frequency. And that would be the signature of uh, phase super resolution. Now for our experiments, we have actually used a kind of a phase stabilized, unbalanced uh, Sanyak interferometer because this is very phase stable. We need this phase stability. And this is uh, shown here. So we excite the quantum dot. This is now a schematic picture with a certain pulse uh, sequence. So uh, the repetition period of the pulsed laser is 13 nanosecond. And we excite the quantum dot every 4.4 nanosecond here with this, pulse, uh, with this pulse sequence here. As a result, the quantum dot will emit either the exciton, the bi or the trion uh, photon, depending on the, way, on the uh, type of excitation we use here. And uh, so we have also a pulse pair of two, for example, uh, excitonic photons here. And then we send these uh, photons here in this unbalanced Sanyak interferometer. And again, we have a delay line which ex 